Heir to Russia, The Shift of Prophecy, Book 4 Written by Megan Linsky Narrated by Candice Joyce Chapter 1 It is true, death cannot conquer love. Death's power is so slight, so little compared to what we on earth are capable of. True love does not think of itself, does not put itself first or seek to serve its own desires. It always compromises, endures, hopes and believes. No, the ones we cherish never fade from our side. They're always nearby, watching, lingering, waiting for us to extend a hand in need of help, for us to take the journey home. The night sky is littered with thousands of stars that dance around the crescent moon. The salty scent of the sea is carried by the gentle wind through the branches of olive trees, emerald shoots of grass bending in the breeze. A stone mansion built in the Italian farmhouse style stands on a hill about a half a kilometer away. The area is surrounded with grapevines, plump and thick with ripe purple fruit about to be picked. Italy is absolutely marvellous. It is a warm, beautiful country, tucked within the shelter of mountains and rivers. When we fled Castel de Singe, Sergei was smart enough to drain his account and transfer the funds to a private trust in Switzerland out of Dragomir's knowledge and reach. He used his massive fortune to purchase Vigneto de Uva, a large estate nestled against the Mediterranean Sea. Nine months later, it almost feels like home. The house has dozens of rooms, far more than we need, though we're close to being full now. It's far enough away from humans for me to be safe. Since I killed Lydia, I haven't seen a human. We used Shioni's mirror to get here so we wouldn't have to take a plane and risk being spotted or me being unable to control my thirst. She transported the relic back to Le Chateau de Mir afterward, in the event that our location be discovered. The last thing we need is the mirror getting into Dragomir's hands. I still hunger for human blood. The itch, the desire, it never goes away. I can still taste the tangy sweetness of Lydia's life force spilling over my lips and across my tongue. I was so judgmental before, critical of vampires who had tasted human blood and found themselves consumed by it. Now I understand. There's no escape or peace once you've made the choice to drink. Only a constant need you can never fulfill. The thought of my baby is the only thing that keeps me from leaving the vineyard and going out in search of human flesh right at this moment. And Lysar next to me. He holds my hand tightly, his blonde hair glowing under the moon's halo. His perfect face resembles an angel. He's been wonderful all throughout my pregnancy, getting me whatever I need whenever I need it. Lysar's been an alpha in every sense of the word, protecting his mate, securing Vigneto de Uva as best he can so he can be sure that the pack and I are safe. My gaze lingers upon his glimmering blue eyes and the round lips I desperately desire to kiss. My husband. Mine. I don't want him to catch me staring, so I regretfully pull away, only to find myself eyeing the muscles in his arms instead. My lord, he's gorgeous. Will I always feel this way about him? Will my breath always hitch and my insides flutter when he is near? I hope so. We're currently on a nighttime walk through the vineyard, though walking is a bit of an exaggeration. I more or less totter between the trellises in my sundress and hope I don't fall over. My child is huge, a result of having offspring that is half wolf. I can barely move with how big my belly has become, never mind see over it to look down at my feet. Bryn's banking on it being a boy, 
Tomlin thinks it's a girl. Half of the house has their income swept up in the betting pool of what our baby is. Lysar and I could have found out, but we chose not to, leaving it up to surprise. I'm already past my due date. As the calendar inches into early September, I've grown anxious. I can't tell if something is wrong or not. Vampires don't have the same side effects humans do when they're pregnant. There was no morning sickness, no hormonal outbursts, and no general discomfort for me throughout my entire pregnancy. Perfection always is a vampire's strongest trait, and that carries on into every part of life, it seems. We worried that my body would try to reject the baby as it is half-wolf, but if anything, it has only appeared to make the little one stronger. The only difference my body notices is that there is a baby growing inside of me. And that baby does not want to come out. I thought walking was supposed to help, I complain. Lysar and I come to a stone bench. He helps me sit down before taking a spot beside me. Gotta be patient, Lissy, he says. He puts a hand on my thigh. It'll happen when it happens. Well, I want it to happen now. I let out a huff. I want my body back and my baby in my arms. If you'll be able to pick it up, Lysar barks. He laughs and his hand moves upward onto my stomach. I'm just as excited as you, but I don't want to push it. I pause for a moment. Lysar? Hmm? Do you think we're a little in over our heads? Um, we probably should have thought of that months ago. Lysar grins. Too late now. He seems cheery, but worried. We both know there's never been a vampire-wolf hybrid before. I take a quick breath. Do you think that- Lissy. I just want to know if the baby will be all right. I say quickly before he can stop me. Lissy, we've been over this. Lysar pretends to count, then throws up his hands. Probably every single day since we found out you were pregnant. It's going to be fine. You'll see. I chew on my bottom lip. Though Shioni has assured us every week that the baby appears to be healthy, I can't help but worry. My baby is very active, and he or she moves around a lot during the day and night, keeping me awake at all hours. But it always scares me when the movement ceases. I wasn't sure that I'd get this far in the pregnancy without miscarrying, as the child is a hybrid. But everything is proceeding onward like it should be. Perhaps a little too nicely. It's like the baby is meant to be. It's weird to me. Due to its mixed blood, I'm worried our baby will come out unhealthy. Or won't be alive at all. That's a thought that scares me so badly, I can't bear to think it. You've done it again. Lysar takes a napkin out from his pocket and dots my lip, which has started to bleed. My fangs have pierced the skin. There's a howl from the woods. Lysar and I turn our heads toward it, waiting. We hold our breath for a moment before another howl resounds on the other side of the vineyard. It's one of the American wolves. We relax. Lysar puts the napkin back in his pocket. The African wolves seem ready for a fight, Lysar says, referring to the first howl. They're restless, I say. They're tired of not having a job to do. After we got here, Lysar contacted the satellite packs in France, America, and Africa. Most of them traveled here to Italy. They're staying around the vineyard waiting for Lysar to make a plan of attack against Dragomir. That hasn't happened yet, but it has to happen soon. They have a job to do, Lysar counters. They're here to make the base secure. We agreed once the baby was born we'd get back to business, I say firmly. I won't raise my child in a world where Dragomir rules. I won't either, Lysar says. But we have to make a strategy— the only way to defeat Dragomir is to get him on the battlefield, but we don't have the numbers. We can't send assassins to take him out. We've already tried, and they've failed every time. I look down. 
We sent several wolves and vampires to assassinate Dragomir in the past nine months. All of them failed. Every assassin died in the attempt to do so, each death more painful and humiliating than the last. Dragomir realizes we're trying to kill him. No doubt he thinks our attempts to do so are pathetic. There have to be others who are willing to help us, I muse. We've called in all the wolves. Aren't there any vampires left that can lend a hand? Salkovia can't be the only coven that hates him. Even if that's true, we have to get close enough to him. And with Ivan Grigore and Basile as his bodyguards, that's not going to happen, Lysa says firmly. Besides, the pack should have enough on their plate with the Cursed Ones and the Haunted running loose. In the past few months, the Cursed Ones and the Haunted have been on a rampage. They've gone on killing sprees across Europe, likely looking for Lysar and I under Dragomir's orders. The humans have noticed. The monsters are failing to remain secret, despite the dangers revealing ourselves to the human world contains. But I don't think they care. After having cleared out most of the other countries and found nothing, Italy is the last place they haven't checked. Kipcha found footprints this morning. We know they're nearby, I say. We need to get ready. I told you I'd always protect you and keep you safe, Lysar says. He squeezes my arms lovingly and adds, Do you doubt me? I smile at him. No, Lysar. You've never broken a promise. I kiss his nose. I know you won't fail me. Don't think I don't believe in you. Whatever happens, that will never be the case. You just focus on getting that baby out, Lysar adds. I promise everything will be all right. If I find out you're keeping stuff from me just because you don't want to give me any stress, I mumble. That's exactly my thinking. He nudges me playfully. I'll consider letting you in on more war planning once you've had the kid. That's marvelous communication. Just like Romeo and Juliet, right? I tease. We're even in Italy. Hopefully our story will have a happier ending. I consider myself smarter than Romeo. He gives me a wink. Not much smarter, though. My lord, I hope you are. It doesn't take much to be smarter than Romeo. It would be terrible for our relationship to end disastrously because of a silly misunderstanding. I shake my head. Juliet isn't much better. Clueless. Poison anyone? Lysar raises an eyebrow. Yeah, if you think I'm dead, at least be sure to ask me first. I snicker. Lysar sighs. He puts an arm around me and draws me close. It has been pretty perfect these past few months, though don't you think? No wars, no people to fight, no enemies to kill, just you and me. It's weird, but you being pregnant is literally the calmest thing that's happened to us since we met. Yes, I'm happy here with you, I say. Maybe if we defeat Dragomir, we'll stay. Maybe. Red light starts to replace the blackness in the sky. Lysar gets up and says, Come on, Lissy, sun's starting to rise. We've been walking all night. We'll start again at sunset. Lysar gives a big yawn. He's ready to get some sleep. Okay. I put an arm out so he can help me up. Lysar lifts and I stand, but as I do so, an unusual pain sends electricity shooting throughout my body. It starts at the base of my spine, then spreads as a dull ache. It feels like a freight train slowly rolling over my lower body. Finally. Lysa, we're not going to bed, I say suddenly. I pause just to make sure. But there it is again, another contraction. I grit my teeth and hitch a breath. But besides that, I endure the pain. I'm ready for this. I am so, so ready. What? Why? I'm tired. Lysar stares at me, confused. I hold my breath as another contraction jolts through me, but I do not grimace or cry out in pain. It takes all my effort to stop from snapping at him. Lysar! 
I hiss. I grab onto his arm and squeeze tightly. I don't know how to make this more obvious. The baby's coming. Chapter Two Oh! Lysar scampers back and forth, completely flummoxed. You mean like now? Yes! I grimace as another contraction, a stronger one, presses on my spine. We have to get back to the house. Can you ride on my back? Lysar changes into a wolf. He looks at me expectantly, nervous. I can't walk, so I guess the answer is yes, I say. With extreme difficulty, I manage to navigate onto Lysar, wincing with each new contraction that passes through my body. It's incredibly painful to sit astride him, but I don't have a choice. Hang on, I'll get us there quickly. Lysar crouches down to run, then thinks better of it and starts off at a brisk walk instead. I cringe with every jostling step he takes biting my tongue as my legs burn and the pressure increases. It hurts, but I don't say anything. I don't make any indication to Lysar that it even bothers me. Everybody, Lissy's having the baby! Lysar barks once he bursts through the doors of the mansion. I slowly slide off his back, and he changes back into a man, putting an arm around me and helping me shuffle to the bedroom we designated as the birthing ward. Like now? Georgie, who was playing cards at the table with Fior, jumps up from his seat. His vampire friend peers from behind him over the little wolf's head. Yes, Lysar already said that. Yes, it's happening now, I shout. Calm down, Lissy, Lysar says soothingly. We'll be all right. I'll go fetch Shioni, Georgie whimpers, bolting up the steps. Fior follows. You can't separate those two for over a minute. Bryn and Tomlin come down the stairs curiously, dressed in their pajamas. What's going on? Tomlin yawns, rubbing his eyes. Is there really cause for such ruckus so early in the day? Do I really have to say it? Lysar asks, gesturing to my stomach with one hand and supporting me with the other. It takes a few seconds for stupid Tom to comprehend. Once he does so, he abruptly awakens. Bryn's already scuttling down the steps. What can I do? Bryn asks, looking at me in concern. Help me get her inside. And you too. Lysar points at Bryn and Tomlin. Use birth control. Bryn reddens. Tomlin throws up his hands, completely baffled. Avoiding eye contact with her brother, Bryn hooks my other arm around her shoulder and helps Lysar carry me to the birthing ward. The ward is sterile white, with a large bed and copious amounts of medical equipment inside. We went a little overboard, but better safe than sorry. When we enter the room, my water breaks. It slowly trickles down my leg as Bryn and Lysar sit me on the bed. This kid is coming fast. They aid me into a medical gown before helping me lay down. I close my eyes and try to sit with the pain, absorbing it. It feels like elephants are dancing on my pelvis. Georgie comes back with Shioni a few moments later, who is accompanied by Siege. My grandfather appears incredibly worried. He's pacing around the room and watching me, which is unlike himself. Usually the old vampire is as still as a statue. Now he can't stay in one spot. Grandfather, I say. My voice sounds so sharp and high-pitched. I hate it. I don't want to give anyone the appearance that I'm uncomfortable. Lysandra. Sergei brushes back my hair. How are things faring? I've been better. A gasp wants to escape from my throat at the next harsh contraction, but I stuff it down. I will not give in. Despite the pain, I'm glad Sergei has arrived. His presence reassures and strengthens me. I will set the perimeter and guard the vineyard to be sure we won't be bothered. Sergei leans down to kiss my head and brush back my hair before standing aside. I'm afraid I will be utterly useless to you in here, granddaughter. Go, 
I whisper. Sege leaves. She only begins preparing supplies. Antiseptic, oxygen, surgical scissors. Wolves cram themselves into the room, peering curiously at the scene that's going on around them, eyes wide and tails wagging. I need Lysar and Bryn, Shioni says, slipping on some gloves. The rest of you get out. You heard her, Lysar says. Leave. He stomps toward the wolves and starts shoving them out the door. Bryn nods to Tomlin, and he heads out eagerly. This isn't where he wants to be right now, and honestly, I don't want him around either. I need to see how dilated you are. She only props my legs up and checks. Her face goes from calm to shocked when she does. What? What's going on? Lysar asks, scared. The labor's progressing too quickly. We don't have time for an epidural, Shioni says quickly. Or any pain relief. Sorry, Lysandra, you're going to have to give birth naturally. I can take it. I inhale deeply. Just get this kid out of me. What do you mean it's going too quickly? Bryn asks, confused. The baby's probably going to be here within an hour, maybe a little more, Shioni states. Isn't labor supposed to take forever? Lysa squeaks. I thought we'd be doing this all day. Some women labor for a while, but vampires are known for quick births, delivering the child within an hour or less of when contractions begin, Shioni informs him. Wolves typically take longer, but it appears the baby's mixed blood has no effect on Lysandra. Lysar and I look at each other. His face seems calm, though his eyes are uncertain. You ready to be a dad? I ask. Oh, I'm ready, Lysar says. He grabs my hand and braces it tightly. Let's do this. She only wasn't lying when she said this baby's coming quickly. I become fully dilated within the next 30 minutes and have to start pushing. Bryn and Lysar hold my hands while I fight a wave of nausea and an agonizing twisting in my gut. I'd throw up, but I seriously have no time. The urge to push is so strong that I can't resist it. I really appreciate all this, Bryn, I say. I bite down hard on my tongue and taste blood as the contractions rattle my insides. You can repay me when it's my turn, Bryn says. I want you there when I have my babies. What, are you pregnant too? Lysar cries. I squeeze his hand and he yelps as the bones in his fingers start to crack. No, I'm not pregnant, you dolt. I meant years from now, Bryn screeches back. Well, good, because I figure Tomlin would make some pretty ugly kids. Lysar laughs loudly. He would not. Tommy's babies would be beautiful, Bryn shouts back. Can we please stop talking about Tom right now? I can't help it. Now I've got to scream. I make it a short, quick one, though I want to yell at the top of my lungs for as long as I can. Lysar moves closer and puts a hand on my head. He brushes the hair out of my eyes as another contraction squeezes. I can feel the baby moving downward through my body. It feels like I'm being split in half. I whimper, though I want to cry. You can scream, he says quietly. Shout, yell, I don't care. Whatever helps you get through the pain. I don't need to scream, I gasp. I just need to get this done. I think Lysar's a little scared of me, or impressed. He keeps eyeing me as I push. I close my eyes and try to concentrate, my only thought centered around bringing my baby into this world. Here it comes, Shioni says. Just push a little more, Lysandra. I do as she says, and suddenly, everything comes to a halt. Time is no longer existent. I don't feel the contractions, the pressure, or the baby pushing against my insides. My body is free again. The room begins to waver and melt, becoming fuzzy. My vision and head both float on a sea of confusion. Where am I? How did I get here? It's a boy, I hear Shioni say. Over my knees, I see her cleaning blood off a large newborn. 
She cuts the cord and wraps it tightly in a soft blanket. You have a son, Lysar? Whose baby is that? Is that mine? I have no idea what's going on. It's a boy. It's a boy. Lysar starts cheering and dancing around the room. He transforms from man to wolf and back to man again in a frolic of joy. He starts howling, and the wolves outside the door howl back, a chorus rising up through the mansion and echoing to the other wolves in the vineyard. A pup has just been born. Shioni places the baby in his arms, and Lysar grins broadly. He's the happiest shifter in the world right now. Now that the effort of labor is over, the reality of what I've just done hits my body. Darkness creeps in, and I start fading. Bryn notices first. She crouches by my side, saying something inaudible as my eyelids flutter. Lissy, it's a boy. I can't believe it. We have a son. Do you want to see him? Of course you want to see him. Lissy? Lissy! Lysar's voice is a tether. I let it go as I fall backward into unconsciousness. I catch a glimpse of a dark-haired, blue-eyed infant wrapped in Lysar's arms before I pass out. Chapter 3 The sun's shining so brightly it beams in through the dark curtains. My eyes flutter open and I survey the room. Slowly, everything comes into focus. I've been cleaned up and changed into a fluffy hospital robe. The room is devoid of any signs of labor and delivery. It appears quiet and peaceful. Shioni is bustling around, putting things away, while Bryn sits by my bedside. The she-wolf starts upward when I awaken. I groan, sitting up. What happened to me? My head's still a little foggy. You passed out, she only says. She shoves a bottle of blood into my hands. I sip it slowly and my stomach churns. You were so immersed in giving birth that once it actually happened, you went into shock. I've never seen anyone handle labor so well. I think you were a little too focused. Well, you know me. The blood is making me feel sick. I set it aside and say, how long was I asleep? Only a few hours. You were in and out of it after your son was born. We figured it best to let you rest. She only puts a hand on Bryn's shoulder. Hmm, I don't recall any of that. But then I do recall something. A dark-haired child resting in Lysar's strong arms. Where's my baby? I ask. I want him. Lysar's out there showing him off, Bryn says, thumbing at the door. He's kind of getting passed around. I'd figured my husband would be in here. He was annoying us, worrying over you. I had to kick him out, Shioni informs me. As if he can sense we're talking about him, Lysar enters. It's like there's a halo of joy and excitement around him. If he was the sun, he'd be beaming. Hey, Lissy. He struts over to me, leans down, and gives a sloppy, wolfish kiss on my cheek. Congratulations, you did it. Was there any doubt? I smirk, wiping my cheek. Where is my child? Can I hold him? Can she hold him? Lysar scoffs happily, snickering. She's asking if she can hold her own kid. Um, yeah? He's acting so weird and giddy. Is this a normal wolf thing? That is, if the village wants to give him back. Kipcha's got him. Hold on. Lysar waltzes out of the room, returning with Kipcha. Elisabetta walks in front. She blocks out the bundle that's in the beta's arms. Kipcha gives the baby to his alpha, and Lysar places in my arms something incredible. The baby is so soft and smells wonderful. A large mass of black hair covers his blue eyes, which are closed as he sleeps. The baby has a beating heart, like Lysar. I can smell the blood rushing through his veins. Like his father, he's very warm. 
but his complexion is porcelain like mine, the features raised and elegant instead of rugged. You can see both the vampire and the wolf in him at the same time. He's Lysar's, and he's mine. It gives me so much emotion to look at him that I can't even begin to sort out what's happening to me. Is he okay? I ask Shioni, looking at her. As okay as I can figure, Shioni shrugs. Vitals are good. Everything appears fine. You've got a healthy, average baby. With mixed blood, of course, though that doesn't appear to cause any trouble. If anything, I think it actually makes him stronger. An average baby. What a miracle. Lysol crouches down and starts fiddling with the baby's hair. Kipcha asks, You guys never told us what you decided to name the little rug rat. His name's Willem, Lysol replies. Lissy picked it out. I figured it sounded like a pretty good hybrid name. Willem for vampire, Will for wolf. He's really happy, I say, giggling. It's like I'm holding a bowling ball in my arms. I shift him to better support his head, but the baby doesn't stir. Four kilograms, 53 centimeters, Lysar says proudly. You should get a medal for carrying him around for so long. He's a big boy. Wolves have huge babies. Mom said that Lysar was gigantic when he was born, Bryn quips. Do you think he'll be able to shift? I ask, looking at the wolves for guidance. I don't know how this works. Wolf puffs shift within a few hours of being born, then change back and forth depending on how they feel, Lysar says, watching Willem. If he doesn't change soon, then... As if on cue, the newborn in my arms morphs. He changes from a sleeping baby into a tiny black wolf pup that's no bigger than my hand. The pup snuggles into the blanket before letting out a tiny mew. I stroke his dark fur with my finger lightly, feeling happier than I've been in a long time. All right! Lysar jumps up and clenches his fist happily, like his favorite hockey team just scored a goal. And there it is. Elisaveta says, giving Lysar a red-lipped smile. The moment he was waiting for. Well, you know, I would have been happy with him either way. Lysar shrugs. Sure you would, Kipcha Box. We know you, Alpha. Don't act like you haven't been dreaming of running through the woods with your kid teaching him how to hunt for months. Even if he couldn't shift, Lysar would still shove a rifle in his hand and tell him to keep up. Willem changes again. I move the baby so he's back in my arms. Elisabetta curtsies to me. I congratulate you on your son's arrival, Zarina. This is truly a day to celebrate. The monarchy now has a future to look forward to. There's no need to be so formal, Elisabetta, I say teasingly. She tilts her head. All the same. As your friend, I have to say I'm very proud of you. You and Lysar have created quite the little cutie. Elisabetta bends down and presses her cold lips to Willem's forehead. When Elisabetta kisses his temple, Willem's eyes open. He stares up at Elisabetta and smiles, giving a pleasant coo. Willem seems to notice me for the first time. His blue gaze wanders from Elisabetta to me. His smile gets broader, and he reaches his hand out of the blanket to caress my cheek in wonder. Hey, little guy, I say quietly to him. Do you remember me? When I speak, the baby lets out an excited little yell. His tiny fingers clutch at the tendrils of my golden hair, and he pulls. He recognizes my voice. At the realization, I begin to get teary-eyed. Is this what my mother felt when she held me for the first time? Total and uncontrollable, unconditional love? He knows you're his mama, Elisabetta says. Willem's eyes begin to droop. Like he's been hit by a sudden wave of tiredness, the baby relaxes and drifts back into dreamland. Tiny snorts emit from his nose. He snores as Lysar does, 
It's so unbelievably cute that I have trouble handling it. Lost interest already. Short attention span, just like Lysar. Kipcha chortles. Good luck teaching him anything important. He won't listen. It's not like you're any better, Elisabetta says quite lowly. She drags a finger across Kipcha's chest tantalizingly before cutsying to me once again. I wish you well, Zarina. I must return to Salkovia for a short time to reassess how things have been since my absence. Don't take too long to return, I say quietly before glancing at Lysar. We will need you soon. Elisabetta nods. The heels of her boots click neatly on the floor as she leaves. Ah, oh, you know that woman, always about duty, Kipcha says in admiration. He's staring at the door Elisabetta went through longingly. He's a dog, and she's got him on a leash. Put your tongue back in your mouth, man. There are kids around, Lysar jokes. Have you made a move yet? I ask Kipcha directly. Of course I have. If I get any more obvious, I'll need to tell her in person, Kipcha says. She's a tough one to crack. You will, I encourage him. Don't give up. She'll admit she likes you yet. Oh, I'm not giving up, Kipcha says with a renewed vigor. In fact, I'll try again right now, very subtly. Kipcha struts out the room. I look at Lysar. Both of us shake our heads at the same time. You know, things would be a lot easier for them if they just walked up the courage to tell each other how they feel, I say. Right? Lysar says. Worked for us. Be direct. The minute Kipcha leaves, someone else comes barging in. Sergei acts like the door is a personal blockade and the most difficult thing he's ever had to cross in all his war days. It goes flying open. The smacking sound against the wall is loud. I cringe, thinking it'll wake the baby. But it doesn't. Willem goes right on sleeping, as if a small bomb going off hasn't been the loudest thing he's ever heard in his short life. Lysandra! Sergei's face is gaunt as he rushes to my bedside. I just heard. Are you hurt? How did it go? Does everything fare well? Please tell me you're all right. I'm fine, Grandfather. I laugh. Everything went well. Now that the matter of my health is out of the way, Sergei's focus is on the new baby sleeping against my chest. Sergei's eyes are huge, round, like a baby is the same thing as an alien to him, though I'm sure he's seen plenty. Then he rears upward, shoulders thrown back high as the proud Russian in him emerges. Look at him, Sergei boasts, his chest puffed up. The forehead, the chin, a Romanov if I ever saw one. Um, actually, he's a lupuscu. Lysar mumbles softly, but I shush him quickly. He's beautiful, granddaughter. You did well. Sergei clenches my shoulder tightly, shaking it back and forth lightly. I helped, Lysar adds. I shoot him a harsh look. Oh yes, he helped, but his version of helping was way more fun than mine, I tell you. Would you like to hold him? I ask Sergei lifting Willem up to my grandfather. At first, Sergei hesitates, unsure. Guns and swords are easy for him to handle. Babies are another thing. But then Sergei extends his hands, and I give my son to him. I feel a sense of loss as Willem leaves my arms, but the emptiness is filled when I witness the sight of my grandfather holding his great-grandson, the lines in his face seem to lighten, making him appear younger as he beams downward at the baby. What a strong little vampire, Sergei says, bouncing Willem up and down. He'll make an excellent soldier one day. He has fighting in his bones. Hopefully my son will never have to be a soldier, I add quietly. After this one, I pray there will never be another war. 
hopefully not, though now I can say I have seen joy in my twilight years, Sige says happily. I believe now my life is complete. Something occurs to me as I stare at the baby. Has he eaten yet? I ask Lysar. He must be hungry. I was waiting for you, Lysar confesses, shrugging. I didn't know what to do. Vampires drink blood when they're first born, I say, glancing at Shioni. Do you have any on hand? Right here. Shioni opens the door to a cabinet and brings out a baby bottle full of blood, topped off with a nipple. She steps forward to hand it to Sige, but Lysar comes between them. Hold on, Lysar says, holding a hand up. Are we sure that's okay to give to him? Do you honestly think I'd give my child anything that would hurt him? I ask. He's half vampire. Some part of him's got to have blood. Lysar reluctantly backs off. Okay, I guess I'll trust your mother's intuition. She only gives the bottle to Sige. The old vampire tips the bottle upward and into the baby's mouth. Instinctively, Willem starts to suck. He awakens and starts chugging down the bottle faster than I've ever seen a baby drink in my life. Obviously, he likes it, I say triumphantly as the baby finishes the bottle. When it's done, Sergei puts the bottle down, but Willem's eyes look around at all of us, like he's searching for more. I, I think he's still hungry, I say, amazed. Do you think he wants more than blood? Lysar asks, glancing at me. We could try getting him to consume milk as well, Shioni says, putting a finger to her lips in thought. Though I'm not sure where we can get any. Vampires don't produce milk. If I had known that, I would have bought a cow, Lysar exclaims. Now what are we going to do? You guys are lucky I thought to pick up some formula, Bryn grumbles, getting up from her seat. A few minutes later, she returns with a warm bottle of milk this time with Tomlin behind her. Tomlin edges to the farthest corner of the room, away from Willem. He stares at my son like he's a bomb that's about to explode. Would you like to hold him, Tom? I offer politely. No, no, thank you. Tomlin shakes his head quickly. I'm fine over here, thanks. I'm scared of babies. Of course you are. Lysar rolls his eyes. Is there anything you're not frightened of? Look, babies are fine, but they're loud, and they make messes, and they are entirely too difficult to take care of, Tomlin argues. I'm perfectly all right leaving them to their business and them leaving me to mine. Guess it's a good thing you're not pregnant like we discussed earlier, right, Bryn? I ask her. She giggles. I beg your pardon? Tomlin squeaks. I saw Bryn and I laugh. Willem drinks the bottle of milk just as quickly as he drank the blood. He then settles, snuggling into the crook of Sergei's arm to go back to sleep. This kid's gonna eat us out of house and home, Lysar marvels. By the time he stops growing, he'll be the size of a barge. He does eat a lot. I don't mind. Willem's hunger means he's healthy. An ill child wouldn't eat at the rate he does. Sege hands my child back to me. You too shall always have my blessing, he says, bowing deeply as Elisaveta did. As I promised your mother, Lysandra, I promise to you that I will give my life to ensure this child's safety. On my honor, I will live and die for him. That is my duty to the Romanov family, and my duty to you, fairest granddaughter. You're not going anywhere, I say, reaching out and squeezing his hand. You're staying right here and helping us raise this baby forever. Sige smiles. And so I will, for as long as time permits me. Sige looks at Lysar. With no emotional sentiments to give, he nods, and Lysar awkwardly nods back. As Sergei takes his leave, the rest of them seem to get the point. Bryn grabs Tomlin by the arm and escorts him out. He is more than happy to go. 
I think I'll leave you three alone for some bonding time, Shioni says, putting the last of her things away and striding toward the door. If there's anything you need, Lysandra, please have someone get me and I'll come right away. Always, Shioni. I bow my head to her as she goes. For the first time, Lysara and I are left alone with our tiny, precious infant. I bet you'd like to take Will to his crib, Lysar says, rubbing my back. What do you say we go to our room? Yes, please. I'd very much like to sleep in my own bed. Despite myself, I find my energy sagging. Labor was hard, and a few hours of sleep wasn't enough to recharge me. Our bedroom is on the top floor, but luckily the mansion has an elevator, so I don't have to painfully waddle up the stairs. I find that I can move fairly well after labor, though a little gingerly. We change Willem, fit him with a new onesie, and tuck him into his cradle together. He barely stirs. Though the idea was for us to go to bed and get some sleep, we find ourselves standing over Willem's cradle for hours, watching him. We don't move, just whisper back and forth to each other gasp when he moves, and become excited when he clenches his little fists. I never thought a baby could be so absorbing, but I suppose my baby is. I don't want to take my eyes off him for one second. You're wavering, I say to Lysar when nighttime comes again. I put a hand on his back and immerse it into his fur. He changed into a wolf when we got up here and has been that way ever since standing vigilant and protective as the Alpha. I think we should take a nap. Yeah, Lysar yawns. Watch, the kids start crying right when we fall asleep. I don't think so. I stare at the crib. He seems happy for now. A nice, quiet baby. We got lucky. Lysar changes back into a man. He escorts me to bed, his arm around my waist. When we sit down on the edge of the bed, I lean my head against Lysar's chest and sigh. I feel so content. I can't believe it, Lysar marvels. We're parents. We are. I lean further into him, though it doesn't seem so unbelievable to me. It seems rather like it was meant to be, as if it's finally arrived after a long time of waiting. A little over a year ago, I couldn't even imagine being bonded to anyone. And now this, Lysar says. It's incredible. Life has a funny way of doing unexpected things, doesn't it? I say. I raise my head to kiss him. He kisses me back. When we draw our heads away, it's not each other that we look at, but the cradle. Willem still makes no sound. He's wonderful, isn't he? I say, my perfect little boy, and I love him more than the stars in the sky I do. I love him too. Lysar strokes my hair. This is a new start for both of us. It's the beginning we've been looking for. I open my mouth to say something, then shut it. I'm not mentioning Dragomir. Not today. This moment is too brilliant too perfect. The door slams open and shakes the whole room. This time, Willem cries. He emits a wail that crushes my very core. I get up and scuttle to the crib. I lift him into my arms and bounce him to try and get him to calm down. He keeps crying and his face turns red. So much for a nice, quiet baby. Brynn, seriously? Lysar says, gesturing to the baby. Can't you guys leave us alone for two seconds? We're having a family moment here. Bryn pays no attention to her brother's outburst. Instead, she looks at me. You and Will have to leave, Bryn says quickly. The vineyard is under attack. Chapter Four What? It feels like someone is choking me. What are you talking about? Cursed ones and haunted are at our doors, Bryn says. We have to get Liss and the baby out. It'll be safer for them in here, 
Lysar insists, instantly going into alpha mode. More defenses. We can't guard her here, Lysar. They're almost getting in, Bryn snaps. Any second now, they'll break down the door. There's no other way. We have to make a run for it. Lissy, go to the bunker, Lysar tells me. Bryn, you escort her there. Protect them. I don't want to leave your side, I say. What if something happens to you? I'll fight a lot better if I know you and Will are safe than if I think you aren't, he replies. He kisses my cheek, then cups my chin before changing into a wolf. Run, Lissy, he tells me as he bounds out the door. It goes swinging on his way out. We gotta go, Bryn says, changing into a wolf herself. Can you hurry? I can't run or fight, Bryn, and I can't climb on your back either, not when I just gave birth, I protest. It's okay, slow going then. Bryn leads the way, and I cling Willem to my chest. The baby's screams get louder, and I begin to hear the shouts and cries of battle below as they echo throughout the house. The entrance hall is chaos. Lysar fights beside Sige, Tomlin, Valeri, Fior, Shioni, and the pack as they take on a large group of cursed ones and haunted who have infiltrated the area. The monsters wage war with our pack, attempting to tear our friends limb from limb. A cursed one advances on us, its fingernails longer than its arms. It lashes out its claws at me, but Bryn launches forward, snapping her jaws down on the cursed one's hand. It comes clean off. The monster wails as Bryn tries not to gag, pawing at her muzzle to get the rotten taste out of her mouth. Two haunted advance, but Lysar jumps in front of us and knocks them out of the way. Rosa, go with Bryn, Lysar commands. Obediently, Rosa abandons the corpse of the cursed one she took down and joins our side, snarling at our foes. Valeri goes to follow, but a haunted snags his attention and he's forced to stay put. Bryn, Rosa, and I leave out the back door, the she-wolves pressing in on both sides of me for protection. The clash of swords against nails and snarling growls can be heard everywhere, even from the vineyard outside. It's a chilling sound. Should we go back? Bren pucks up her ears and looks behind her. It sounds like they need our help. We have to protect the Alpha female and the son of the Alpha, Rosa insists. This is our way. I'm momentarily shocked. Rosa has never shown me an ounce of respect, nor acknowledged I was her Alpha until now. I suppose being Willem's mother changes everything in her eyes. She has an obligation to live or die defending the son of the Alpha. That protection extends to me as well. How did they get past our defenses? I whisper as we leave the vineyard and enter the woods. I feel like we're not alone out here. There were too many of them, Bryn replies. The pack was overwhelmed and had to fall back. The bunker isn't far. Sige had it installed for security purposes the moment we showed up, just in case something like this happened. The metal container is in sight. It's buried underneath the ground, stairs leading to the doorway. Only a little farther. Willem's still wailing. I think I've gone deaf in my left ear. My lord, he's got some lungs. We have to get him to be quiet. They'll find us, Bryn says nervously dancing back and forth on her paws. Shh, Will, I hush again, bouncing him up and down. It's okay, I promise, everything's going to be. Rosa screams as a haunted barrels into her from the side. She rolls over and over, landing underneath the mutated wolf when she slides to a stop. The haunted lifts a paw to deliver a strike, but Rosa snags the monster's paw in her mouth instead. The haunted rears backward, shaking Rosa violently. She won't let go. A cursed one drops from the trees and aims for Bryn, but she dodges it and spins to the side. She's able to knock the feet out from underneath the cursed one and goes for the throat, but the cursed one knocks her aside and sends her flying into a tree. Growling, Bryn launches herself back up again. 
She just barely manages to snag the cursed one's ankle and drag it back down before the hideous vampire can get to me or Willem. The bunker, Liss! Bryn screams as she pounces on the cursed one again. Get to the bunker and lock it! What about you two? I ask, backing away. The eyes of the cursed one are focused on my baby. It wants my Willem. Not a chance. We'll be fine. Go! Bryn grabs the cursed one with her teeth and swings it into a tree trunk. There's a loud crunching sound. Unable to do anything of use, I follow Bryn's orders and start dotting to the bunker. Despite my pain, I run as best and as fast as I can. I can't let them get to Willem. As the bunker door comes into view and the trees whirl by, something comes to mind. My vision, the one I had at Baba Yaga's house months ago. Me running through the woods with the baby. It came true. Baba Yaga's ominous words that I'm destined for a dark fate come rampaging back after being forgotten about for weeks. I can't avoid the future, nor can I change it. I'm only waiting to seal my doom. I throw open the bunker door. I set Willem down on the army bed inside, then bolt the door shut. I rush back to the bed and clutch my baby to my chest. Willem's still crying, but softer now, sniffling. I rock him back and forth as I stare at the door, willing for Rosa and Bryn to come back. It feels like I'm completely alone, just waiting for the cursed ones and the haunted to come make a massacre of me and my baby. When there's a knock on the door, I jolt upright. All the air fades from my lungs. I put Willem down again and use the people to look out. It's Bryn and Rosa, bloodied but alive and unhurt. I open the locks and let them in. Are you two all right? I ask. Bryn brushes the dirt off herself, while Rosa collapses onto a different bed than Willem's, leaking cursed one and haunted blood from her fur. We're okay, Bryn replies. For now, we won't be able to hide in this bunker forever. We can for a while. I look around. Sige made sure to stock the bunker with medical supplies and two weeks' worth of food, water, and blood, though I'm hoping to Dracula we don't have to use it. Eventually, silence falls. It's the scariest thing of all. At least with the sounds of violence, you know something's going on. This is different. We aren't sure if our friends are alive or dead, if Dragomir's forces won, or if we did. All we can do is wait and hope. There's another knock on the door and shouts from the outside. We don't know if we should open it, but find that we have no choice. There's no time to look through the peephole as the levers begin turning of their own accord. Someone outside has the key. We collectively hold our breath when the bunker door opens, then sigh in relief when we see Sergei enter followed by Tomlin and Lysar. Tomlin and Bryn kiss deeply when they meet. Lysar proceeds to me, checking over Willem and then myself, before stroking his hands over both of our heads. What happened out there? I ask, as Sige bolts the door shut behind us once more. Are there cursed ones and haunted still about? We managed to get most of them, we think, Lysar says. Dragomir will notice they're gone and figure out where we are. So what do we do now? Bryn asks. Move again? Lysaw shakes his head. I don't know yet. Georgie, Kipcha, and the others are resetting the perimeter. They're due to report back to me once it's done. Sige begins removing extra cots from the bunker's closet. He sets them up for people to use, and wolves and vampires start taking them. I lay Willem down in a spare cradle we were blessed enough to remember to store here before lying down myself. Lysar doesn't sleep. He prowls at the door as a wolf, snarling. He raises his lip even at the sound of a leaf hitting the bunker. We wait out the rest of the night and the entirety of the next day waiting for Georgie and Kipcha. It's long and dark. 
we hardly say a word. I'm preoccupied with taking care of Willem, as we did pack diapers and other supplies inside the bunker in case this situation arose, but I can tell the others are bored and restless. This is the worst part of war, the waiting, the hoping, the longing to receive answers that you're scared to receive in the first place. When it gets past six in the evening, Lysar is about to go look for them himself when the door finally receives a knock. What took you guys so long? Lysar demands as Kipcha and Georgie enter. They're covered with more dirt and grime than the rest of us. Georgie's clothes are so caked with blood they stick to his skin. We found some stragglers along the edge of the border. We took care of all the bodies, Kipcha says. Looks more like an intel mission than an actual attack. Some dumbass got him and the rest of the creepies caught. How much of the pack did we lose? Lysa asks solemnly. Not many. A few French wolves, some Africans. Kipcha replies. A loss any way you look at it, but at least the rest of us are safe. Lysa nods. He puts his arm around me and says, We can head back to the house now. Come on. Two weeks after Willem's birth, I'm able to fight again. It makes me feel more secure. After the attack on the vineyard, being unable to run, wield a dagger, or defend myself or my family practically made me feel sick. I'm not 100% better, but feel I will be with more time and training. Vampires, after all, recover quickly. After we got back, we found that the mansion was torn apart on the inside but it was mostly cosmetic. We were able to clean up most of the wreckage in a day or so. Willem is wonderful. He's a happy baby who rarely cries and who drinks 12 bottles a day. He sleeps often, waking up only to laugh or to change into a tiny wolf and try to walk. She only told me that he'll be able to walk as a pup first before he can walk as a baby, though that seems unusual to me. Lysa is so busy securing the vineyard and patrolling with the pack that he doesn't seem to notice Willem's growth. I feel like the war is making him miss out on all his son's important moments. But then again, everything Willem does seems important to me. If I could throw a party for every little thing Willem does, I would. I'm preparing another bottle of formula for Willem in the kitchen when Sergei enters. The baby is nestled happily in his swing. I pick him up and sit at the kitchen table to feed him. Sergei sits across from me, staring at the child. It seems so strange to me, he murmurs. It wasn't very long ago that I held you in my arms after you were first born, even tinier than Willem was. Now you've got a child of your own. And on and on the cycle continues. I've never heard you be so philosophical, I tease. Stop it, it's unlike you. It feels strange to me to realize that I'm so old when I feel so young. Sige takes a deep sigh. I suppose you wouldn't be used to my melancholy, would you? I've always been serious, no nonsense. And I like it that way, I state. I always knew what to expect of you. I knew no matter what, you'd always be there. Hmm, I suppose so. Sige puts a hand on his beard. But even so, I wonder if that was a mistake. Perhaps I should have shown more emotion with you growing up. I pushed you too hard. You did no such thing. You've never made any mistakes with me, I insist. You were always a wonderful grandfather. His head drops in shame. Perhaps so. I only wish I could have done better with your mother. If so, perhaps she'd be alive today. Sige's eyes darken. After all these years... It still seems like he just received the news my mother passed away. I wish there was something I could do to remove his pain, but there is nothing. After musing it over for a moment, I remark, 
Mother made her own choices. Willem finishes the bottle, and I put it down on the table. I know she did what she considered best for the monarchy, but she could have resisted Dragomir more than she did. I don't believe she could have, granddaughter. Sige closes his eyes and shakes his head. I hope you will forgive me for saying this, but she was never strong like you. I shift Willem to one arm and reach out to hold Sige's hand. We both miss her, I say softly. Her death wasn't your fault. Logically, that may be true, but there will always be a part of me that will blame myself for what happened that night. Sege rises from the table. He squeezes my hand before trailing a finger over Willem's hairline. I must leave for a time, he tells me. There are friends of mine, vampires located in hidden spots throughout the world, who may have the numbers we need to help us defeat Dragomir. If I can convince them to align their forces with us, we will finally be ready to face him in battle. Must you leave now? I frown. I'll miss you. I'll take the copter. I'll only be gone for a few days. Sege clasps a hand on my shoulder. You are my granddaughter, but you are also my Tsarina. I must do everything I can to be certain you will take the throne and that your son remains next in line to lead. I'll return to your side as soon as I'm able. Sege bows to me. He turns on his heel to leave, sweeping out the door. I love you, grandfather. I call out as he leaves. He doesn't reply, but he smiles. I sigh and rub my face, feeling like it's going to fall off. Exhaustion is one thing that hasn't gone away these days. Groggily, I get up and head back toward the elevator, but Bryn blocks my path. You look like you could use a break, she says. She holds out her arms expectantly, looking at the baby. Yeah. I say, handing Willem off to Bryn. I could really use a nap, or at least some time to myself. I rub my face again. My eyelids feel puffy and droopy. So attractive. You ever need a moment, just say so. There are more than enough people here who are happy to babysit, Bryn says, shifting Willem to her hip. The Wonder Boys over there would be good to ask. They're basically kids themselves, and they need stuff to do. She jocks her elbow at Georgie and Fior, who are playing outside. Through the window, I watch as they kick a soccer ball back and forth at each other, laughing. They're supposed to be guarding the house, but they seem to have gotten distracted. Both of them are okay fighters, Fior far better than Georgie, but Lysar's told me they get in the way more than anything else. Whatever, if someone tries to enter, Fior can just stand in the doorway. He's so large that no one's getting around him, even if he is just a giant teddy bear. My first thought is of bed, but when I check the time again, it's so early in the night, I figure taking a walk would be a much better idea. I'll be back in a minute, Bryn, I tell her. I grab my cloak and swing it around my shoulder. Take your time. Bryn places Willem on the floor and changes into a wolf, poking him with her paw. Willem follows her lead, though he seems more interested in napping than playing. I cast another anxious glance back at my son before he fades from my sight. I stroll around the vineyard before deciding to take a walk through the forest. I'll be safe. The pack patrols much farther out than this. The moon is very bright. A night like this reminds me of the bloody evening I experienced long ago. A peaceful stroll suddenly turned violent, blood and fangs destroying the beauty of the dark. I shake my head. I'm being ridiculous. History isn't repeating itself. I'm being silly. I go to continue my walk, looping slowly through the trees. A sharp wail pierces the night. I bring myself to a halt and listen closely. Is someone yelling, or is it just my... More screaming. 
someone's in trouble. I sniff the air. It's definitely not a human, but another vampire. Orange peel and rose petals fill the air. The scent seems familiar, but misplaced, like I knew it so well, but forgot it long ago. The scent is mixed with one of another vampire. The scent is strange to me, mingled with the rotten stench of cursed ones and haunted. Two vampires are out there, being attacked. I break into a run and rush toward the screaming. When it grows closer, I lunge forward and rip my dagger out of the sheath on my leg. I pause when the vineyard's property line ceases. I know better than to cross-pack boundaries and venture where it's unsafe. But someone out there needs my help. Forcing myself not to think, I dart past the property line and venture inward where the screaming grows louder. I part the branches with my hand and look inward. A male vampire, middle-aged, holds a bloody sword aloft in a forest clearing. His clothes are filthy and tattered, like he's been running for days. He's protecting a female, one who wears a red velvet cloak and is hunched over in the dirt. She's the one screaming. Her scent is overpowering now. Three haunted and two cursed ones close in on the two vampires. I go to intervene, but as the female raises her head, her haunting gaze stops me right in my tracks. No, it can't be. Mother. Chapter 5 She looks the same as she ever did. Long blonde white hair like mine, blue eyes like mine. Her face is older, lines etching the areas beneath her eyes and cheekbones. But it's still her. This can't be real. My mother is dead. I watched her die. How can she be right in front of me? This isn't an illusion or spell. The smell is right on. She's solid. She doesn't waver upon the air. A thought crosses my mind as my feet have me rooted to the ground. Did she always look this frightened, this afraid? A growl from a wayward haunted snaps me out of it. The vampire she's with is too exhausted to fight, so it's up to me to defend her. Not sure if I've lost my mind or if I'm protecting a ghost, I launch myself out of the brush with a war cry. I land on the back of a haunted. I plunge my dagger into the base of his neck before I rip it out and leap off his shoulders, attaching myself to the back of the next haunted and slicing through his throat. I whirl around, grab him by the mane on his neck and toss him toward the two cursed ones. The monster makes an impact, knocking both cursed vampires over. I deal with the third haunted by gutting it, sawing my knife across his belly in one powerful movement before proceeding to the cursed ones that are struggling to lift the corpse of the haunted off of them. I dive my knife into the forehead of one. It screams in pain as it dies before I use my free hand to wrap my fingers around the dirty tendrils of the other monster's hair, pulling upwards. I dismember the head like it's nothing. Its shocked face remains permanently contorted as I throw the head beside its body. Killed all of them within a few seconds. My stomach is burning, my thighs and the area between my legs throbbing like someone beat me there with a hot brand. I shouldn't have been this active, not a few weeks after delivering my son. I don't care. I don't care about the pain or if I've hurt myself. All I care about is the dead person standing in front of me. The male vampire lowers his sword slowly. I don't recognize him, but by the astonished gaze he gives in return, he knows me. The female, Katya, mother, stands up and moves him aside. It's like looking at an older, more scared version of myself. I'm reminded of the mirror I conquered at Le Chateau de Mir. That 
was a spell. This is the real deal. Tears well in the vampire's eyes. She steps forward, her hands clasped together and trembling. Lysandra, she whispers. Her voice is like an arrow through my gut, piercing. Is that really you? After all this time, hearing her speak, seeing her in front of me, it's enough to render me speechless. I swallow, unable to get the words out. What do I say to her? What can I say after she's been gone for so long? Oh, my Lysandra! Unable to restrain herself any longer, Katya lunges forward and grabs me, wrapping me in a tight hug. My knees go weak. I crumple downward at her touch, but Katya holds me up, supporting my body as she embraces me tightly. She begins to weep, soft sobs echoing in my ear. I hesitate for just a second, thinking this is some sort of trap before my walls fall away. I drop the dagger and hug her back. Tears leak from my eyes when I close them. I missed her so much. Mother, I say. I inhale her scent again, so wonderful and sweet. Mother? I can't do much besides say her name. I know, Lysandra. She puts a hand to the back of my head. I'm here. I promise. She promises? Promises what? That she won't leave again? A spark flickers in my belly. Now that the initial shock has worn away, my grief and surprise is melding into something different. Anger. You? You made me think you were dead. I pull away from her. It's hard to breathe. Where did you go? Where have you been? Katya bites her lip. She grabs my free hand and says, I'm sorry, Lysandra. I know. I owe you answers. Hell yes, you do! I bite back. I pull my hand away. I'm shocked at my bitter tone, but that doesn't stop it from coming out of my mouth. I want to know, why did you choose to leave me? Katya extends her hands to me, telling me to calm down. Like hell. I know this is a surprise. A surprise? But it was for your own good, she finishes. She gestures to the male. He comes obediently to her side without question. This is Mormont, she says. He's been with me for some time. I look at him. Some time? How long has that been? Mormont chances a quick glance at Katya, and my stomach churns. I know that look. It's the same way Lysar looks at me. Mormont is my mother's mate. How long have you two been together? I ask abruptly. That's not how long. Katya's mouth becomes a thin line. Lysandra, I'd appreciate it if you could be a bit politer. Politeness! I erupt. Politeness be damned! You abandoned me! I need to know why! There are things you don't understand, Katya insists harshly. Mormont came with me when we left Castel de Singe. So you could take him with you, but not me. You thought it'd be okay to run away with him while leaving your daughter to be victimized by your cruel husband. I snap. I'm so hurt. She'd better have a good explanation for this. Kotcha's mouth opens and closes, but she doesn't say anything. There are echoes in the woods. Cries for my name. I hear Lysar's voice bouncing off the trees. My beloved is searching for me. Wolves, Katya whimpers. Her eyes contract and she grows closer to Mormont. There are wolves in these woods. They're with me, I say. You have nothing to fear from them. What do you mean? Katya's voice is weak. Wolves are our enemies. They'll kill us if we remain here. What, like they killed you last time? Or was that all an act? I bark cruelly. My mother's face becomes stricken. 
I remind myself to stay calm. I sigh and suppress a wave of annoyance. Never mind, I say. I'll show you. I put away my dagger, then turn away from my mother. It hurts to do. Over here, Lysar! I cup my hands over my mouth and shout as loud as I can. Seconds later, Lysar and Kipcha arrive, both in wolf form. They go skidding to my side, looking around at the carnage. Mormont has a good grip on his sword, but he doesn't raise it. Kotcha clutches onto his arm, terrified once more. I don't remember her being so weak. Well, Liz, Kipcha says, nudging the head of the cursed one. It goes rolling down the hill. Had a mini freakout session? Lissy. Lysar transforms back into a man. He strides up to me and strokes my cheek with his hand. Why'd you run off? You know you're not supposed to leave the vineyard. His tone is loving but stern. There's the alpha coming out in him again. I see it more and more every day. I was just out for a walk. I'm sorry I wandered too far, I say sincerely. I lean into his hand and close my eyes. This is something that's real. He's someone I can count on. Not her. Lysandra, who is this wolf? Katya breaks the perfect moment. My eyes open. Lysar turns toward Katya and Mormont as if seeing them for the first time. His eyes narrow, then widen in disbelief. He glances from me to Katya as if seeing duplicates. This is Lysar, I say to her. My husband. I take Lysar's hand. His touch is what I need right now. I gesture toward Katya. Lysar, this is my mother. Your, your mother? Lysar stutters. I thought your mother was dead. I know. I whisper back to him, but it appears that was a lie. Katya seems to have been spooked by a ghost. You're married to a wolf? She asks incredulously. Yes, I say. Things are different since you left, mother. Katya goes to say something, but Mormont grabs her arm as if to tell her now is not the time. Katya's lips thin disapprovingly, and she says... Very well, we'll speak of this later. She acts as if my marriage is something negotiable. While I'm locked in Katya's stare, Lysar thankfully steps in and says, What are you doing here? It's unusual we'd run into you right outside our home. Haunted and cursed ones destroyed our village. We've been on the run from them since. Mormont speaks for the first time, his voice gravelly and deep. A village? So they haven't been on the run. They've been living somewhere for a while, making a new life in a new place without me. Lysar glances at me. I say nothing. We have a place you can stay, he says. That is, if you're on our side. What side? I'm still confused as to why my daughter is hanging around wolves. Katya says, cutting Lysar off. It makes me angrier. She hasn't thought to check up in years. Now suddenly she cares about who I'm with. Long story short, mother, some of us vampires have joined forces with the wolves in order to take down Dragomir, I say. She nearly laughs. Take down Dragomir. That's impossible. Hey, that's what Liss always says. But I figure we're stupid enough to try, so why not? Kipcha barks, chuckling. Katya doesn't laugh at the joke. Kipcha looks down, embarrassed. I feel a wave of anger rise up in me for my friend, and I ask, are you coming with us or not? Katya remains silent. Mormont nods and says, if you have a place that's safe, we're more than willing to stay. Fine. I turn around and pull Lysar behind me. Follow me. The walk back to the vineyard is long and awkward. I can tell there are a million things Lysar wants to ask, but he remains silent. When we get back to the vineyard, 
Katya looks around suspiciously at the wolves surrounding the area, mixed in with small groups of vampires. She doesn't fit into this new world Lysar and I have created. It's obvious. She likes boundaries. You two can stay in the guest bedroom beside the kitchen, Lysar says when we enter the house. I'd put you upstairs, but I don't want my son to bother you. He usually sleeps through the night, but sometimes he gets fussy. Lysandra, you married a wolf with a son, Katya says. The disapproval gets worse by the minute. He's our son, I say. Willem. You can't have a son. You're too young, Katya states harshly. Well, I do, and I very much want to return to him, I respond. I want to kick the door down, but I open it gently instead and wave my hand inside. Katya steps forward. She goes to take my hands but thinks better of it and lets them drop to her side. Lysandra, I promise I will answer every single question you have tomorrow. She nibbles on her lip again. I realize it's an annoying habit I got from her. But not tonight. I need to rest. That's fine. I've gone years without answers. I can wait one more night. I snap. I turn on my heel and head upstairs before Katya can say anything else. Brin's in my bedroom, watching over Willem in his crib. She notices the sour look on my face. What's wrong? She asks instantly. Something's up. Talk to your brother, please, I ask. He'll explain. Holy Dracula Kotcha's alive! I hear Tomlin's obnoxious yell all the way down the hall. I roll my eyes. Brin raises an eyebrow. Katya, isn't that your mom? She asks. My voice wavers. I don't want to talk about it right now, Brin. I don't want to cry either. I won't cry. I just need a moment alone with my son, please. Okay. Brin changes into a wolf and pads slowly out the room. The door clicks shut. I hover over Willem's cradle. Despite the ruckus downstairs, he sleeps so softly, so peacefully. Could I run away and leave him behind? I'd rather die. My saw enters. I'm glad to hear him lock the door behind him as he joins me beside Willem's cradle. He looks at me and says, You didn't even wish her good night. I keep my eyes on Willem. I long to pick him up and hold him, but I don't want to wake him from his dreamland. I can't imagine ripping myself away from Willem for any reason, I say. How could she leave me? I know. I can't either. Lysar reaches down and moves Willem's arm so it's by his side instead of over his head. But she's got to have a good reason, right? What reason could any parent have to leave their child? My voice cracks. Maybe for a little while, but for all these years, without even telling me she was alive? My mom did bad things too, Lissy, Lysar reminds me. Don't make your mom out to be a villain when she might not be. We both know Dragomir's awful. I know your mother hurt you, but what Sylvia did, she did out of love. Damn voice is wavering again. She didn't choose to leave you and make you think she died. All I'm saying is I'd do anything to have my mom back. You've got a second chance, Lysar says patiently. Don't waste it because she hurt you, especially when you don't know why. Lysar loops his arm around my waist and pulls me to him. I'm not asking you to forgive her. Just give her a chance. How many people have we given chances that have hurt us, Lysar? She doesn't like you, and she doesn't know anything about you except that you're a wolf. How does that make her any different from my father? I sniff. I told myself I would not cry. I don't know what the point of this is or why we keep fighting. Don't talk like that. I need you, Lizzie. Do you hear me? I need you. Lysar puts his forehead to mine. I need you, and I need Will. That's all I have to keep me going. 
I need you both too, I say. But I don't know why everyone is always trying to take you away from me. I thought my mom would at least be happy to see me. But so far, it just looks like she's judgmental of all the choices I made when she wasn't there to help me make them. Screw her, then. Everything else is extra, right? Maybe your mom has an explanation. Or maybe she's just a bitch. We'll find out later. But that doesn't change what's between you and me. He smiles at me and grips my arms. We're unbreakable. Nothing's kept us apart so far, and nothing ever will. I nod, gathering my bearings. No, you're right. Nothing. I give him a kiss. He kisses me back lovingly before pulling back and adding, One thing's for sure. Sergei's gonna lose his head when he gets back. That brings a smile to my face. No matter what is between my mother and I, Having his daughter back is going to thrill Sergei to no end. He'll finally be happy again, completely happy, like nothing bad ever happened. No matter how my mother reacts to what I've done, or what excuses she gives me as to where she's been, it still makes me hopeful that our family will be together and whole again. Lysar and I stay in our room for the rest of the night, avoiding responsibility and doing some much-needed catching up on some of his favorite shows before the dawn rises and we go to bed. Lysar slips off to sleep quickly, but I don't close my eyes until after I'm done feeding and changing my son, playing with him, and sending him off to sleep once more. I could never violate the bond that ties my son and I. How could Katya do that to me? I guess I'll find out. Tomorrow, I'll finally get some answers. Chapter 6 When the moon rises the next night, I stand in the doorway of the mansion and take a deep breath. Sitting at the edge of a fountain in the vineyard is my mother, looking up at the crescent moon above with her hands tucked politely on her lap. She still dresses in those beautiful gowns of hers, even though there's no party or celebration to be had. Her hair is even longer than it once was, braided all the way down her back, her nails still manicured, despite being on the run. Small details I missed when we were first introduced yesterday. Willem squirms in my arms, and Lysar gives me a tiny nudge. Go on, he whispers. I'm right behind you. I bravely venture forward. Lysar and Bryn would do anything to get Sylvia back, no matter what she did. So many nights, I begged whatever force runs this world to bring my mother back to me. I swore that I'd do anything to have her by my side again, and now she's returned. Whatever happened in the past, she's here now. To be angry with her would be ungrateful, wouldn't it? The universe answered my prayers. I have to honor that. Katya's blue eyes grow wide when she notices Willem tucked against my side. She says, Is he truly yours? Yes, I reply. This is Willem. Before she has a choice, I lean down and put Willem on her lap. She holds him gingerly, at an arm's distance, she surveys his nose, lips, and hair. What is he? she asks. Vampire, or... He's half and half, Lysar breaks in. Vampire and werewolf. Drinks blood and everything. I didn't believe such a thing was possible. Katya's voice is mystical, awed. For the first time, she seems impressed by something I've done. Neither did we, I say. But then he came. Willem starts to fuss. As he emits tiny wails, Katya starts jiggling her knees, which only upsets him more. Katya appears totally lost with Willem, like she doesn't know how to handle a baby. That's ridiculous, isn't it? She had me. Lysar notices her floundering and bends down to pick up our son. He slowly backs away. I'll leave you two to catch up. 
Willem settles in Lysar's arms. Take however much time you need. A crushing wave of panic falls over me as I watch Lysar stroll away. Willem's big blue eyes watch me until they're gone. Silence falls, and it's awkward. So awkward. All I wanted for years and years was to have one more moment alone with my mother. Now that I have it, I don't know what to do with it. He's a newborn, Katya says, lessening the tension. I suppose you two haven't been together long? I got pregnant after we were married, mother, I say dryly. Oh, her lips purse. I see. How did you two meet? He was badly hurt during a siege on Castel de Singe, I explain. I saved him. Dragomir found out, and we've been on the run ever since. You were bold enough to hide a wolf within Dragomir's walls. Katya gasps. This is something she would never consider doing. I loved him, I say. What else could I do? Katya turns away. I don't think if my mother was in the same situation, she would have done the same. Not even for love. I stare at the ground. It's strange, all these wolves and vampires living together. I see Tomlin's got himself a she-wolf as well, Katya finishes. Children today are strange. A lot has happened. I'm willing to tell you everything. I look up from the ground. That is, if you're willing to do the same. Katya sighs. She rises to her feet, ever elegant. Walk with me. I go to follow. We begin twisting our way through the grapevines, Katya's long dress trailing behind her, until we're at the edge of the vineyard. Her movements are slow. I copy her. With my mother around, I'm heavily reminded of who I am. Stand up straight, walk proper, be a good girl. Always be well refined, never stutter, never appear foolish. Be a vampire. Or maybe these things were never me. Perhaps they were just what I was forced to be. I ask that you try to understand, Katya says. Her fingers reach out to stroke the grapevines. I find something that reminds me of her old self in the action. I won't judge, I say. I just need to know why. My fingers reach out to follow hers through the vines, a copycat response. Is that what Willem will be like with me? Mother, I watched you die. I saw you. Wolves tore you apart. That they did, she replies but they did not kill me. Katya stops. The soldiers took you away before you could watch the wolves carry me off. The pack was about to finish me, but Mormont arrived. He had broken off from his battalion to search for me. Mormont was in Dragomir's service? I ask. He was a guard. We had known each other for a long time, she replies. He refused to believe I was dead. He found me, killed the wolves that had mangled me, and took me to a safe place where I could recover from my injuries. She takes a turn, going in circles. After I was well again, Mormont and I fled to Spain. He has family there, but there aren't many other vampires, you see, too sunny and warm. We thought we'd be safe. We've been living in a town called Mijas ever since, until Cursed Ones came and destroyed everything. We've been hopping from country to country for months, trying to find a safe place. It seems we've found it here with you. So, you've been living in Spain for the past five years, and you never wanted to come back for me? I ask weakly. The crow's feet at Katya's eyes crinkle. I did want to come back, Lysandra. I wanted you to be with me. I just didn't have the heart. Didn't have the... Once I was free of that place, thinking of returning to Romania was equal to signing myself over to hell, she says. I could not go back, Lysandra, not for any reason. 
Then why didn't you take me with you? I ask. I go to grab her hands, but think better of it and hold myself back. We could have escaped together. I tried, Lysandra, so many times. Katya's eyes water. I ran away with you constantly when you were a baby, but I always got caught. By the time you were a toddler, I gave up trying to run. We could have done it. We didn't have to do it alone, I say. Sirke would have helped us. Father. Katya's eyes are light, as if remembering him for the first time. Is he here? He's gathering vampires to help us fight against Dragomir, I reply. He told me when he left he would only be gone for a day or so. Katya nibbles on her index finger nervously. I remember it's her replacement over gnawing on fingernails. I don't know if you want to see me. Sige could never blame you for anything. He just wanted his daughter back, I say. He was devastated when you left, mother. But now you can fix it and make it right again. I pause. I just don't know why you had to put us through it in the first place. I truly believed that you'd both be better off without me, she whispers. If I had thought that wasn't true, I would have stayed. Why do you think our lives would be better? Mother, I needed you and you weren't there for me. Don't blame. I know it's so hard to do, but don't blame. Lysar's words come back to me. We had a long conversation about this the moment we woke up. His calm words are the only thing keeping me somewhat rational. I hold my breath. This is so unlike you. You used to take me hiking and camping, climb mountains with me, run through the fields. You were free and adventurous and full of life, I insist. You can't tell me that part of you isn't in there. I won't believe Dragomir killed that part of you completely. The old you would have never just up and left. Those things, Katya shakes her head. That's not who I am anymore, and it was foolish to put you through that. I gave you false hope, letting you run around like a child with me. They were stupid things. This is the way the world works now. It doesn't excuse why... You were always stronger than me, Lysandra. Even as a little girl, you were brave, she says. I shake my head. I don't think I'm brave. I just try to do what's best for other people. And there's the reason why I couldn't take you with me. Katya's eyes, once so cold, are now shining with tears. You had, and still have, a responsibility to our people. I did what was right by making you stay. The Romanov line needed you. The vampire race cannot continue to exist with Dragomir ruling over us. So my duty to the monarchy was more important than my own happiness? I ask in disbelief. We all make sacrifices for the crown, Katya says. Mine was to give up my daughter. You never had to give me up. I say bitterly, you chose to. Katya crosses her arms and says nothing more. When I imagined being reunited with my mother during fantasies I had shortly after her death, I never believed that the biggest emotion I'd feel was disappointment. My mother isn't the person I remember. She's not even close to the person she used to be. And that's a hard lesson to learn. The monarchy. Something crosses my mind, and I venture closer to my mother. You told me that you had known Mormont for a long time. I lick my lips. Mother, am I Mormont's daughter, or Dragomir's? If I had a beating heart, it would be pounding. Katya's face falls into despair. She puts her hands in her face and says, that is the biggest shame of my life, Lysandra. I do not know. You could be either. Emotions whirl through me. The joy that Dragomir might not be my father expands and swells throughout my chest. I don't know Mormont, but to think I could have a relationship with him, 
come to have him as someone that might actually treat me as a daughter instead of a slave. But if I'm not Dragomir's descendant, then I have no ties to the monarchy whatsoever, and therefore no claim to the throne. I can't let my people down like that, even if I don't have Romanov blood. I have to usurp Dragomir at whatever cost, no matter whose daughter I am. It doesn't matter, I say out loud, and my mother looks up. Regardless of whose blood shares mine, I have to take Dragomir down. Lysandra, this plan you have to kill Dragomir is ridiculous. Katya shakes her head. Tomlin told me everything. It's madness. It's not going to work. He'll kill you and your armies before you get the chance to get near him. Typical of Tom to go and open his big mouth. I must tell Bryn to make sure her boyfriend stays in line. I have to do this, mother. It's the only way Lysar and I can be free. You chose to marry a wolf instead of performing your duty as princess, Katya says firmly. I didn't make these sacrifices for you so you could throw the monarchy away on something that you believe is love. That boss... Katya hesitates. It feels like she just punched me in the gut. She was going to call Lysar a bastard. She doesn't know him. Not at all. She doesn't know me. This wolf. Katya changes her direction. I don't approve. I never will. How could you marry someone like him, and worse, make a child with him? They're not all the same, just like vampires aren't all the same, I snap. If you'd open your eyes, you'd see that. He makes me happy. That's all that matters. You should support me in whatever decision I make. I will not support my daughter when she's on a mission to get herself killed, Katya replies sharply. You can't be, Tsarina. You have no hope. End this before you can no longer turn back. All you've told me since we've been reunited is that I can't be this and I can't be that. I can't be married. I can't have a son. I can't be Tsarina. I take a quick gasp of air. You haven't told me that you're proud of me or that you missed me or even that you're sorry for making me think that you died. Katya blinks. I'm sorry. I almost want to tell her it's too late, but I don't. Let's, let's head back, I say finally, because there's nothing else to add. I'm hungry, I want breakfast. Katya grimly follows. My stomach's churning. In all reality, I'm not hungry at all. I just want to get away from her. How hideous of a thought since I spent most of last night dreaming that I'd spend most of today in her arms. Up until now, I always thought my mother would approve of Lysar if she was around. Guess I didn't know her as well as I thought. The house is less than a kilometer away, yet someone blocks our path, two shadows looming against the darkness of the night. Katya gasps in fright and lunges backward in fear. It's a cursed one and a haunted. Unfortunately, both monsters I know very well. Unlike my mother, I'm not scared. I'm pissed. Hello, boys, I say to Ivan and Vasile darkly. Ready for another round? Chapter 7 Ivan Grigore smiles his fangs poking out between his lips. His nose crinkles as he curls his long fingernails upward to scratch at his temple. His eyes narrow like he's about to laugh. A long, curved sword dangles on his hip, the only weapon on him from what I can see. Unlike his partner, Vasile doesn't find anything funny about the situation. The mutated werewolf's eyes are dark, lurking with ghosts. Drool drips from his mouth and splatters on the ground. He's starving. How'd you get through our barriers? I ask, and I bend my knees slowly. I know better than to think we're getting out of this without a fight. You want to ask your friends that question? Vasile rasps. His voice rakes up and down my spine, chilling. 
They won't respond, I'm sure. They're pretty dead. Of course. Ivan and Vasile aren't stupid enough to get themselves caught like the others. They probably slaughtered the rest of the wolves on patrol before they had a chance to run and tell Lysar we've been infiltrated. I hope you two are ready to join them, I say. I unsheathe my dagger with my left hand and grab my pistol with the other. I hold the gun aloft. Ivan guffaws at me. Vasile merely stares on coldly. Lysandra, what are you doing? We have to run, Katya hisses, tugging on my arm. No, I'm tired of running. Ivan is probably the most dangerous cursed one alive, and Vasile equally famous in the realm of the haunted. But I don't care. I'm ready for this. I want to rip them apart, prove to my mother that I can do this. I fire off six shots with my pistol, all of which miss. Ivan dodges the silver bullets like it's child's play and runs full speed toward me, while Vasile heads for my mother. Ivan slashes at me with his claws, but I parry them away with my blade. His nails clink every time they connect with my small knife. Vasile is too big and too fast to outrun. My mother, for all the running she has done in her life, has no choice but to fight for survival. Katya's fangs descend. She wrestles with Vasile on the ground like an animal, dealing harsh bites to his shoulders and neck. Katya, however, doesn't fight like the fierce warrior she was trained to be, more like a trapped animal trying to survive. I kick Ivan in the gut and roll away. I duck behind a rock and refill my pistol, shooting instead this time for Vasile. I fire two bullets that hit him in the back, but they're only scrapes. Vasile flips Katya over onto him so I don't have a clear shot. Snarling, I redirect at Ivan instead. The remaining four bullets aim true and enter Ivan's torso. But it's not enough. He continues forward with a malicious grin as if nothing happened. I freeze. Four silver bullets should at least be enough to slow him down. Out of ammo, I use the gun as a bludgeon instead. I slam the barrel of the pistol against Ivan's head again and again, but despite causing a few cosmetic bumps, it doesn't do any good. Ivan grabs my wrist and twists. I fall screaming to my knees as the pistol tumbles out of my hand. I reach out to cut his tendons with my dagger, but he lets go of my wrist and kicks me harshly in the side. I go flying and slam against the same boulder I hid behind minutes ago. Weakly, I look up. Vasile has my mother in his mouth. He bites down harshly, then tosses her away like a rag doll. She flops down next to me like a fish. She seems confused and lost. Mother, do something, I whisper, holding my side. I'm defenseless. I hold out my dagger for her to take, but she shakes her head and crawls away. My stomach drops in disbelief. She used to be an amazing fighter. Now she's no help at all. As Ivan and Vasile advance, I press my body against the boulder. Lysar and the others heard my shots. They must have. They know what type of gun I carry. They'll be here soon. They must. A vampire steps in front of us. He's so tall he blocks out the moon. A leap of hope jumps in my chest when I recognize him. Sergei. He's back. Oh, here we go. Ivan chuckles. He pulls out his sword. Do you really want to do this, you old vampire? Sergei doesn't answer. Not right away. Tears flow freely down his face at the triumph of being reunited with his daughter. He glances down at Katya with a loving, genuine smile. He doesn't care that she's been gone all this time. He needs no reasons. Unlike me, he doesn't need to understand what happened to her, why she was gone or where she went. All he cares about is that she is here now. And what's more, she's alive. Sige withdraws his sword from his sheath and says, My life has been fulfilled. 
let's get this over with. Ivan charges towards Sergei, and Vasile runs at him on all fours. I scream, but Sergei swings around and lashes out his sword at the two of them at once. Vasile ducks underneath the blow, while Ivan bends out of the way. Ivan's blade crashes against Sergei's, the sound like thunder, before the two of them duel expertly. Vasile tries to slip in where he can, but despite his best efforts, Sergei manages to counter his teeth and claws before whirling his blade back around to stop Ivan from running him through. Ivan and Vasile aren't any average cursed one or haunted. Sergei can't just rip off their heads or run them through. They're too fast, practically blurs as they dance around him. Yet Sergei is keeping up. I don't know how he manages to keep an eye on both of them as he fights, but he can, and he battles with the strength of ten vampires as he does so. Ivan and Vasile both move at the same time. Sergei goes to stop Ivan and the cursed one pulls back just as Vasile is going forward. The haunted's claws pierce Sergei's gut. My grandfather hisses, and Vasile laughs as he pulls his claws out of Sergei's side. Sergei doesn't bother to check the wound. He lunges forward and misses. Ivan gets out of the way and trips him. Sergei rolls into a standing position, but Vasile is right there to meet him. The haunted knocks him down again. Sergei ducks underneath the haunted's legs and pitches his sword forward on his knees. His sword draws blood. Vasile roars in pain. Sergei springs to his feet again, though he's moving slower. Sergei is tiring. He can't keep this up for much longer. I push off the ground to help him, but Kotya grabs my arm and yanks me to her side. Lysandra, stay down, Sergei shouts. Ivan counters again. This time, the tip of his blade pierces Sergei's side. Sergei cringes. He draws back his fighting arm, but Vasile latches onto Sergei's leg with his mouth and bites down. Sergei doesn't cry out, but his eyes echo with pain. He smacks Vasile on the head with the hilt of his sword to get the haunted to let go. It achieves his goal, but while Sergei is looking the other way, Ivan pushes his sword into Sergei's middle. The whoosh of air that comes from my lungs echoes Sergei's gasp of surprise. Despite being stabbed, Sergei still valiantly continues. He forcefully yanks his body away from the blade. The blood sprays everywhere. Sergei swings his sword valiantly a champion among demons of hell. Yet none of his blows deliver, and Sergei stumbles. While my grandfather is attempting to gather his bearings, Ivan drives three more wounds into his gut. Hungrily, Vasile circles the fight. He's no longer helping Ivan, just waiting. I roughly push my mother off of me and get to my feet. Screaming wildly, I've lost my mind. I charge into the battle and use my hands. I draw back a fist and punch Ivan as hard as I can. Such a blow would send most flying, but it merely knocks him down and gives him a busted lip. I turn to Sergei and grab his shoulders, steadying him. His eyes are dull. The four stab wounds and the punctures left by Vasile's claws weep blood. I say something to him, but I don't think either one of us understand. It's like everything's white static in my ears. From far off, though it isn't far at all, I hear the sound of shouts. I look over Sergei's shoulder. My sandy Alpha and my mother's companion are here, Lysar in his wolf form, Mormont with a large sword. We're okay. We're going to be. Okay. Lysar launches onto Vasile and starts battling with him. Mormont immediately attends to my mother and helps her off the ground. Lysar is able to throw Vasile a good distance away. He runs back to us, though the haunted is quickly returning. Ivan approaches us again, licking the blood that's dripping from his cut lip. 
His sword points in our direction as he advances closer. Lysar can't fight both Ivan and Vasile by himself, even as Alpha, and I can't aid him while supporting Siege. But we have the numbers. We have Mormont now. Help us! I screech. Help! The cry dies in my throat. Out of the corner of my eye, I see two figures running, leaving, going to hide. Mormont and Katya have left us behind. The look in Sergei's eyes as he watches Katya abandon him for the second time is not one of regret, remorse, or abandonment, simply of peace. He knows his daughter will be okay. The old vampire steadies himself. He grips his sword tighter and yanks himself away from me. Sergei plants himself between Ivan and I while Vasile lingers in the background. No, I plead. My sobs are so choked that I don't know if he can understand me. Don't do this. Sergei, Lysar starts. He goes to lay a hand on my grandfather's shoulder. Quicker than he ever did anything in his life, Sergei whips around and grabs the front of Lysar's shirt. The fabric bunches up in the old Russian's fist as he growls, Get her out. Sergei shoves Lysar away. He stumbles, trips over his own feet, and falls on the ground. Lysar stares upward in fear and admiration for a few seconds before he gets up. Without question, the Alpha obeys Sergei's command. Lysar bends down and throws me over his shoulder, and I can't stop him. Let me go! I scream. I stop pounding on Lysar's back. Let me go right now! I love you, Lysandra, Sergei says as he faces Ivan and Vasile again. I will buy you as much time as I can. Quietly, he adds, my duty to the monarchy is done. Grandfather, I wail. My words turn into unintelligible screams of horror as Lysar carries me away from the scene as fast as he's able. From his back, I have a clear view. Sige puts up as much of a fight as he can, but there's nothing left in him. Ivan runs him through again and again like a needle poking into a pincushion. Sige keeps swinging his sword, but they become actions a child would make. Eventually, Sige is forced to his knees. Vasile latches onto his middle with his jaws. Ivan draws his sword backwards. I don't have the ability to close my eyes. I watch Ivan sever Sige's head from his neck. It falls on the ground and rolls beside Ivan's feet, tottering back and forth for a moment before it stills. Vasile lets Sergei's body go. The haunted rears back as my grandfather's torso falls to the ground, jaws open wide for a feast. Chapter 8 Lissy You've got to be quiet, Lissy. I don't realize that the horrified screaming is coming from my mouth. Lysar's face comes slowly into view, along with the darkness of the forest. There's spittle on his face and a rotten smell in the corner. He's been throwing up. Trees are everywhere. It's still dark, but the vineyard is lit with loud cries of terror. Something is burning. I can smell it in the air. I whimper out words. Tears are streaming down my face as I plead desperately. Lissy, you're speaking in Russian. I can't understand you. I don't know what words I'm saying or what language I'm using to try and communicate. They're just coming out of my mouth, begging Lysar to do something. Lissy, shut up, Lysar says. He starts shaking me so hard that my head feels like it's about to snap off my neck. Lysar has never told me to shut up before. The shock is enough to stop the screams coming from my throat. Around Lysar's shoulder, I notice two figures standing there watching. Mormont. 
and Katya. You! I shove Lysar off of me and start forward, hands outstretched toward the vampire I used to call Mother, switching back to Romanian. I want everyone to be able to understand and hear the words I'm about to say to her. You ran away and left your own father to die, you spineless, weak coward! Katya cringes and leans away from me. My saw grabs me at the last second before I wrap my hands around her throat. I try to fight off the Alpha, but it's a pitiful attempt. I have no more strength left to fight. How could you? I'm crying again. Tears roll quickly down my cold face. How could you? They would have killed all of us, Katya stutters. We would have met the same fate. I hate you. I try to rip away from Lysar again. I wish you had died and Sergei was still here. Lissy. Lysar claps a hand over my mouth. I told you, we have to be quiet. Katya flinches. Mormont, like usual, says nothing. It's like he's a robot when it comes to my mother. I'm shaking all over. It's like I'm having a seizure. Where's Will? Lysar looks around frantically, though he still keeps a tight hold on me. Where's my little boy? He's right here. Bryn's moans of pain can be heard from here. Sporting several injuries, she carries Willem in one arm and holds a pistol in her spare hand. She walks with a limp, one eye bruised. Willem should be crying, but he's not. He simply stares at me, unsure of what to do. Oh, thank Fane. Lysar sighs in relief. He drags me to his sister and strokes back the hair on Willem's head. Bryn stares onward like a zombie. Bryn, where did everyone go? Lysar asks. I don't know. It's chaos. There were explosions and so much gunfire. Everyone scattered. We all went in different directions. Bryn starts crying. Willem starts crying too. Lysar tries to shush him, but it doesn't work. They're going to find us. We should have moved when we had the chance. Lysar worries, taking Willem from Bryn. They came in with so many, didn't even think. The former attack must have been to get us to let our guard down. Bryn babbles on and on, her words making no sense. We need to get out of here. The chopper, Lysar thinks wildly. Bryn shakes her head. The chopper is gone. We've got to get to the cars. Shadows emerge from the night. Katya screams as cursed ones and haunted alike all swarm into the area surrounding us. Bryn changes into a wolf and begins to fight like a cornered animal. Katya and Mormont battle, unable to run this time. Lysar can't do anything while holding on to Willem. It's either protect his son or guard the rest of us. Me? I just stand in the middle of it all, unable to comprehend what's going on. I can't fight. I can't even think. Somehow, in the ruckus, Lysar and I get separated. I think someone is dragging me away, but I can't really tell. Lissy! Lysar bellows, reaching for me. I reach back for his arms, longing for them, and I feel a sharp pain slam into the back of my head. My legs give out from under me. Without thought, I collapse into darkness. My head's lolling on my shoulder. It hurts my neck. I force myself to awaken, the view around me slowly coming into focus. Two vampires have me by the underarms. They're dragging me the tips of my toes scuffing along the floor as they march forward. I'm surrounded by guards, at least ten. I recognize this place. The red carpet, the stone walls dimly lit by torches, the suits of armor, the illustrious paintings. I'm back at Castel de Singe. No, I mumble. I try to pull my arms away, but find them incredibly weak. They must have drugged me after they knocked me out, then put me on a plane to Romania. It's only a two-hour flight from here to Italy.
but I have the feeling I've been out for much longer than that. How many hours have passed? Where are Lysar and the others? Are they safe? Or have they been caught too? Where's my baby? Where's Willem? The guards take two left turns. At first, I think they're escorting me to my old room, but my stomach hollows with dread when I realize that's not where we're headed. The vampires drag me through the throne room and past several doors to a place I've tried to erase from memory. The judgment room. I've been in this room often, and never has it been pleasant. Tsar Dragomir is already sitting upon the elevated benches when I enter, surrounded by his council members. I notice that the numbers of his council have significantly decreased. I wonder if they ran off, or if Dragomir executed them out of paranoia. The gods let me go, and I fall to my knees. My hands slap hard upon the stone floor. The burning fireplace roars as if laughing at me but no one in the room dares to join in on the joke. Dragomir smiles at me. Welcome, daughter, he says haughtily. I hope you appreciate the trouble I took to get you here. You've proven hard to catch in the past year since you fled Romania, though in the end, I won. You haven't won, I say viciously. Not yet. I beg to differ. Dragomir says flatly. You are a traitor. This war began with you, and it will end with you. The champions of your silly cause will give up without you to lead them. There will be others that will carry on without me, I say. I might have started the revolution, but it's not mine anymore. It's everyone's. The fighting won't stop just because I'm dead. Dragomir raises an eyebrow. We'll see. Personally, I feel you put too much faith in your friends. He clasps his hands. The journey to power is a lonely one. We must rule alone and die alone. You were a fool to think you could share the responsibility of your cause with those around you. It is what ultimately led you to me. You're wrong. Power doesn't belong to one person. It belongs to everyone. I shoot back. Once I'm dead, you'll see that. My friends will come seeking vengeance. I only wish I could be here to watch it happen. I laugh lowly. Lysar's going to tear you apart. I do not fear your alpha, Dragomir says. He's nothing but a child, as are you. You never were any real threat to me, Lysandra. All your little rebellion did was make me stronger. I have you to thank for that. Thank me for what? I snap. I bunch my hands into fists, though the world sways around me. I'm still too weak to fight. You have fulfilled the prophecy. Dragomir unclasps his hands and spreads his arms wide. Ever since you left to chase after that wolf, you've single-handedly brought down his entire species. You led me to the pack. I destroyed it and hunted down those who survived afterwards. The shifters have practically been eliminated from the world. The only wolves that are left alive are on your side, and they will be easy to dispose of once I have my army. An army? You already have an army! I snort sarcastically. Dragomir shakes his head slowly. No, you don't understand. His black eyes flash. Soon I will have an army that will conquer the very world. No one will be able to stand up against it. Vampires will finally rule over all, witches and humans both and I will reign as supreme czar. With the shifters nearing extinction, no one will be able to stop me. Lysar and the others won't let you do this, I shout. They'll die before they allow that to happen. That's exactly what I'm counting on, daughter. Dragomir turns. He's already gotten bored of me. Though don't despair, I won't kill everyone you love. 
Your son is mine. An irrepressible rage explodes in my chest. I lunge forward, crying out, Willem is an infant! Leave my son alone! I do need someone to take my place, Dragomir says as he ventures down the steps of the benches, ignoring my threats. I won't live forever, and I must see to it the monarchy continues. The wolf blood in him is regrettable, but it will only make him stronger. Don't worry, Lysandra, he will be well cared for. I will raise him in my image. He is my grandson, after all. With my guidance, he will be a more ruthless leader than even I could have been. You will never have my son, I snarl. There is no force in heaven or hell that will stop me from killing you if you seek to make him yours. I already have him, Dragomir says. Don't be a fool like your grandfather, Lysandra. Sigay knew his place, and yet he attempted to go beyond it. At least give yourself the honor of having a quiet death. Don't you dare say his name, I say, my voice a sharp hiss. You will never be anything close to the vampire he was. His sacrifice was in vain. You landed in my grasp despite his best efforts to prevent it. Dragomir steps off the council bench and comes to the ground floor. Tell me, what will you do now that your greatest protector is dead? My mouth opens to respond, but I can give him no answer. My head drops as I shove down a sob. Dragomir flicks his fingers at me. Take her away. I wish to see no more of her. Make sure she is disposed of in the way that I requested. The guards bend down to pick me up as Dragomir leaves. I reach for the dagger on my leg, but of course it's not there. I resort to kicks and punches, but my legs are worse than jelly, making all my hits ineffective. Down the hall I can hear Dragomir's laughter. I scream. The angry roar vibrates from my core and bounces off the walls of Castel de Singe. The guards don't listen. They only tighten their grip on my arms as they haul me in a different direction to a part of the castle I've rarely ventured to. There is a newly installed door I've never seen before. When we arrive, the guards begin ripping off my clothes with no regard to modesty. I'm helpless against it. They yank a thin silk slip over my head before roughly turning me back around to face the door. The knob is made of silver. The vampire ahead of us puts on a glove before he touches the knob. When the door opens, fierce mothers each part of my body, making it feel like I'm suffocating. My vision, Baba Yaga, death by sunlight. The room is a half circle entirely encompassed by windows, separated by silver bars. It's dawn. The sunlight beams through, creating a place where there is no spot vacant of light. There's nothing inside the room save for long scratches along the windows and deep scuff marks on the floor. Marks of vampires clawing to get out. The guards toss me inside and slam the door shut. The moment I am inside, I begin to burn. The sunlight feels equivalent to being tossed into a raging bonfire. I scream horrifically, agonizing cries emitting from my throat. It's like hot irons are being pushed onto my skin, and I have no way of getting them off. I run in a circle around the room, looking for some sort of shade, but there is nowhere to hide. I attempt to wrench the door open. The sting of silver on my hands is nothing compared to the heat of the sun but it doesn't work. The lock won't budge. I pull my hands away. They've become bloody, muscle protruding from the broken skin. I stumble away from the door and try to cover my head with my arms, but it's no use. The windows. Maybe I can break them. I pound on the glass in an attempt to break free, but I cannot. It's bulletproof, at least twelve inches thick. 
My fingernails create claw marks on the glass similar to those my predecessors made. They begin to peel off. I stumble backward and trip over my own feet. I fall face first on the ground. My underbelly is protected, but my back is unmercifully roasted. Steam rises from my body as I continue to scream. I can smell my skin burning as it begins to singe away from my flesh. I watch as my porcelain skin turns to black ash on my arms. Bone is exposed. The skin on my face melts off, slicking onto the ground and sticking like goo. I curl up into a ball to try and protect myself, but it's no use. I watch as the muscle wells into sores, the parts of skin that are still left bubbling as if put upon a stove to boil. As I curl inward, my hair starts falling out in clumps. It lies on the ground listlessly, like I do now. I can't even scream anymore. I don't have the ability. This was the choice I made. I chose to marry Lysar, and this is my reward. Even now, I wouldn't have chosen another way. The pain doesn't stop, but my care that I'm dying goes away. The room becomes wavy, like I'm seeing through a mirage. From the collective shapes in the room emerges a figure. Sege. I know it's not real. I know he's a hallucination. But I'm still glad he's here. Grandfather, I whisper weakly. Ash falls from my face when I say the word. Sege stoops down to his knee. He bends downward so that his face is level with mine. His eyes show gentleness and compassion. When he speaks, it's not Romanian that comes out of his mouth. It's Russian. Our mother language was one we shared a love of. Although it's silly to consider, we thought of it as our own personal way of speaking. It makes me feel safe to hear it now. Stay strong, granddaughter. You are Russia's heir, all that she has. Sege says calmly, Do not forget this moment, Lysandra. Do not give up this fight. I cannot. I cannot continue to hold on when I am in so much agony. Sege fades away, and I close my eyes. It's time to let go. There's no sense holding on. Willem and Lysar will be okay without me. I'm ready to die now. I will be free of pain, and I will be with my grandfather again. Chapter 9 My ears are ringing. I can't hear anything but white noise and static. The ground shudders underneath my feet, and debris peppers my closed eyes. There's been an explosion. Shade. Glorious shade hangs over me from above. The burning stops, though the painful sensation the sun left behind does not. My body is little more than a burned husk, most likely barely recognizable. Slowly, I crack open my eyes. Two pairs of feet appear in front of me, a male and a female's. Both appear to be in combat gear. The male is completely covered with a black cloak to protect him from the sun. The female is wearing a red cloak. Miraculously, I can still smell. A vampire and a witch. The ringing in my ears begins to fade. I can make out muffled voices. Lysandra, the vampire says. His voice is choked and strained, as if he's fighting back the urge to be sick and to cry all at once. I recognize his voice. Tomlin, I whisper. I try to move but can't. It's too late. I'm near death. I don't know why I haven't died already. I can hear the witch hiss. I don't know if I can fix this, Tomlin. Her voice is worried. She's badly burned. We have to try. Come on, Shioni, help me get her up. A thin cloth stretcher is dropped by my side. I whimper 
as I feel someone touch my raw muscle. Four hands, two underneath my legs, two underneath my shoulders. They gingerly lift me up and put me on the stretcher. Tears start rolling from my eyes at the agony it brings for them to carry me to wherever we're going. We pass through the destroyed walls of the sunroom. Somebody blew it up, presumably Tom. I can hear the whirring wings of a helicopter nearby. The buffeting wind rips off pieces of dead skin that go flying through the air like black snow. Carefully, Tom and the witch slide me into the helicopter. Both clamber inside and shut the door behind them, and the bird rises into the air. I don't recognize the vampire flying the copter, but I am glad he is taking me away from Castel de Singe. Shioni, what are we going to do? Tomlin says. His expression is pained as he looks at my face. The witch starts mixing potions, slipping on a pair of white medical gloves. She needs blood to start the healing process, she says. We've got to get some in her. The witch shoves a bottle of blood into Tomlin's hands. With trembling fingers, he opens the top and attempts to put some in my mouth. It dribbles down the sides of my lips and over my chin. Lysandra, you've got to drink, Tomlin begs. He manages to tip a spoonful inside. The blood sloshes over my tongue. I cough and sputter as it goes down my throat. She needs a feeding tube, no exceptions. She only says, giving Tomlin a sharp glance when his face becomes stricken. She won't feel it. I'll put her to sleep. The witch waves her hands over me. Instantly, sleepiness comes over my body. It feels too similar to the calmness of death. But I do not fight. If it's my time, it's my time. Tomlin's face hovers over me. It's okay, Lysandra he says strongly. You're safe now. The whirring of medical machines. The steady beep of a life monitor. Hospital sounds bring me back to life. I open my eyes slowly to see that I'm in a clean room, yellow in color. I'm lying in a hospital bed, connected to a dozen different machines. I sit up slowly, and find that all the pain is gone. They must have gotten blood in me and started the vampiric regeneration process before it was too late. Katya is across from me, sitting in a chair. Her eyes are closed, but she's not sleeping. When she hears me shift on the bed, her eyes open, and her expression becomes relieved. Mother? I ask, slowly rising up. Where am I? What's going on? You're in a safe house outside of St. Petersburg. Elisaveta had it established in case anything went wrong, Katya says calmly. She and the others are all here. I'm not sure what she means by others. I sit up further. The blanket on top of me falls off, revealing my medical gown. Lysandra, don't, my mother says, moving to adjust the blanket but it's too late. I've already seen what she didn't want me to see. My arms. The charred skin is gone, replaced by stretched, ugly red scars that run like cords over my skin. I rip off the rest of the blanket and look at my legs. They are replicas of my arms, grotesque and mangled. I'm healed, but the cost to save my life has made me hideous. What do I look like? My lip trembles. I need to see my face. Lysandra, let me see. Katya pauses. Reluctantly, she reaches into her handbag and hands me a compact mirror. My hands fumble as I try to open it. When my face is revealed, I gasp in horror. One side of my face, the side that was lying against the ground, is perfectly flawless. It remains intact as it was before. The sun didn't harm it. The same can't be said for the other side. Harsh red burns lace up the right side of my face, flames against porcelain skin. 
My face looks like it's been patchworked together, some parts flat, others mottled and bumpy in variations of red. My eyelid droops and my nose sags. The scarring on my face is worse than any other part of my body, a blooming horror against what once was perfect. I've become a monster. I throw the mirror to the other side of the room. Why? I ask loudly. The shout echoes through the room. Why? She only says she might be able to reverse the damage. But it was more important to save your life, Katya says, snatching my wrists. She squeezes them tightly to keep me still. The door opens and in walks Tomlin, along with Shioni. My eyes meet Shioni's the moment she turns to look at me. Why did you do this to me? I whisper. You should have just let me die. Shioni is tight-lipped. I'm sorry, Lysandra. I couldn't let that happen. A new smell comes upon the air, one that seems familiar and yet frightens me. Without warning, an alpha enters the room, and he looks at me. His blue eyes are so... I can't even describe how much despair echoes in them when he gazes at my mutilated face. There are no words for an emotion like that. He crosses the room in two long strides. I shirk away from his presence, though he doesn't run from mine. I feel ashamed to be in front of him like this. I feel ashamed to be in front of everyone. He stoops by my bedside and takes a chair next to my mother. He takes my hand. I'm so paralyzed with fear that I don't pull away. Lissy, I was so scared. The shifter's body shakes. After you were taken by Dragomir, I went insane. I did everything I could to get you back. But you're okay now, and Will is safe too. I want you to know that this... He makes a circle around his own face with his free hand because it seems he can't bear to mention it. It doesn't matter to me. You're still beautiful, and you always will be. All I care about is that you're still alive. That's all that matters. I blink. Then, in as calm a voice as I can manage, I ask, Who are you? Chapter 10 The wolf's mouth falls open. The room falls silent. Nobody moves. The alpha swallows. Lissy, it's me. Lysar. I'm sorry, I don't know who that is. I don't know what this wolf expects of me. Why is he even here in the first place? His face is stunned, panicky. I'm your husband. Excuse me, what? It comes out harsher than I intended. The wolf flinches and I quickly go to regather myself. I'm sorry, but I don't have a husband. And if I did, it certainly wouldn't be a wolf. I'm engaged to Tomlin. I gesture to him with a nod. The wolf, Lysar, I think his name was, goes pale. Tomlin comes forward. Lysandra, we haven't been engaged for a long time. You called off our marriage, he says calmly. The door opens again. In walks a brown-haired she-wolf. She takes one glance at me, then averts her eyes quickly, grabbing Tomlin's hand. The gesture blows my mind. Who are you? I ask, even more confused than I was before. What the hell is going on? Why are all these wolves coming out of nowhere? Brim, she can't remember anything, Lysar says helplessly, glancing at the she-wolf. It sounds like he's going to cry. Did I really hurt him that badly? I, I didn't mean to. Anything? The she-wolf repeats. Whatever all this means terrifies her. Lysandra, what is the last thing you remember? She only asks. I bite my lip, puzzled. I, I remember finding my mother again, and the burning. I wince. Dragomir threw me in a sunroom. 
it hurt so badly. And, Sirge, I close my eyes. Two tears leak from underneath them when I say his name. I remember how he died. Shioni is quiet. He left everything he had, including his fortune, to you. Her voice is strained. We buried him after you were abducted. There was no time. We had to move locations, and we couldn't take his body with us. I'm so sorry, Lysandra, that you couldn't attend the funeral. I say nothing, and she swallows. In his will, he stated that he wanted you to have his sword. The tears continue to fall, but I clear my throat. I, I will carry it with me always. The wolf shifts. His hand lifts to wipe my tears away, but I jerk back. It's more of a reaction than a personal offense, but he doesn't take it that way. The gesture gravely wounds him. Can you go back any farther? Shioni asks. No. I shake my head. All I can remember is returning to Castel de Singe after I left Moscow, then jumping forward to the past few days. The rest is just a blur. That was nearly two years ago. Lysar's voice is choked. It sounds like someone is squeezing the life out of him. The wolf looks at Shioni helplessly for an explanation. An expression of pained understanding crosses Shioni's face. Sometimes after undergoing trauma, the brain blocks out certain memories to prevent further damage. It appears that what Lysandra went through in the sunroom made her forget most of the events of the past few years in an attempt to protect her. Will her memory come back? Lysar asks. He is hopeful, anticipatory, on the edge of his seat. Shioni frowns. I don't know. Sometimes memories return with time, but they might never come back completely. Lysar makes a strangled noise. He gets up from his seat and flings the chair behind him. It shatters on the wall. The she-wolf starts forward and puts a firm hand on his arm, but it's not enough to control him. How could you forget me? Forget us! He starts. His voice wobbles. I can tell it's taking everything he has not to break down. Why can't you remember everything we've gone through together? I'm your husband. Think about our little boy. Think about our son. Don't you remember our son? I don't have a son. Even if I did, I would only scare him like this, I say, gesturing harshly to the right side of my face. Now it's me who's getting emotional. Why is this wolf doing this to me? You have to remember, Lysar says. You have to remember me. Lysar, calm down, the she-wolf hisses to him. It's not her fault. I can't take this, Bryn. It's too much, Lysar cries. I apologize that I've made you feel this way, but please stop shouting at me, I say, recoiling against the bed frame. I didn't mean to harm this wolf in whatever way I did. I wish he'd stop. Tommy, go get Kipcha, Bryn whispers to Tomlin. He darts out of the room. Bryn still struggles to restrain the alpha. A few seconds later, Tomlin returns, this time with another wolf. The smell in the room nearly suffocates me as a big brute of a shifter stalks into the room. He nearly takes up a quarter of the space by himself. Bryn backs away as the shifter approaches Lysar and puts a hand on both arms. He starts dragging the alpha to the other side of the room. Let me go, Kip, Lysar growls, but the shifter doesn't listen. He holds Lysar steady and stares at me. How can I remember anything when I don't even know what's going on? I ask. My voice is high-pitched. I don't understand why there are wolves and vampires together in the same room. We hate each other. We kill each other. Everyone get out, Bryn demands. She stands in front of my bedside rather protectively and turns on everyone, though I don't know why. Even you, brother. She gives an intense look to Lysar. 
Liz needs to be filled in on what's going on, and all this drama isn't going to help her recover. She just went through something horrible, and all of you are only making it worse. I don't want to be left alone with a wolf, I say quickly. I grip my sheets tightly. My mother notices. I promise I'm not going to hurt you, Bryn says softly. Her eyes catch mine, and they seem genuine. I glance at Tomlin for guidance. In a clear voice, Tom says, She won't do anything, Lysandra. She's my mate. She doesn't mean you any harm. His mate? Tomlin is with a wolf. This just keeps on getting stranger and stranger. I'm still nervous about being alone with the shifter, but I suppose if Tomlin thinks it's safe to date her, a small conversation between the two of us won't threaten my existence. The room clears out rather quickly after that, until I saw Bryn, Kipcha, and I are the only ones inside. It seems strange, even to me, a vampire, that a she-wolf is giving orders when the Alpha is nearby. But it's obvious in this moment that the Alpha isn't in control. She is. Not that he's willing to hand over authority. Lysar snarls and says, I'm not leaving Lissy. Not again. Not for anything. She needs to get up to speed. And Lysar, you're not capable of handling the situation right now. Bryn says harshly. Let me take care of it. Lysar glares at his sister. Whatever, I'm going to see my son. He shakes off Kipcha's hold and turns away. Without looking at me, he leaves the room. Kipcha hustles out behind him. I'm left feeling rather stung. I don't know why. Right. Bryn sinks into a chair beside me. I suppose we've got to start at the beginning. What's going on? I ask her. Wolves and vampires working together. For what reason? It's a long story. I'll try to keep it short. She takes a breath. Almost two years ago, you and my brother Lysar met. You hid him away from Dragomir until Ivan Grigore kidnapped you. Lysar saved you, but... You guys ended up getting separated when you both fled from Castel de Senge. You found each other again after you discovered the Den of Wolves. All of it happened because you were in love. In love? The words seem ridiculous. How can a vampire and a werewolf be in love? I know, it sounds strange, doesn't it? I thought it was impossible too, until it happened to me. Bryn looks up. Tommy, sorry, Tomlin, hate that name, followed you. We ended up meeting outside the den. We fell in love, too. Everything seemed fine until Dragomir showed up again. He destroyed the den and our entire pack. Bryn's eyes glimmer with tears. It was a terrible night. I'm so sorry, I say. It must have been awful. It was. You were there, but you can't remember it. Bryn stares at the edge of the bed. Lysar became Alpha after he defeated my father in a duel. After that, we headed to Salkovia. The vampires there took us in. They proclaimed you Tsarina and asked you to lead the fight against Dragomir. Tsarina? I gasp. That's simply not possible. It is, Bryn insists. I swear I'm not making any of this up. Valentina ended up staying on Dragomir's side, but our witch Shioni ended up defeating her. You and Lysar got married, then you got pregnant with Will. You had him just a couple of weeks ago before you were kidnapped. Now we're here in Russia. What are we trying to do? I ask, baffled. We're trying to defeat Dragomir so wolves and vampires can live together in peace. Bryn snaps. That's the whole point. I can tell you believe in all of this, but I don't, I say firmly. It's just too ludicrous. After what he did to me, I agree that Dragomir needs to be taken down, but why am I the one to do it? Would it help if I got someone you knew? Bryn asks. Someone you could trust to verify what I just said? Who could I trust? I counter. She stands up. She heads to the door, 
and closes it silently behind her, leaving me to ponder my thoughts. Me, Tsarina? A son? A husband who is a wolf? Is this a cruel prank? Why would anyone think this is funny? My mouth drops open when Elisaveta enters. She's followed by Kipcha. He's carrying a big bundle in his arms. I wonder what it is. I'm glad to see you alive, Tsarina, Elisaveta says. My stomach wiggles with panic when she curtsies to me, though I wish it was under better circumstances. Don't call me Tsarina, I say quickly. Elisaveta. The she-wolf told me that uh, I'm married to the Alpha, and we're trying to defeat Dragomir in a war we cannot win. Elisaveta nods. Everything she says is true. It is not a lie. You are leading a rebellion against Dragomir, and it is all because you fell in love with a wolf. The bundle in Kipcha's arms moves. A giant invisible hand wraps itself around my body and keeps me still. Elisaveta picks up the bundle and places it into my limp arms, saying, This is your son. I look down. My breath is stolen away when I gaze down upon the large baby. When my eyes connect with him, the baby smiles and gurgles. He is pretty cute. I can't deny the similarities are there. He looks a lot like me. And the Alpha. His scent is both vampire and wolf, a combination I've never smelled before. It's unavoidable to me. We definitely made him, and we made him together. The only question is why? Did I love Lysar? Do I still? I don't know. I can't remember. Will? I ask, looking up. Willem, Elisabetta replies. He was inconsolable when you were away. Hopefully he'll start sleeping through the night again. The baby waves his little fists in the air. I put my finger out. He wraps his tiny little fingers around it and squeezes. Warmth blossoms inside my chest. Very well. I believe you, I say. Kipcha's face sags in relief. Elisaveta's remains impartial, like she thought I'd say that all along. But now what do we do? I can't remember anything. I'm not even sure I can trust some of you. How can we make a war plan against Dragomir if I don't recall how I got here in the first place? I don't know, Zarina, Elisaveta says. We'll just have to make do. Resilient, Elisaveta. At least one thing never changes around here. I could end up on an alien planet in another dimension, and if she was there, she'd still be as stoic and strong as a rock. That's something I can rely on. Do you... do you think you can talk to Lysar? Kipcha asks. I look up at him, and he says... I don't want to push you or anything, but he's really not okay right now. Maybe if you let him know you believe us, he'll calm down. Um, okay. I hold the baby awkwardly in my arms. I don't know where to put him. Kipcha notices. He bends down and takes the baby from me, while Elisaveta unhooks me from all the medical machines. Gingerly, I get out of bed and to my feet. Kipcha offers me his free hand that I don't take it. It still feels wrong to touch a wolf. He's in your bedroom, Elisaveta informs me. I'll take you to him. It doesn't hurt to walk, but I move slowly all the same, like ashes are going to fall off my body like they did in the sunroom. We proceed out of the medical room and into the interior of an illustrious house built and furnished Baroque style. I remember Elisaveta only picks the best for her hideouts. Kipcha hands Willem to Elisaveta and offers to carry me up the stairs, but I refuse. It's slow going upwards, but when we reach the top and stand before the door, 
It's not the climb that leaves me breathless. What am I going to say to the Alpha once I enter? Go on, Elisabetta says gently. We will be here if you need us. Elisabetta and Kipcha turn back toward the stairs. Willem's eyes stare widely at me over Elisabetta's shoulder. I don't like leaving the baby. I feel like an irresponsible parent doing so, but I don't know what to do with him, so perhaps it's best to let the others take care of him for now. I hold my breath and push open the door. I'm relieved to find that the Alpha isn't inside, but the air comes whooshing out of my body when I see the room. It's filled with dozens of blank canvases sitting upon easels, a whole room waiting for me to paint them. On a desk by the window are multiple brushes, laying next to all kinds of paint in every color imaginable. I wonder how it got here. I don't think I've painted in a long time. I'm longing to. I should go look for the wolf, but it would be awkward for me to traipse throughout a house of people I don't know, looking for an alpha that's a stranger. I pick up one of the brushes and start mixing the paint. I turn to the first canvas and begin painting, willing myself to get lost in the feelings and entangled emotions. I start happy. I want to paint landscapes, birds, things of joy. But the paintings quickly turn into the stuff of nightmares. A painting of a castle turns into a wooden fortress, one that is on fire and prowled by a mutated werewolf, a monster. I abandon that painting and start on a different one, but that canvas changes from a snowy day into a bloody battlefield, the sight of two bodies falling from a broken bridge. I start on another and another. They all come out the same. Lydia, dead and covered in blood. Dragomir in the judgment room, surrounded by his council. Ivan Grigore smiling in Castel de Singe's library. A young man with a black eye and bruised body, crawling along the floor. A black wolf holding a dead white one in his snarling jaws, her eyes empty, his red and evil. Not all of them are bad, some are good. There are a few that make me smile though my stomach quenches nauseatingly as they form by my own hand. A sandy wolf wrapped within a bedsheet, a wolf bathing a vampire in a wooden tub in his room, and another of a naked man, his body hidden within the leaves. There's one of Tomlin and the she-wolf called Bryn kissing on a table. I even paint a beautiful picture of a blonde girl in a 1920s wedding dress, staring into a mirror with her grandfather proudly behind. Soon the room is filled with images both horrifying and beautiful. I'm left with dozens of unfinished paintings that create half-scenes of the living and the dead, unsure of what's real and what's not. Horrified, I fling my brush to the floor and back away from the monstrosities I've created. The door creaks open, and light breaks into the room from the hallway outside. I turn. It's the wolf. His gaze scans the room. It doesn't linger on any of the paintings too long, though some of them cause him to flinch. His eyes are barricaded when he looks back at me. The lamplight from the hall glows around him, creating a dark shadow that looms over my body. My whole form trembles. What's happening to me? Chapter 11 He stares. I don't think he knows what to say. Then his expression twists. I bought that stuff because I thought it would make you feel better, he says, frustrated. Painting is what you love. I'm not sure what I love anymore, I say honestly. Hurt flashes across his face. The pain in his eyes is so raw, it even cuts to my hardened core. I apologize, I don't want to hurt you, I start. 
I'm just not sure who I am. I know who you are. You're Lissy, he begins. You're my Lissy. You always have been, and you always will be. Am I? What is all this? I ask. I gesture to the paintings and fling my arm in a wide circle around me. I put two hands to the sides of my head. My fingers dig into my scalp, as if trying to force me to remember. I think they're your memories coming to light, he says slowly. He advances cautiously. It takes everything I have in me not to spring back and run away. Your past is still buried inside. It's just looking for a way out. You mean all those things actually happened to me? I ask. I look from painting to painting, observing the harshness, the death, the beauty. Maybe you shouldn't stop painting, he mutters to himself. Maybe if you keep doing it, everything will... I'm not, I snap. Not again. If I'm going to paint, I want to paint what I love and what I see, not recreate haunting things from my past. If your memory comes back, isn't it worth it? He demands. He seems so strong standing there, commanding, brutish. Is this the person that I love? Loved? How could I fall for someone that seems so dominating? I look up at him. When our eyes catch, he flinches. A bitter resentment rises in my throat and escapes out my mouth. I'm sorry if I'm ugly to look at, I whisper. You probably want a pretty wife. You think I give a damn about that? He asks harshly. I'm glad you're still alive. His voice cracks. It's a hard sound to hear. I'm surprised to find that it hurts my feelings, even though it's merely a little. No matter how hard I try, I can't think of a single memory with him in it. I'm married to this wolf. At least, that's what people say. But if that's true, then why can't I remember my own husband? Whatever we were to each other before, we're strangers now. There's a knock on the door. I flinch. Lysar's face contorts into a snarl. The witch Shioni pokes her head in, looking between us. She glances at the paintings, but quickly disguises a horrified expression to get back at the task at hand. I beg your pardon, but I need the two of you immediately, she says quietly. There are matters we must discuss. We're a little busy here, Lysar growls. I'm sorry, Alpha, but this cannot wait. She only shakes her head. Not for anything. Lysar snorts. He turns on his heel and kicks the dresser before storming out angrily like a teenager. He isn't much older than a teenager, is he? Nineteen? Twenty? By Dracula, I can't even remember how old he is. You too, Zarina, she only adds. I know you're in a compromising situation, but we need you the most. I nod curtly. I follow Shioni downstairs to what seems to be the parlor. Willem lays upon Elisaveta's chest, apparently sleeping. The she-wolf Bryn is leaning against Tom. Kipcha stands slightly behind Elisaveta, so close they're nearly touching. Lysar takes up a corner of the room, alone and brooding. It makes me feel lonely to see him there by himself, like it's my fault. A tiny teenage wolf sits on the lap of a huge vampire I don't know, who is lounging on the couch. I'm guessing he's one of Elisaveta's. Parallel to them are a stringy vampire and another she-wolf, who seem to be disgusted that they're in the same room with each other. At least I'm not the only one who considers this odd. She only takes up the head of the room. She claps her hands and says clearly, Let's get down to business. She only waves her hands. The air in front of us ripples before it materializes. It forms a picture in mid-air, as if we're looking at a television. A live feed of the Winter Palace in St. Petersburg comes into view. Bryn curiously inches forward. 
Why are you showing us this? Because that's where we need to go, Shioni says clearly. She waves her hands again, and the picture changes. It's dark. The Winter Palace is surrounded by people pounding on its walls, calling out threats. People are screaming. It's chaos everywhere. One hundred years ago, the Romanov Empire fell, Shioni says. Tsar Nicholas II was abdicated from the throne, and he and his family members were killed. We all know that Princess Anastasia survived and saved the family by uniting it with the Dracula bloodline. Shioni waves her hands, the face of a vampire, her hair tucked into a bun beneath a cloche hat, startles me. I'm surprised to find how much Anastasia looks like me, minus the hideous scars and burns. Lysar notices too. He glances my way, but when our gazes connect, he goes back to ignoring me. I thought that Anastasia's influence today was limited to her heirs. Recently, I've received information that's proven me wrong, Shioni states. She might have saved us a great deal of trouble if my predictions prove correct. What are you saying? Lysar asks, his tone implying she get to the point. Shioni's lip thins. Some of you may have heard of Grigory Rasputin. He was a Russian mystic, a favorite holy man of Tsar Nicholas II. He had considerable influence over the monarchy before its fall. So what about him? The stringy vampire pipes up. He's dead, isn't he? He's dead, Valeri, but he's still our problem, Shioni says. There isn't much known about Rasputin except for rumors and hearsay. I've pieced together what I think might have happened. I'm not entirely sure, but my guesses are usually right. Out with it, then, the surly she-wolf at Valeri's side pipes up. We don't have all night. Give her a moment to speak, I say sharply. The room quiets. It's like I command attention. All eyes snap to me quickly before looking away, meek. Did I just do that? Give an order like it's my birthright to do so. Lysar's gaze is the only one still on me. His lips are upturned and a glimmer shoots through his blue eyes. What is it? Hope? Pride? I cannot tell. While he was alive, Rasputin claimed to be able to heal Nicholas's ill son Alexei from disease, along with several other miracles, Shioni says, ignoring my outburst. It's my educated guess that Rasputin was using magic to sway the family to his will. I thought only females could be witches, Tomlin says, echoing the question that is clearly written across everyone's face. Males have the ability to be turned into warlocks by witches, though they aren't nearly as powerful. It explains why Rasputin was never able to heal Alexei from hemophilia, Shioni explains. But that didn't stop Rasputin. It's my theory that he was looking to overthrow the Empire and take it for himself. But how? The little wolf on the vampire's lap echoes. His voice is childish and innocent. If he wasn't that powerful, how could he do such a thing? With this. She only flicks her fingers. The picture changes to reveal a round crystal orb floating in the air. The orb hums and creates a thick sound that vibrates throughout the room and shakes my very bones. It doesn't hurt to hear, but even so, I want to throw my hands over my ears. This is the Oculus, Shioni says softly. Her eyes are fixated on the bowl. It is called such because it is a looking glass into things the living cannot see. What does it do? Lysar says. He pushes off the wall he was leaning against and strides toward the picture, fingers brushing against the image of the Oculus. What magic should never do. It makes the dead alive again. You could hear a spider creep across the floor with how silent it is in the room. I don't even think anyone blinks. What? The little wolf squeaks. His eyes are wide and scared. The big vampire closes his arms around him to hold him. 
The Oculus was made by Rasputin and a group of very powerful witches. It is my belief they created it to amass an army of zombies to overthrow the monarchy and take over Russia, Shioni states. These witches would have had immense power, ten times more power than Valentina. I can't even imagine such a thing, Tomlin shudders. Witches were much more powerful in former years, Shioni says sadly. I believe in recent decades we've rather lost our touch. How could they do that? Bryn asks, aghast. How can magic bring back the dead? It can't bring them back, simply reanimate, Shioni explains. It's there to make corpses fight for you. If, if we got our hands on it, my mouth is very dry. Could we use it? Lysar's attention snaps to me. The corners of his eyes crinkle with guilt. It's like his face echoes my pain, but he's completely helpless to stop it. I know what you're thinking, Lysandra, Shioni says quietly, and I'm shaken out of my daydreams. The Oculus cannot bring Sergei back. It is merely an object meant to create an army of the dead, to reanimate dead bodies. We couldn't do such a thing to your grandfather. Hope within me dies and shrivels up like a popped balloon. Of course, it's not possible. I will never, ever see my grandfather again, and it's all my fault. He died defending me. He didn't have to, but he made the sacrifice anyway. Like he would have made another choice. I hold back tears. If witches are truly that powerful, why haven't they taken over yet? Valeri asks skeptically. The grumpy she-wolf nods in agreement. Such a thing is against witch law. We are not allowed to create anything that could result in world domination, and this object clearly meets the criteria. Shioni looks to the orb. It would be the duty of every witch alive to hunt down those who created such a thing and destroy it, along with its makers. Is that what happened? Bryn questions. No. Shioni shakes her head. I think Rasputin had the other witches quietly assassinated after they created the Oculus. They were supposed to share it, but obviously he wasn't too keen on the idea. Shioni shrugs. Luckily, he never got the chance to use it. Rasputin was killed by the people just before the fall of the Romanov dynasty. So where is the Oculus now? The big vampire asks. The little wolf's tail wags at the sound of his voice. That's where Anastasia comes in. Shioni smiles. She found out about the Oculus and took it before anyone got a chance to use it. If I had to guess, I think she hid it in the Winter Palace. Why wouldn't she take it with her? Lysar objects. Something so powerful shouldn't be left unattended. Because of people like my father, I echo. The room turns to me in surprise. Despite having my memory wiped, I'm one step ahead of the rest of them. She couldn't take it back to Castel de Singe, I explain. Too many vampires would have found out about it and stopped at nothing to get it. I look up. That's why we need to get it now, isn't it? My father knows about it and is after it. She only nods. You are completely correct, Tsarina. Why didn't you tell us about this sooner? Lysar demands. He steps in front of Shioni. This is critical information. I didn't know for certain it existed until recently, Shioni says coldly. I've spent months decoding old letters from Anastasia to her husband in an effort to be sure the Oculus exists. We've had bigger problems to deal with than chasing after a legend. How did you find out? I question abruptly. How did you make absolutely certain it was real? Shioni's face stills. The answer comes roaring at me and slaps me in the face, the one memory from the past that I still have. Ivan Grigore, standing there with a sick smile on his face after he beheaded my grandfather. Ivan, 
I whisper. You tortured him, didn't you? I caught him on the border of the vineyard just before they kidnapped you, Shioni says lowly. He told me what I needed to know. How did you get rid of him? It's not a question, more of a statement. Wussy, Lysa says. I don't look at him. I don't know what that means or why he calls me that. The others look at each other uncomfortably. I didn't, Shioni says dryly. He's being contained in the basement for now. The basement? It's enough to send me reeling out of control. My fangs descend. I rush toward Shioni, but Tomlin launches across the room, along with Lysar. Both of them hold me back as I struggle to reach the witch so I can strangle her. We need him for intel, Shioni responds calmly, despite my attempt to murder her. It's the only way we can get information on what Dragomir is up to. I don't care how valuable he is. I want him out of this house. I roar, outraged. I rip myself out of Tom's grasp, though the Alpha keeps a firm hold. I can't get away from him. Lissy, calm down. Lysar spins me around. This is how war works. We don't have a choice but to keep him around for now. He scowls. As much as I'd love to disembowel Ivan for everything he's done to you. Our baby is here in this house, I shout, pointing at him in Elizaveta's arms. But it looks like I'm the only one here that's actually concerned for his welfare. That makes Lysar cringe. Bryn steps between us and says, Liss, I promise that the baby is completely safe. We've got Ivan sedated at all times unless we need to question him. That doesn't make me feel any better, I say. What do you know about protecting Will? Lysar spits, suddenly vicious. You can't feel anything for him, not even when he's in your arms. Don't act like it's different from that, because I know. That doesn't mean I don't care. He's just an infant. I scream back. You too? Tomlin says as a warning. He steps between the two of us, forming a wall with Bryn that we can't get through. We peer over their heads and glare at each other. You should be grateful, I spit at Lysar. I'm lost and alone and terribly confused, but I'm still doing my best to keep it together. Dragomir has to be stopped no matter what, so I'm willing to do what I have to in order to take him down, even if it means being married to you. My fangs pierce my bottom lip as I bite down in an attempt to contain my frustration. You're not alone, Liss, Bryn objects. Tomlin nudges her to shut her up. You only want to continue our marriage out of duty, not love. Lysar's starting to tear up. I'm pretty sure his alpha pride is the only thing holding him back from breaking down in front of all these people. It doesn't matter. Whatever vows I took, I took them, and I'm not about to back out of them now. I shoot back. Not even when I've forgotten the person I'm supposed to be in love with. Marriage is forever and it looks like ours is pretty damn important to this war effort. Lysar makes an angry noise. My love for you isn't a weapon. Lysar stomps away, yet again running from something I can't name. He slams the door behind him and wakes up the baby. Elizaveta bounces Willem up and down as he wails loudly. I want to have the urge to comfort him, but I don't. I'm an incapable mother. Bryn goes to follow her brother, but Tom grabs her arm and whispers, let him go. She only clears her throat. We go to the Winter Palace tomorrow morning. We don't leave the area until we find the Oculus. Let us pray it is enough. Chapter 12 I spent the day sleeping alone in my bed. Lysar didn't come back. The others handed the baby over to me after Lysar and I's argument. They were reluctant to, but what kind of parent would I be if I never watched my own son? He woke up often during the day, and I floundered to change and feed him. I knew what I was doing, but it felt like I didn't. 
even though I knew I had given birth to this baby, I still couldn't form any connection with him. It made me feel like a bad mom. When night fell and we had to leave, I didn't want to hand Willem over to Katya. I remembered what she did to Sierke, how she left him and ran away with Mormont. The question still remained if I was his daughter or Dragomir's. Despite my resemblance to Anastasia, I still wasn't convinced it couldn't be a coincidence. It only made everything in my life even more confusing. I ended up giving Willem over to a few of Elisaveta's vampires for them to watch instead. It's sad I trust them to keep Willem safe more than my own mother. I wait outside in the garden where we all planned to meet up. A large black van sits in the driveway, waiting to take us into St. Petersburg. I'm the first one here. I sit on a stone bench and look at the flowers, feeling rather statuesque. I keep thinking that this is a dream and I'm going to wake up at Castel de Singe. When the wolf spell hits my nostrils, I panic. I'm out here alone with a shifter. But it's just the little wolf from yesterday, carrying a large yellow flower in his mouth as he rounds the corner and enters the garden. I wonder if I should run, but after surveying the little wolf, I realize that I can kill it easily. He's not really a threat to me. The little wolf lays the flower on my lap and his ears perk up. Hello, he says cheerfully. Do you like it? I found it for you. I'm sorry, I say blankly. I don't know you. He giggles. Oh, sorry. My name's Georgie, he explains, rear end wiggling. You don't remember me, but we're friends. Yes, I sit back. Seems like many wolves are friends with vampires these days, and they sleep with them. I saw this and thought you would like it, he starts, nudging the flower with his nose. It's pretty like you. I'm not pretty anymore, I say softly. Yes, you are, he insists. You're probably the prettiest vampire I ever met. Ma used to say that the most beautiful things are those with flaws. It just makes you more unique. His teeth spread into a wide, wolfish smile, and I cringe. It's just another reminder that I can't recall who I am, I say, frustrated. I don't even know what family I belong to. You're part of our family, Georgie says. He puts a paw on my knee. You'll come back to us. I know you will. You love Lysar too much to forget. Are you sure? I ask. Right now I can't see how I could love him at all. You loved Alpha more than anything or anyone in the whole world, he says, his eyes growing wide. Everyone could see it. It's what changed our lives. Hmm. I turn away. Maybe it's possible. You've got to look on the bright side. It's like you can relive the very beginning. Isn't it nice that you get to fall in love with him all over again? His eyes sparkle innocently. I don't think this kid gets it, but I sigh and force a smile. I suppose. Do you have someone who loves you? Georgie's nose crinkles mischievously. I'll never tell. What about your parents? I ask. Such a tiny thing shouldn't be left alone in the world. It seems wrong. Oh, they're gone. They were killed in the war a long time ago, Georgie says. Ma loved me, but Da, he was always ashamed, you know. How could he be ashamed of you? In five minutes, this wolf is winning me over. I don't see how anyone could be disappointed in such a cute thing. I'm just the Omega, the weakest in the pack, he explains. But that won't be true for long. I'm going to prove to Alpha that I'm brave. Then he'll see that I'm strong enough to protect the family instead of the other way around. Why do you care so much about what Lysar thinks? I ask. I love Lysar. 
He's the big brother I never had. Georgie wiggles. He was there for me when Da wasn't. Really? Yeah. We used to explore old castles and roll down hills and such. I remember every night he used to take me out to see the stars. Joji fidgets happily as if he can see them now. We'd have races and play games over the fields. We were younger then, but Alpha, he made me feel like I was capable of something important. I just want to make him proud. Joji looks up. Like I want to make you proud. I know you can't remember me, but I love you, and I want you to get better. Why do you love me? I ask, completely flummoxed. I love you because Alpha loves you, and there's nothing else to it, Georgie says. I love all my friends. Georgie's sweet sentiments seem so fragile in this war, like flowers crushed underfoot or wind sweeping away wishes upon the air. It makes me want to shield him. I saw you gave will to people you don't know he adds. If you want to, I can watch him. Fiora and I don't mind staying behind. Do you like watching him? I ask. Yes, Will, he's my little buddy, you see, Georgie says eagerly. I like playing with him. It's fun. Uh, okay. I nod. That would actually make me feel a lot better if someone I sort of knew took care of him while I'm away. I'm on it, Georgie says, rising up on his hind legs and giving a sloppy salute. He spins around and trots toward the house before pausing and facing me again. Don't worry, I'm small, but I can be ferocious if I want, and Fior's so big nothing gets past him. Georgie bears his teeth and hunches his shoulders, pretending to be threatening. It almost makes me laugh, but I stop myself at the last minute. Fior's the vampire you were with yesterday. You were on his lap, I notice, taking a guess. You must be good friends. We're close, Georgie says cryptically. He waves a paw in farewell. Don't worry, Liz. I'll watch Will for you. When Georgie closes the door behind him, my shoulders slump. Okay, maybe wolves aren't as bad as I thought they were. After all, my son is half of one, isn't he? I look at the flower in my lap. Georgie is so sweet, a good person, one who still thinks I'm pretty despite my grotesque appearance. After a bit of thought, I decide to braid it into my hair. It was a gift from a friend. The others file out of the house slowly. Tomlin, Bryn, Elizaveta, Kipcha, and Shioni. The stringy vampire and his surly companion, Valeri and Rosa, I think, soon emerge after them. Hey, are you guys coming too? I ask Valeri, trying to be friendly. No, Valeri sniffs. We've got better things to do. What could be more important than helping us look for the Oculus? I ask curiously. None of your business, Rosa snaps. The two of them turn their noses up at me and proceed to a different car, where they get in and drive away. How rude. I guess it doesn't matter if you're a vampire or a werewolf, you can still be an ass either way. I look around for Lysar. He's hiding behind Bryn. Instead of scowling at me, he smiles broadly when he sees me. It makes my innards flip-flop. Did he have a sudden personality change overnight? Get in the van, Shioni informs us, taking the driver's seat. We have to drive quickly so we're not seen. Isn't the Winter Palace a popular tourist attraction? How are we going to search it? Bryn asks. The palace isn't open at night. I made sure to swing by and slip the guards a heavy sleeping potion and placed a spell over the security system, Shioni says. We won't be disturbed until morning. No one asks any more questions. I think it's too early. Kipcha lets out a big yawn. We clamber inside the van, each taking a different seat. I'm unhappy to find that I end up shoved in the back, 
Lysol sitting next to me. Darn, I really wanted to avoid him. She only plays classical music loudly. How can you play classical music loudly? And people start talking, but I don't think it's because they want to. It's obvious what they're doing, giving Lysar and I space to talk. This isn't the time to play matchmaker, guys. I really don't want to be set up by people I hardly know, especially when they're trying to hook me up with such a brute. I look out the window, but Lysar taps my shoulder. I'm forced to look at him. Yes, I ask, and I cross my arms. His face seems friendly, if but a little worried. It looks like he's afraid of pissing me off again. Good. Hey, he starts. I'm sorry. I was kind of an asshole yesterday. Kind of? I ask, raising an eyebrow. Okay, okay. He lets out a whoosh of breath. I was a major asshole. Well, thank you for admitting it. I sigh and cross my ankles. You just have to understand, he says quietly. This isn't easy. I understand you're upset that I can't remember you, us, whatever we are or were, I flounder. But this is a whole new world to me, vampires and werewolves working together. I might have been the one who started it, but I can't remember that. I just lost my grandfather, and now I'm expected to win a war that's impossible to win, along with raise a baby I can't remember carrying. You could cut me some slack. All fair points, he says, throwing up his hands. My sister convinced me I was being a total douche. I think we got off on the wrong foot yesterday. I want to start over. He sticks out a hand. Hi, I'm Lysar Lupescu, and I'm your husband. I take his hand, shaking it quite warily. I'm Lysandra Romanova Dracula. I guess I'm your wife. Romanova Dracula Lupuscu. He grins. You forgot the last part. Hmm. I let my hand drop in disappointment. It seems I can't even remember my own name nowadays. Don't worry. We'll get it back, he says. It interests me to notice he said we'll get it back. Like we're a team, and I'm not off doing this on my own. He seemed really mean and harsh yesterday. Now he's acting so nice. Is this a trap? I don't know. I remain quiet and decide to enjoy the beauty of St. Petersburg. St. Petersburg is filled with skyscrapers. They fade away once we get into the historical district, which is filled with Baroque and neoclassical architecture. We pass multiple art museums and theatres, which makes me inwardly moan. The Russian ballet, the concerts, the festivals. St. Petersburg is the artistic hub of Russia. I didn't get to spend much time here when Dragomir sent me away, but even so, it's like I'm homesick for the city. I could spend decades here and never get tired of it. Never. Lysar's watching me. It's unsettling. I wish he'd stop but it's like he's enchanted by the sight of me being enchanted by the metropolis. She only pulls into a secluded area of the Winter Palace, where the employees usually enter. We get out of the car, and there are gasps of amazement as we look up. There is truly no way to describe the Winter Palace. The building is white and massive, with incredible stucco work and opulent facades. It rises several stories above us, towering high with thousands of windows. I feel tears spark in the corner of my eyes as I look at it. I've seen it before, but it never ceases to make me emotional. This is who I am. My name. Where I belong. The Romanov family should have never had this palace taken out of their hands. As one who bears the name, it feels like I'm coming home. Come on, she only whispers, seemingly the only one unimpressed by the palace. She unlocks the door with magic and pushes it open. Silently, we ferry inside. 
The inside is even more impressive than the outside. Chandeliers hang over marble floors and granite walls, faux marble columns rising up to reach the ceiling. Grand staircases twirl next to some of the Rococo decoration, gorgeous murals and paintings hanging beside incredible statues and antique furniture over a hundred years old. It's classical. It's brilliant. It's royal. Like stepping into the past. The Winter Palace has hundreds upon hundreds of rooms. Some of the state rooms could host over 20,000 people. It even has a church inside. How are we supposed to find the Oculus in such a grand building? Whoa, swanky place, Kipcha says, letting out a low whistle. Also, Lysar adds with a smile, too rich for our blood, huh, Kip? Some of us prefer the finer things in life, Tomlin replies rather snootily. Then why the hell did you go for my sister? Lysar asks. Everyone laughs. Bryn punches Lysar harshly across the shoulder, and Tomlin glares at him. Lysar gives me a playful side eye. I try to smile back. Quiet, Shioni hisses. We have work to do. The group settles, but the joyful demeanor isn't gone. Though we're on a crucial mission to find an object that could raise the dead, something that could change the course of the entire world, hardly anyone is serious. If anything, they're all goofing off. Bryn and Tomlin keep nudging each other in a very I-know-what-they're-thinking kind of way. Kipcha keeps leaning forward to stroke Elizaveta's fingers. She doesn't pull away, which tells me something important. Elizaveta's usually so serious, focused solely on getting the job done. She's a no-nonsense kind of vampire. Though my memory's gone, I certainly can guess that she hasn't admitted her obvious feelings to Kipcha yet. She's not a person who talks about her emotions. Even so, she's doing a poor job of hiding them. How can she be so immersed in Kipcha? when all she cared about before was being a good leader and winning battles. Then I take a look at Kipcha's massive biceps and change my mind. You'd have to not have estrogen to be immune to his good looks and charm. Honestly, I can't blame the girl. If I wasn't taken... Why did I just think that? Am I taken? I look at Lysar. Still no feeling there. What's wrong with me? Maybe yesterday was a fluke, and he really is nice. He's arguably hot, even more handsome than Kipcha. Besides the fact that I'm a vampire and don't have a beating heart, am I dead inside? Why can't I be in love like everyone else? Is that passion really buried inside, too deep for me to remember? Or is it gone forever? Maybe we shouldn't have brought couples here. Everyone but Shioni seems to be paired up. Not that she cares. She seems irritated that everyone is messing around playing date night. Lysar looks like he wants to play too, but doesn't want to risk setting me off. This place is too big. We need to split up, Shioni says quietly. Everybody in pairs. It doesn't take long for everyone to split up with their chosen partner. Guess who I'm left with. Will you be all right alone, Shioni? Bryn asks curiously as the witch heads off by herself. I'll be fine, Shioni says, clearly more than happy to be in solitude. Start looking. We've got a lot of work to do. Everyone heads off. Soon I'm left standing alone with Lysar, who looks as lost as I feel. We... We should start with the bedrooms, I say. That'd be the first place I'd check. Glad you know where you're going, Lysar says. He follows me. Our shadows brush and merge against the walls as we travel through the palace. I don't really know where I'm going. In fact, I'm a little lost. But at least heading somewhere makes me feel better that we're searching for a needle in a haystack. 
I take a few turns and dash past a couple rooms purposefully, hoping Lysar doesn't notice that I'm lost. When we open two grand doors and are faced with a large, nearly empty space, I pause. We're in the Neva Enfilade, the three interconnected rooms used for celebrations within the palace. The Nicholas Hall, the largest room and the one we're currently standing in, is a great ballroom decorated with tall windows and large chandeliers. I take long strides to the center of the room. It takes me minutes to cross. It's huge, I say. My voice echoes, bouncing off the walls and reverberating at me. In my mind's eye, I can imagine thousands and thousands of people in this room, dressed elaborately in ball gowns and hussars' uniforms, twirling to the music of an imaginary waltz out of the early 1900s. Unexpectedly, I start humming. I begin swaying back and forth to the tune, unsure of where it came from. I spin a few times, closing my eyes and imagining. I'm wearing a long white dress, bending in time with the notes that lift off my tongue. Lysar is watching me from afar. He hesitates for a moment before he appears to make up his mind about something. He comes to my side and extends a hand. May I have this dance? He seems terrified that I'm going to turn him down. But I don't want to. I take his hand and say politely, Yes, you may. His eyes betray relief. He takes my right hand and places his other on my waist. I put my left hand on his shoulder, and we begin swaying, me keeping time with the endless loop in my head. Something about this place seems familiar. I say. I can't help it. I start humming the song again. Lysar pulls me closer, and I ignore the butterflies swooping in my stomach. Everything is new, and I'm not sure if I like it. It looks like the ballroom in Salkovia, Lysar notes, and he twirls me around. How would you know what it looks like? I ask, confused. It's where our wedding reception was held he says. We got married in Salkovia. Oh. It was our first kiss, too, he adds. Not our wedding, I mean. Dancing. We danced in your room at Castel de Singe, and I kissed you. I narrow my eyes, trying to recall. Not a thing. I believe you, I say. You're quite the capable dancer. He laughs lowly. Underneath my hand, his shoulder ripples. His shoulders are so broad, so big. I imagine them above me, completely bare, moving back and forth with passion. What is going on with me? Lysar starts humming along. He picks up all the beats. Our voices meld together flawlessly in a symphony of perfect timing. How do you know this song? I whisper lowly. It isn't that familiar or well-known. It can't be. It's the song that we danced to at our wedding, he replies. His voice is thick with emotion and desire. With that sentence, everything comes rushing back. Lydia, organs on display and open veins gushing blood. Valentina exploding into a pile of ash, Shioni standing triumphant in a church destroyed, people dancing around us, laughing and cheering, Tomlin flinging Bryn over his shoulder, Elisaveta blushing while Kipcha stands nearby, tossing the bouquet, Lysar taking off the garter, us standing in front of a fountain, the sky thick with falling snow, me, swearing to the stars above and to everyone nearby that I will be faithful to this wolf always. Sergei placing a crown in my hair. Sergei walking me down the aisle. And a wolf with blue eyes twirling me around Salkovia's ballroom, bending in to whisper in my ear that he will love me forevermore.
I can't bear it. No, I say. I push away from Lysar and clutch the sides of my head. Make it stop. Lissy, Lysar says, extending a hand. He goes to hold me, but I duck away and bend over. So many memories. So much love, pain, and loss. I don't have the capacity to hold it all in. It makes my head hurt gives me a headache. It's physically agonizing. Just as quickly as the memories return, they fade, leaving mere traces of the vows I took months ago. I feel like I'm going to be sick. I press a hand to my mouth and will the nausea to go away. Lissy, calm down, Lysar says gently. It's all right. It's not, I protest. Even the words are thick, like vomit coming out of my mouth. I can't do this. I don't have the strength. What do you remember? He asks. He creeps forward silently. It's meant to soothe me, but all it does is make me feel like I'm a prey, the objective of a wolf on the hunt. I don't know, I say honestly, louder than I intended. The echo comes back, vibrating off the windows. The sound makes my head hurt even more. Yes, you do. Lysar stops advancing, hands out. Something happened just now. It's like you were coming back to me. I'm sorry, I say, shaking my head. I can't do this. Lissy, he shouts. I don't listen. Before Lysar can stop me, I run full speed toward the grand doors. I fling them open and race through the halls of the Winter Palace until I've escaped it and am safe in the outside world. This isn't who I am. I need to get away from all of them. I dart down several side streets to confuse them, to make them lose my scent. I get as far away from the Winter Palace as possible, winding through the avenues of St. Petersburg as I fall into a rabbit hole I cannot escape, running from my fate running from my past. Chapter 13 Bloodlust. That's what courses through my veins as I sprint through the streets of St. Petersburg. I increase my strides, trying to get out of the city, but I'm unable to deny the delicious scent that wafts to my nostrils and makes my mouth water. Inside the Winter Palace, there were no humans around to smell or be tempted by. In the outside world, there are thousands upon thousands of humans wandering the streets of the city at night. All of them an easy meal. I don't know why I'm attracted to human blood. I can't remember being thirsty for it before. As far as I can recall, I lived with human slaves in Castel de Singe and never craved what flowed through their veins. I was fine, unaffected. Yet now I'm ravenous. Since I woke from my time in the sunroom, itching and burning has coursed through my body. I thought it was a result of the burns I experienced, but now I realize the truth. It's an addiction. Somehow in the past, I drank human blood, and I drank enough of it to get me hooked. A memory flashes in my mind, the same one I experienced in the ballroom moments ago. Lydia lying upon the ground, her entrails splayed across the chapel floor. Lydia. Was it Lydia I killed and devoured? I can't remember... I want to get out of the city, see if I can spare a life. But it's impossible to deny the need. I have to hunt. I must feast upon human flesh. There's a man ahead of me. I slow my steps and come to a halt. The man is in his thirties, shoulders hunched over against the night. He's alone. I'll be able to break his neck and sink my fangs into his throat before he even knows what's happening. It'll be merciful. Painless. I tiptoe behind the stranger, footsteps silent. 
The man is only a few strides away now. I can't believe I'm doing this. This is wrong. It's sick. But it's what I must do. I can't suppress the monster within me. She's got hold of me now. My fangs descend. I open my mouth and take a deep breath, preparing to pounce. I jump into the air and grab the stranger. My tight grip hurts his arm. He gives a cry of pain and looks up at me in total fear, his eyes widening at the sight of my fangs. Help! He screams in Russian. Someone, help me! It's pointless, I murmur to him. No one can help you now. I bend down to take a bite out of his jugular. But before I can, someone tackles me to the side. I hit the ground. A pair of thick, strong arms wrap around my middle, pinning my arms to my sides. I struggle and squirm to get away, literally snarling. The man stares down at us and shakes. Run, Lysar shouts to the stranger, still holding me tight. Though there's a language barrier, no translation is needed. The man spins on his heel and hightails it out of there as fast as his legs can carry him. The sight of my prey escaping is enough to turn me into an animal. I lose all self-control. I bend down to sink my teeth into Lysar's arm instead, my fangs piercing the flesh until they're embedded up to my gums. I use my fingernails to claw at his arms in a fight to get free, creating deep gashes. Blood starts trickling down his arms and splashes into large droplets on the ground. Oh! Lysar cries out in pain, but he doesn't let go. He only holds me tighter. I continue thrashing until he rolls on top of me, effectively pinning me down. I try to squeeze away, but I can't. Even a vampire as strong as I can't measure up to the strength of the Alpha. I'm still watching the man run away as I lay in Lysar's blood. I'm sorry, Lissy, he says. His voice is thick as he sits on my hips. A few droplets of water fall on the back of my neck. Is he crying? A sharp pain jabs against the side of my neck. I yelp and my eyes droop slowly as the pain leaves. Everything becomes quiet and still. My entire body is stiff. I'm curled up in a ball like an animal, encompassed in a nest of sheets and blankets that I've wrapped around my form. I sit up slowly, my head a little groggy. I'm back in my room at the house in St. Petersburg. I notice that all my paintings have been removed, along with Willem's cradle. I can't blame them. Who would trust a monster like me around a baby? Lysar is sitting on the edge of the bed. He turns around to look at me when I sit up. The area around his eyes is red-rimmed. What, what happened? I ask. I had to put you out for a minute, he says. It was the only way to get you to stop. How did you do it? We talked about me carrying a sedative if you got out of control, Lysar whispers. You won't remember. It was months ago. He spins completely around to face me. His arms are wrapped sloppily in white bandages, like he did it himself but wasn't sure how. Patches of the bandages are stained with his blood, like he's still bleeding. Oh my God, I gasp, my hand flies to my mouth. Tears prick at the corners of my eyes. I did that? He doesn't answer. My gut churns. I get up from the bed and hurry over to the cabinet. I fling it open, looking for medical supplies. Thankfully, I find some, a bottle of alcohol, cotton balls, and some new bandages. I grab the supplies and sit beside him. Give me your arms. You don't have to do anything. No, I insist. Let me. Reluctantly, he extends his arms. I unwrap the old, nasty bandages slowly, exposing his injuries. By Dracula, 
There are so many bite marks. It's sickening. This might hurt, I say slowly. I hover a cotton ball full of alcohol above his wounds. I've been through worse, he says in a deadened tone. The way he says it injures me even more. He doesn't hiss or wince when the alcohol hits the wounds, just takes it. I wipe off all the old blood, then wrap his arms tightly with the new bandages so they're fresh and clean. We don't talk as I work, but I'm observing him carefully. He nearly looks like he's given up. On what? I'm unsure. There, I say, finishing. All better. Sounds like such a lie. I've only brushed the surface of the problem. Lysar stands. We're going back to look for the Oculus tomorrow, he says. You're welcome to join us if you feel ready. And if you don't run off again. Of course I'll join you, I say. This is my responsibility as much as anyone else's. He nods and heads toward the door. Okay, I'm going to get some sleep. Where are you going? I ask. My breath catches. I don't want to be alone in here. Outside, Lysar says. It's where I've been sleeping. My throat is so tight I can barely say the words. You've been sleeping outside and letting me have the bed? I ask weakly. I don't mind. I'm a wolf, he states. We're husband and wife, I say. It wouldn't be right if we slept in separate beds. I... He falters. I don't know if we should. He swallows. The gap between us is really hard to bridge. It's like we're on opposite sides of two different worlds, and it has nothing to do with the fact that I'm a vampire and he's a werewolf. Please, I say, come back. Lysar stares. Then he sighs. He lays across the bed, looking to me. I take the opposite side, lying down and staring at him. Even though it's odd, it feels right. Will you tell me how we first met? I ask abruptly. His head turns, and I add, Maybe it'll help me remember. Lysar's eyes are surprised, but he doesn't object. Instead, he looks upward and says, I got injured at a battle at Castel de Singe. I was really, really hurt. Unable to change. I would have died if you hadn't found me. I found you? I ask, shocked. Yes, I was beneath your window. His eyes lock on mine again. You took me into your room and hid me until I was well enough to run. But by that point, I didn't want to. It had been weeks. We had already fallen in love by then. Then what happened? I ask eagerly, as if he's telling a bedtime story and not facts from my life. Bryn explained some of this to me before, but when Lysar tells the story, it's different somehow, like getting it straight from the source. Ivan Grigori kidnapped you. Lysar's fists bunched the sheets. I managed to rescue you, but Dragomir caught us. He would have sentenced us both to death, but my pack came and got me out at the last second. You escaped too. You spent a month looking for me. I went searching for the den of wolves all by myself. Is that something I would do? I don't consider myself that brave or that risky. Yeah, you almost starved to death trying to find me, he says. One of the scariest times of my life that day. How, how did we fall in love? I ask curiously. You said we spent weeks together, but what did we do? I guess we were always fated to be together, since I bonded with you the moment we met. Wolf bonding, he explains quickly as I open my mouth to ask a question, is a wolf's instinct to know who his mate is. My wolf picked you. Oh, I say, disappointed. Is that all it is? No, it was more than that he adds quickly. 
He moves, so he's propped up to face me. We watched my favorite show together. You painted pictures of me, and we danced around your room. We told stories to each other and looked up at the stars. There were many times we talked all day, from sun up to sun down, and didn't get any sleep. You even gave me baths to help take care of my wounds. I gave you baths? I ask with a laugh, before thinking that since Willem exists, obviously we did more than just have a little fun time in the tub. Hey, I gave you baths too, he rebukes. I can't help it. I blush. He notices and gives a sly smile. By Thane, it's like you're a virgin again, he says. He throws a hand over his eyes and groans. I giggle nervously. Was I not a virgin before I met you, or something? Uh, hell no, he says sharply, throwing the hand off his eyes. You've only been with me, thank you very much. And the same is true on my end. Well, how can you know for certain, since I can't remember? I demand. Believe me, I know. He gives me a meaningful stare, which only makes me blush harder. Then, I still don't understand why I went berserk earlier trying to feed off a human, I say, in an attempt to change the subject. I've never drank human blood. Yes, you have. You killed Lydia, trying to protect me. Lysar lets out a whoosh of breath. She was jealous of you. You were trying to take her out of the equation, but you ended up getting carried away. It's strange. The last memory I have of her, I remember loving Lydia. I shake my head. But even now, I don't feel a thing for her. Hmm, Lysar says in a satisfied tone. I guess that proves Bryn's theory. Your real memories and emotions are still there. They're just buried underneath a bunch of crap. He scowls. We just have to dig it out. Will you tell me the story of how we met often? I ask. So I never forget? He nods. Yes. Always. He says nothing more. I take it as a sign that it's time to go to bed. I turn over, but something inside prods at me, and I scoot backwards, pressing my back against his chest. I thought I'd feel scared or uncertain, but I don't. I just feel warm. Lysar is rigid. It's like he doesn't know what to do. Go on, I say. We can cuddle. Just nothing else, I add quickly, almost in an embarrassing squeal. Lysar chuckles. Cautiously, he lets his one arm droop over me. He pulls me close. I like this. It feels good. You want to hear some sex stories? He jokes. I've got plenty of those. Um, no thank you, I shriek. Lysar laughs even louder. Maybe next time. You're lucky I'm letting you sleep in the same bed as me, I say playfully. Oh, yes. Though I'm not facing him, I can imagine him rolling his eyes. I forgot it was a privilege to cuddle my own wife. I smack his leg with my hand. Watch it, mister, or there will be consequences. Whatever you say, tough guy. His voice is muffled against the pillows. Something hits me. Tough guy, I mumble. Where have I heard that before? Lysar stills, like he's waiting. After a few minutes of thinking, I shrug and say, I don't know. Sleep tight, Lysar. Lysar relaxes. His voice is thick with disappointment as he says, Sleep tight. Chapter 14 I wake up at sunset to see that Lysar's side of the bed is empty, though there's an indent in the mattress. I'm sad Lysar didn't stay until I woke up. I wonder where he went. I take a quick shower and get dressed, 
then head downstairs to meet the others in the garden. But before I step outside, I hear quieted voices talking in secretive conversation. I press myself against the wall and lower my ear to the cracked door, listening. I just don't know how I'm going to make her fall in love with me again. It's Lysar. He's talking to someone, though I don't know who. Maybe a group of people. And it's about me. It's easy, just show her the goods. Kip just snickers. You're not helping, Kip. Lysar growls. It's only been a few days. Tomlin subs in. Give her a chance to come around. Can we trust her, though? That's the thing, Lysar says in frustration. Last night was an isolated incident, Shioni argues. She saw a human and got too close. If we keep her contained, it won't happen again. It wasn't a fluke. You guys didn't see it happen. I did. I was the only one there when she lost it last night. I saw her lose control. It, it was crazy. I don't know if I can handle it if it happens again. You don't have a choice. Bryn's voice is strong and wise, the loudest in the garden. You're married to her. You promised forever, for better or worse, and this is what you get. Nobody said this was going to be easy. You don't understand. Sometimes it's like she's right there, and then it's like she's gone completely. Lysar's tone turns even more sorrowful. It's like I look into her eyes, and they're empty. Nothing's there. He sighs. I don't even know if our marriage is worth saving. My stomach dips. Is he thinking about giving up on us? I can't blame him if he does. I haven't given him a reason to fight since I've lost my memory. But did you really need a reason to fight for a relationship anyway? Lysar loves me, and I'm pretty sure there must have been a time when I loved him. Wasn't that enough to at least try? You want to throw in the towel that easily? Bryn snarls. Wolves don't abandon their mates, Lysar. I don't want to. But what if she never comes back? He asks desperately. The garden goes quiet. Small footsteps pad across the ground. Lysandra is in there, Lysar, Elisabetta says gently. I have known her longer than you have, and the resemblance of the vampire I knew is still alive. Whatever you do, you mustn't pressure her. She will come back to you. I know this. Even if she doesn't, that doesn't give you the right to walk away, Bryn quips quietly. Nobody says anything more. I take a few moments to steady myself. I'm hurt by what Lysar said, but I can't deny he has a point. I can't be trusted. I don't even trust myself. But that doesn't mean I'm willing to give up. I might not be in love with Lysar. I don't feel like I am. I might not even want to be. But I did take vows, and by Dracula, I'm going to do my damnedest to investigate if something's between us before I throw it all away. I open the door gently and walk into the garden, acting like I didn't hear anything. Hey, everyone. Are we ready to go? The group startles, faces stricken, but my innocent expression convinces them that I must be clueless to the conversation they just had. Shioni says, Yes, we're ready. Everyone climb on board. I take a seat beside Lysar this time, instead of the other way around. I smile at him kindly. He returns the gesture, though it's muddled. He appears guilty that he was just talking behind my back. I let it go. He has a right to vent at a time like this. We don't find anything that day, nor the day after. We spend three weeks searching the palace, but we don't find a single clue. Something does change, though. Lysar talks to me. We play a game where he makes me try to guess my past. When I get it wrong, he tells me stories. Stories about us and how we fell in love. 
He talks about our time at Castel de Singe and at the Den, and our time in Salkovia together. He tells me so many stories that it's hard for me to believe we have such a rich history together. I like the game, but it doesn't feel real. Lysara attempts to fill in the gaps, but it's like water flowing through a colander. I just can't get anything to stick. Affectionately, I notice it doesn't stop him from trying. Each time we search, the group splits up again when we're inside the Winter Palace. I go with Lysar eagerly now, instead of reluctantly. I made sure to grab a visitor's map. I use it to get us to some of the smaller rooms, which we rummage through silently. No matter how many drawers we open, wardrobes we go through, or curtains we ruffle, everything's empty. We search at least twenty rooms, but not a single clue. After nearly a month, we've scanned at least a third of the palace. Absolutely nothing. There's no oculus to be found, and no memories of my own return either. They probably cleaned everything out when they turned this place into a museum, I tell Lysar. I don't know if Shioni's predictions were right. A human could have found the oculus by now and thrown it away, not knowing what it was. Shioni hasn't been wrong yet, Lysar says, and peeks inside a desk drawer. He shakes his head, but this feels like a wild goose chase. We've been looking for hours here. Let's try another area, I suggest. Lysar follows me to the hermitage, a beautiful wing of the palace where many expensive and glorious paintings are displayed. Rows upon rows of illustrious portraits hang from the walls. A wave of unexpected passion crashes over my body, and I nearly crumble to the floor. What's wrong? Lysar asks. He steps beside me and brushes his fingers against my arm. I don't shudder or pull away. Moscow, I say. I close my eyes and allow the horror to wash over me. He frowns. Why is it you only remember the bad stuff? I don't know. Ask my brain. I bite my lip. There was a hall of paintings at the coven I stayed at in Moscow. I loved them. It was where I spent most of my time. I reach out to brush the edges of a frame with my fingertips. Then it all burned. He stares at me, mind filling me in. I never told you, I ask, astonished. He shakes his head. You kept pretty quiet about it. You didn't tell anyone. Oh, it stuns me to know this. How could I not tell my own husband something so basic about my past? Was I that afraid to revisit that night? I'm not afraid anymore. I lead him over to one of the glass benches and sit down. Unexpectedly, he changes into a wolf and sits on the floor instead of beside me. I haven't seen him as a wolf yet. His fur is so sandy, blonde like his hair and looks so downy and light. Without thinking, I put my hands out to touch it. I bury my fingers within the silky fur and brush it back and forth over my palms. Lysar closes his eyes, enjoying the massage. When my hands stop to clench his scruff tightly, his eyes open. What is it? He whispers. I... I just remembered I've always loved your fur, I say. It's so soft. I continue stroking his luxurious fur. You were telling me about Moscow, he says quietly. Oh, yes. I take a deep breath. I don't take my hands off his pelt. I was in Moscow for a short time while I was training at a nearby coven, It was just before I was sent back to Castel de Singe. I was supposed to finish my training there, but it was interrupted. By who? Wolves. As I say the word, he stiffens. Wolves attacked the Moscow coven one night. We were overrun. There were dozens of them. We had nowhere to go and were trapped in at all sides. Before we knew what was happening, bombs started exploding. 
The entire coven was underground. Someone set the bombs off from inside. I stare at the tile below my feet. Fire was everywhere. It lit up everything. I watched as my friends burned to death in front of me. Everywhere I turned, I couldn't escape. Fire blocked every hallway. It was like I was running through hell. That's pretty sick that wolves could do something like that. I never heard anything about this, he argues. No, I shake my head. Wolves didn't set off the bombs. Dragomir did. What? Lysar rears back, stricken. He considered sacrificing an entire coven a smaller loss than losing a battle, I explain. He planted bombs there secretly for a long time, just in case something like this happened and we were going to lose. He killed all the wolves, but he killed all the vampires too. My voice sounds hollow. I was the only one who made it out alive. I crawled out an air duct and held my breath as long as I could until I made it to the surface. I had to dig my way out of all the rubble. My hands skimmed through his thick hair again. It was awful. It sounds awful, he says. I can see why you never told me about it. Thank you for opening up now. I figure you have a right to know, I say. I don't have a right to know anything, he states. What you just told me is a gift, nothing more. He stands. It's getting pretty late. We need to meet the others soon, he says. You go, I say. I just need a minute. At first, Lysar doesn't move. He seems reluctant to leave me by myself. But at the same time, he understands what I need. He nods his head and then turns away, tail bobbing as he trots out of sight. I'll wait outside the door. I stand up. I circle the room, observing the various paintings. I stop before one that's particularly striking. A young woman with silky blonde hair, wearing a dark brown dress and standing before a lake with a large bay horse beside her. The young woman is holding on to the reins of the horse. She appears a powerful royal, a princess whose gaze could own the very world. Humans wouldn't know who it is, but I, as a vampire, do. It's a portrait of the beautiful Princess Anastasia. I don't think I've ever heard of this portrait before, though I don't know why. It's marvelous. I put a few fingers to my lips and observe it taking in the splendor. She nearly looks real. Whoever did this was an incredible artist. I step closer and peer at the initials at the bottom. D. D. If I had to take a guess, it was Anastasia's husband, Demetrius Dracula. Guess that tells you where my talent came from, if I am indeed a Romanov. What would you do in my situation? I ask her. Would you hold on for love? Her stare is just as impassive. I tilt my head, frowning. Something's off with this painting. To most people it would appear fine, but to me, an experienced artist, I can tell it's not hanging off the wall right. It's like it's been tampered with. Holding my breath, I remove the portrait from the wall and hope I don't ruin it. I run my fingers over the edge of the frame and scan the back. I've never seen such a frame. It's from the time period the portrait was created. It must have been custom made. My fingers push upon a small button that I did not see and something clicks. Bingo. A tiny compartment at the back of the portrait opens. Curious, I reach my hand inside it. I'm half expecting to find the oculus, but my hand closes upon not a round, smooth orb, but instead a tiny, leather-bound book. Breath quickening, I open it. Curly cursive jumps out at me from the yellowed pages which crack and make noise. I freeze when I notice the name embellished on the front. Anastasia Nikolaevna. 
This is her diary. Why would someone hide it here? An artifact like this would be priceless. Because something like this must have secrets she couldn't reveal to the public. Could it contain information on the Oculus? This is too big to keep to myself. I should tell the others. But at the same time, I don't want to get anyone's hopes up if it turns out to be a dead lead. I pocket the diary and decide to read it later. When I greet Lysar outside the door, I act normal. I shouldn't be keeping this from him. But I won't, not for long. I pretend to be tired when we get back and skip dinner. Lysar eyes me. He knows I'm lying, but he doesn't say or do anything to stop me. He knows I need this time alone. I thank him for it. I rush off to my room and shut the door quietly. I thumb through the pages, skimming the words Anastasia left in a haze. It would be a breathtaking historical account if I had time to read it, but we're on a deadline to find the Oculus before Dragomir does. I skip to the back and read the last few entries, my eyes falling upon the final page. December 31st, 1921 My dearest diary, I apologize for what I am about to tell you, but my mind is troubled these days. I need a friend to confess to, even if it is one that cannot talk back. Please understand that I must get this off my chest, if only to save my own sanity and rid myself of the curse that has come upon my house. Several years ago, after my family was killed in the Russian Revolution, it breaks my heart now to write of it, so please excuse the teardrops upon the page. I discovered something terrible. It is a device that pains me to think about. It causes shivers to run up my spine and a sickness to enter my stomach. I knew this wasn't something that should be in the wrong hands, so I obtained the device and have it in my possession. I fear it drove me a bit mad. My darling Demetrius and I have done everything in our power to destroy it, but nonetheless it survives. We've requested help from vampires and witches alike, but there is no one able to stop the monstrosity Rasputin created. She's talking about the Oculus. She has to be. We discussed using it against the wolves in order to end the war between our races, but quickly discarded the idea. Not even against our cruelest enemies could we imagine using such a thing. Yet, it cannot remain here at Castel de Singe. I hid it in a place no one will ever find it, somewhere where it will always be concealed. I have since returned from Russia and grow so troubled of keeping this inside, I felt it must be put upon the page, even if something like this should never leave isolated thought. My first thought was to burn you, diary. But then it crossed my mind that what if someone in the future needed this information? I figured it must leave some clue behind to point them in the right direction and pray that you, diary, never be found by the ones seeking to use the device to their own purposes. I will do the obvious thing and hide you within the Winter Palace behind a portrait of myself, so anyone who learns that I had this item in my possession will think to come here and search first. The palace is so large that I doubt you will ever be found, even if someone is searching for it. Even so, it gives me a bit of hope that perhaps someone like me will be in need of you some day, as I often was. If you are that person, and you are reading this diary, here is all I will tell you. It is hidden in the place where I died and was born anew. That is all. Good luck to you. May God forgive me for what I have done. Anastasia 
All the excitement I had built inside me pops. She left us no clues at all. The place where I died and was born anew, what the hell does that mean? Anastasia and Demetrius were cremated after they died fighting the war against the wolves. Their ashes were intoned in a graveyard at Castel de Singe. But that can't be where the Oculus is. Anastasia said she left it at the place where she was born anew. So, somewhere in Russia? Certainly that can't mean her grave. I doubt she would have trusted the Oculus to anyone. The diary entry dates 1921, which means she hid it when she was still very young. The Oculus could still be there now. But where? I snapped the diary shut and put it into my pocket, then stand to go for a walk. Maybe if I ponder on things, I'll come to a sensible conclusion. I can't be out much longer. The sun will rise soon. I slip out the back door and take a quiet stroll around the woods that surround the homestead, lost in thought. A strange scent crosses my nostrils, a familiar and welcome, yet also foreboding scent. The smell is both vampire and wolf. I come to a halt and use my heightened senses to stare through the darkness. A male emerges from the shadows. He has dark hair that's been shaved on the sides and is long at the top, styled into a V-shaped patch at the top of his head. A golden earring dangles from his right ear, and he wears an antique leather jacket above faded and ragged jeans. He's really young. A teenager, not any older than Georgie. He carries a pistol, the make and model I cannot name, though he doesn't put a hand on it. He doesn't seem to be a threat. He's very handsome. His blue eyes shine and pierce, even through the blackest part of morning. An unbidden bout of affection rises in my chest for him, though I can't place why. Maybe it's because he reminds me of Lysar. I consider reaching for Sergei's sword on my hip, but hold back. What are you doing here? I ask. You're not allowed on this property. You need to leave. Don't be afraid, he says. His voice is playful, soft, and kind. I don't want to hurt you. I never could. I raise an eyebrow. Who are you? Mom, it's me, he says quietly. Will. Chapter 15 My mouth runs dry. Will? I ask, parched. My son? He nods slowly. Yeah, Mom, it's me. H how can you be my son? I stutter. You're all grown... And my will, he's back there. I point in the direction of the house. He's just a baby. Yes, I'm back there too, but I'm also here, he explains. I know it's a lot to take in. Just give me a moment to prove it, I demand. Prove you are who you say you are. He blinks at me. Then he takes a small knife out of his pocket. I think he's about to use it on me but instead he makes a small incision on his palm. A bit of blood trickles out slowly. Go on, he says. Taste it. You'll know. I take his hand slowly and raise his palm up to my mouth. When I taste the blood, it seems utterly familiar. My first thought is of Lysar. I've drank Lysar's blood before, though I can't remember when. All creatures carry their genetic code in their blood, and vampires can pick up on whose is whose, virtually read the history of a person's ancestors by using only the taste buds in our mouth. This stranger's blood is nearly identical to his, and my own. It's unmistakable. He's telling the truth. But how can Willem be here when his infant self is inside the house? Well, I whisper. I reach forward to hug him. At first he stiffens, surprised by the gesture, 
as I envelop him in my arms. Then he relaxes, circling my thin middle as he lays his head against my shoulder. He sighs in pure happiness, like he doesn't ever want to let go. You, you look just like the pictures, he whispers. With or without the burn scars, I ask, slightly terrified about what he'll say. I don't care about those, he murmurs. I never did. Relief flutters through my stomach. You're a good hugger, I say, squeezing him. I can't believe I'm holding my fully grown son in my arms. I'm making the most of it. You don't really hug me a lot where I come from, he says, shrugging as he pulls away. You tend to avoid me. How could I avoid you? I ask. You're my child. The admission brings tears to his eyes. You don't see it that way. Not in the future. Tell me what happened, Will, I say kindly. I know I can't remember giving birth to you, but that doesn't mean I don't love you. Willem's eyes widen. You've already lost your memory? He groans. That means I'm behind. Damn it! I'm confused. I narrow my gaze. Mom, we don't have a lot of time, he replies. I'll tell you what I can quickly. You don't remember, but you helped Shioni obtain a powerful artifact, a mirror from Le Chateau de Mir. I've been told about it, I reply. Doesn't it teleport you wherever you need to go? It doesn't just transport you from place to place. It can send you back in time, Willem says, his words a blur as they tumble out of his mouth. Me and a friend figured it out. My mouth drops open. Are you serious? Yes. My friends and I, we've been using it to try and fix things. He lets out a disappointed huff. All we've managed to do is make it worse. Make it worse, I repeat. How could you make it worse? Because in the future, Dragomir wins, Willem states grimly. You lose the war, Mom. All the wolves are wiped out. Dragomir kills all of them and uses his army of the dead to take over the world. It can't be, I say, shaking my head in horror. He can't win. But he did. He enslaves the human race, and vampires rule over everyone. The world that he runs is an apocalypse. It's hell, and I can't stand living in it anymore. Willem turns away, like he's ashamed to have me look upon his face. He got me, Mom. He raised me, turned me into a monster. I can't stand myself anymore. Can't stand the vampire or the wolf that I've become. He clenches my hand in his. You've got to fix it, Mom. Stop it before it becomes real. Why can't you fix it? I ask in a hurry. You're here. You have the mirror. Because if I tamper with the past, I mess with the future. Willem says, frustrated. I can't change things. I've already tried to fix it myself. And when I did, it caused terrible consequences. This is the last time I can visit this particular year in the past without ruining the timeline completely. His face screws up, bitter with loss and pain. It looks like he's going to start crumbling from the top downward into a pile of rubble at my feet. He's barely there. Whatever he lost, whatever he went through, it damaged him in a way that can never be fixed. I can't stand to see my son in so much pain. I squeeze his hand and say, Don't worry, I'll make this right. Can you? Willem's eyes are desperate, like he's already given up. He's in so much pain. Hope is the only thing he has left to cling to. Yes, I promise. I'm your mother, I say sincerely. I can fix anything. A thought crosses my mind. The mirror, I say slowly. If it can send people back to the past. Mom, don't, Willem whispers. I know what you're thinking. You don't want to use the mirror to bring Sergei back. Why not, I ask. Why can't I use the mirror to stop what happened? Why can't you? I've tried. 
He shakes his head. I've prevented people from dying, but they usually end up dying anyway later on in a worse way. Even if I can stop it, they don't act the same. Trust me, he's already long gone. My throat tightens. Thank you for being honest. He nods. I let go of his hands and place my palms on his shoulders instead. What must I do to prevent this future? The past can only be changed by those already living in it. That means you're the only one who can stop this, Willem says. You've got to do something, Mom, without trying to change the timeline. You have to alter the future in the reality you're already living in, in the current time. If you don't, Dad's going to die, and you'll be... What? I gasp. What are you talking about? Willem's face is very hollow, devoid of life. Dad dies during the last battle between you and Dragomir. It's only a few days from now. If you don't stop Dragomir from getting the Oculus before then, Dragomir will kill him. Then he'll take you and I back to Castel de Senge as prisoners. He'll force you to watch me grow up with him as my influence while you live the rest of your life in chains. That will be your punishment for betraying him. Horror grows within my middle. Absolutely not. I shake my head. We can't let that happen. But won't something go wrong anyway, since I'm changing the future? No. If you stop it now, in your present time, there won't be any consequences because it's your time period. It's only if I interfere that everything goes wrong, Willem says. Okay. Where's the Oculus? And how do I not mess all this up? He grasps my elbows. You figure it out by yourself, but you take too long to do so, and Dragomir gets there before you. That can't happen this time. The Oculus is buried in Anastasia's false grave in a forest outside the city of Yekaterinburg. It's where Anastasia staged her death. If you leave now, you'll still have a chance. Then there isn't any time to waste. I start walking at a quick pace toward the house, and Willem follows. I'll take a plane. Yekaterinburg will take too many days to drive to. Stay out of the sun, Will says worryingly. You won't have time to wait until nightfall to travel. He transforms before my very eyes into a large black wolf. He's beautiful. His coat dark as midnight, his blue eyes fiercely shining against his shimmering exterior. I'll be fine, I tell him, and I pat his soft fur. It's downy, like Lysar's. I'll escort you back and make sure you're not followed, Willem tells me. I wouldn't put it past Dragomir's spies to be out here looking for you. Willem accompanies me back to the house. Once I'm safely nearby, Willem steps back to hide within the trees. My time's running out. I have to go, Willem tells me. He brushes his head up against my hand lovingly. He takes a long time to do so. Be careful, Mom. If you did everything right, I won't just be Prince Willem of the Vampires when I walk back through the mirror. I'll be the son of the Alpha, too. I kneel down. I take the large wolf's head in my hands and kiss his long nose. Whatever happens between us in the future, know that I will always be here for you, I say gently. No matter what. Willem's tone becomes thick. He pulls away from me and backs into the bushes behind him. Bye, Mom. I love you. I love you too. When I say the words, Willem stiffens, as if I've never said such a thing to him before. Then he bounds off. What the hell happened to future me to make me treat my own son this way? Or worse, what did Willem do that made me so disgusted with him I never told him I loved him. It doesn't matter. It won't come true if I manage to pull this off. I start toward the house and hope no one else is awake. If I fail, Lysar will die, and I will live the rest of my life as a slave to my father. I'm not sure which fate is worse, death or enslavement. But I do know one thing. I will do everything in my power to prevent either future from happening. 
I'm done playing games with Dragomir. The future of my son is at stake. It's time to pay back blood with blood. Chapter 16 I head inside. I need a few things, such as my purse and the keys to one of our cars, so I can get to the airport. I think about grabbing a few people to come with me, gather a team. But I stop myself. If I bring back up, the same thing could happen to them that happened to Siege. I can't allow that to take place ever again. No one's dying for me tonight. It's safer if everyone else stays behind and I go alone. I pause in the doorway. Georgie and Fior are on the floor, and Willem is between them. A scattering of blocks and stuffed wolves are gathered around them. Georgie is in wolf form. His butt wiggles in the air, tail a flag, as he pokes Willem playfully with his paw. Willem squeals and laughs, like Georgie is the funniest thing he's ever seen. I'm gonna poke you, Will, Georgie cries. He tickles Willem's middle with his tiny claws, and the baby gurgles. Oh, gonna poke you again! They seem so innocent together. Willem's cries of joy, loud and sharp, cause a bit of happiness to rise in my chest amongst all the muck. Whatever has happened in the past few weeks, it brightens up things to have a baby around. Fior smiles as Georgie bounces around Willem. The way the vampire watches him makes my heart melt. It's so weird to be looking at your infant son when you were staring at a full-sized version of him not two minutes ago. I wonder if I'm crazy. Hey, Liz, Georgie says when I walk in. Do you want to play? Willem's big eyes are so crinkly and cute. I hate to say no. Actually, I have something to do. I say. Otherwise, I would. We can come with you, Georgie eagerly says. We'd love to give you some company. This is something I have to do alone, I say kindly. No offense. Oh, Georgie's eyes become concerned. Uh, okay. We'll play together when I get back, I promise. I pat Georgie's head, and his tongue lolls out of his mouth happily. I maneuver around the toys on the floor and to the staircase. Georgie continues to play with Willem, but the baby keeps his eyes on me as I leave. He's no longer laughing as loudly as he was. It's like even Willem knows I'm doing something I shouldn't. But that's ridiculous, isn't it? I grab my purse and a couple other things before I'm set to go. I think about jumping out the window to avoid detection but I can't. It's daylight and there's no shadow down there. I'll certainly get burned. I'll have to walk right out the front door to get to the garage where the car is waiting. I walk down the hallway and pray that I don't run into Lysar. When someone grabs my arm, I freeze in terror. But Lysar's hand is bigger and stronger. It's Bryn, staring at my purse. She's wearing a dark green turtleneck sweater and faded jeans, a very unusual departure from her usual khakis, combat boots, and army jackets. Is she trying to look nice or something? Why? Where are you going? She questions. It's daylight. I grasp for an excuse. Somewhere important? Like? She raises an eyebrow. I'm sorry, Bryn. I can't tell you where I'm going, but... I have to leave now, I say firmly. Just trust me on this one. Then let me come with you, she adds. We don't have to tell the boys. No, I have to go by myself this time. She wrinkles her nose. You're going to fight me on this, aren't you? Yep. And since I know you're not going to let me go alone, as alpha female, I command you to stay here. That's not fair, she says. You can't even remember becoming the alpha female. It doesn't matter. I still am regardless, I say. By pack law, you have to follow my orders. Bryn's face curls into a snarl. Fine. If you're really that adamant, I can't stop you. Her angry expression falls. She grabs my hands. Just please, please, wherever you're going, be safe. 
We all love you. The group couldn't survive if something happened to you. She makes a face. My brother definitely couldn't. It's not dangerous, I lie. Just very important. I promise I'll be back as quickly as I can. You're not thinking of running off, are you? She raises an eyebrow. No. My utter shock and apparent horror at the thought of abandoning them convinces her. Whatever I've become since I've lost my memory, I could never be my mother and leave behind people who are depending on me. She nods and steps away. Okay, I trust you. Just hurry back. I notice something and peer closer. Underneath her sweater are two very distinguishable puncture marks on her neck. A vampire bite. Now I get her nice clothing. She's trying to cover it up. What's up with the bite mark? I ask. Bryn turns pink. It's nothing. Bryn? I tilt my head. Has Tom been feeding on you? Not really, she flubs. My eyebrows crinkle. Bryn crumbles. She sighs. Okay, Tommy has been feeding on me, but it's not what you think. It's just when we're together. You guys are together all the time, I say dumbly. No, she groans. When we're alone together, you know? Oh, now it's awkward. I didn't plan on stumbling into this conversation. What a weird thing to do. Never mind then, I say, and attempt to head off. It makes it better, she insists, stopping me. He doesn't take much blood, just a bit. The venom in his fangs is like a stimulant for us. I hold up my hands. I'm not here to judge what you guys do. Well, thanks for that. She plays with her hands and looks away. Maybe it would help you and Lizar. What? I jerk backward. Look, I know it's not any of my business, and talking about my brother's love life kind of grosses me out, she says. But I'm guessing that things in the bedroom aren't as great as they once were. My shoulders slump in defeat. To be honest, it's non-existent. I can't even remember what sex is like. Thought so, she nods. I'm not saying sex is a cure-all, but it might help you and Lazar to get back to where you used to be. Maybe you should try feeding on him like Tommy does me. It could get something going. The ticking in my head reminds me I'm on a time limit. I really, really don't have time to be talking about sex and repairing my marriage when Dragomir is seconds away from claiming the most dangerous weapon on Earth. There's a world to save, after all. I'll think about it. I say. Promise you won't tell the others I'm gone? Promise, she says, though her eyes flicker away. Stay safe, Liz. I use a sun hat, and with great care am able to stay in the shadows of the car and the shade of buildings long enough so the rays of daylight don't touch me. At the airport, I'm overwhelmed by the smell of human blood. It's nearly choking me. Bloodlust is clawing at the edges of my sanity. I'm worried that I'm around humans, but I have no other choice. In order to get to Yekaterinburg in time, I need to take a plane. Lysar and I discussed briefly how we could prevent events like what happened in St. Petersburg in the future. He suggested white sage, so we burned it beneath a silk scarf I could wear. The smoke rose up into the fabric and permanently settled in, doing its job. Once the scarf is over my mouth and nose, I'm able to breathe again. I'll be safe this way, and others will too. Even so, once I board the plane, I take off my belt and loop it around my middle, buckling it behind the seat so it pins me there. I knot it so I'm unable to get it off without thinking in a calm and clear manner. The people sitting across from me look at me like I'm crazy. Maybe I am. I can't tell anymore. A few hours later, we land at the nearest airport. I rent a car and drive the rest of the way. 
When I finally arrive in Yekaterinburg, it's dark again, and I don't have to worry about getting burned. The others are probably looking for me. I feel bad for their worry, but not for leaving them behind. I refuse to put anyone in danger but myself. This is my job to change the future, as Willem said. The forest outside Yekaterinburg is dark and lonely. At least I know where I'm going. Sergei took me to Anastasia's false grave years and years ago as a history lesson. I can still remember its location. I draw closer, the end in sight. But as I step into the clearing where Anastasia's grave is, panic tightens in my lungs. There's nothing left of the site but a large hole in the ground and a few abandoned shovels lying discarded nearby. The grave has already been unearthed and cleaned out. There's nothing here. I hear rustling in the bushes behind me. Terror settles into my gut as dozens of vampires appear before me in a long line, preventing escape. All of them are wearing the Tsar's colors. They're armed with swords and assault rifles. Dragomir is already here. The Tsar himself steps out from behind his soldiers. He appears so smug. I want to slap the smile off his face with Sergei's sword. I suppose you were looking for this? From within his robes, Dragomir pulls out a large crystal orb. The inside swirls with thick white smoke, and the air around it hums, giving off a tone like wind chimes in the breeze. The Oculus, I whisper, defeated. I'm too late. I wasn't strong enough to stop the future. I failed everyone. Your friends managed to perform a miracle by saving you from my sunroom, though I see that your face still bears the scars. He makes a ticking sound with his mouth. Pity. You were such a beautiful girl. Now you are so ugly. It doesn't matter what I look like. I could never be as ugly as you. I reply. You are cowardly, you are cruel, and you are truly evil inside. That sort of ugliness can never be covered up or wiped away. He laughs. All meaningless words. Beauty will be redefined when I raise my army from the dead. I will change the way the world is run. Ugliness will be considered power in my new world. Not if I can stop you, I say. I hate this vampire. I hate him with everything I have left in me. This is the person that killed my loved ones, that took away my memory, and that separated me from my husband and child. I no longer want to kill him. I want to completely and utterly destroy him, make him feel every tortured emotion that I've ever felt. I am tired of dealing with you, Dragomir says dryly. He gestures to me with his head. Kill her, and this time make sure she stays dead. The soldiers raise their guns. I study myself at the foot of Anastasia's grave, preparing to fall into it when the bullets enter me. I will die in the same place my ancestor staged her death. How very ironic. Hold on, Liss! A voice penetrates through the fog. We're coming! I thought I couldn't be any more scared in this moment, but the sound of Georgie's voice causes a horror so frightening to sweep through me, I don't have words to describe it. Georgie, stay back! I cry out loudly. Don't get involved! He doesn't listen. From over the top of the hill, Georgie appears behind me in wolf form standing up tall and proud. He considers himself some kind of hero. He must have followed me after I left the house. Damn me to hell for what I've done to this poor wolf. What is this? Dragomir snarls in disgust. Take care of this little rat. Georgie, turn around and go back, I plead. I step in front of him to shield him from the bullets, but it doesn't work. He races past me, eyes wild, willing to save me from whatever fate he thinks he can rescue me from. 
I'll save you, Liz. I'll save you, Georgie cries as he hurtles down the hill. Don't worry, I can do it. I lunge for Georgie, but he escapes my arms. The soldiers begin firing as Georgie stampedes toward them, but he zigzags to avoid them. He leaps and lands upon the shoulders of one vampire, tearing out its throat. He jumps onto another and rakes his claws across his face, howling in victory. The soldiers dart out of the way as Georgie grabs the leg of another vampire and flings him aside. I'm not a weak Omega! I'm brave! I'm strong! Georgie shouts triumphantly as he fights. I'll make Alpha proud! Georgie, no! The scream that erupts from my throat rips my vocal cords in half with the sheer torture it is. Dragomir's soldiers raise their guns again and fire. This time, they don't miss. Georgie vibrates as hundreds of silver bullets pepper his body. Dragomir's soldiers fill him with lead. His blood flies everywhere, spraying across Anastasia's grave. He staggers, his paws clumsily stumbling from one spot to another as he wavers over the ground. I fall to my knees. Georgie hovers in front of me, eyes filled with shock, disbelief. I... I'm glad we're friends, Liz, Georgie whispers, his body pumped full of silver. I'm glad we're friends. Georgie falls. I reach out my arms to catch him, and he collapses limply into my grasp. His warm blood seeps across my arms and stains my clothes as a final breath exhales out of his lungs. Georgie, I shudder. I use my hand to stroke a bit of fur away from his golden eyes. They're empty. When Georgie dies, he changes back into a boy. It doesn't help. The innocence displayed over his round cheeks and full lips cuts me to the core. He never reached his 18th birthday. Georgie? Things only worsen when I realize Fiol has appeared at the top of the hill. The reality clicks slowly in my mind. Georgie was so intent on saving me. He went on ahead and didn't think to wait for his partner. If there was a way to articulate the pain on Fior's face, I wouldn't tell you, because it would be too painful to hear. I put Georgie's body down and rise up to stop Fior, but again, I'm too late. He's already gone. Fior charges toward Dragomir's forces, screaming violently. He fires off as many bullets as he can into the fray. He takes down some soldiers, but not nearly enough. Please don't, I whimper. My pleas go unheard. Fior's body is sprayed with bullets just as Georgie's was. But the large vampire plows onward as if he can't feel them. His fangs appear, and he hollers in rage at the soldiers. When he runs out of ammo, he flings the gun aside and continues the charge, as if he himself is going to stop a god from ruling over a cruel and desperate earth. Fiol doesn't collapse until he is right beside Georgie. His large hand falls over Georgie's small one before Fiol stills. My mind is blank. My soul is blank. I cannot comprehend what just happened except to know that Georgie and Fior are gone. There are voices rising over the hilltop. Reinforcements come too late. Dragomir notices, and his pitiful gaze is brought back to me. I've had enough of this nonsense. We will not fight here, Dragomir growls. Leave the girl. There's nothing she can do to stop me now. Dragomir's forces retreat. By the time the others arrive, he and his vampires are long gone. Everyone is here. Lysar, Bryn, Tomlin, Shioni, Kipcha, Elisaveta, Rosa, and Valeri. Even Katya and Mormont are here. 
My mother is holding on to Willem, shock crossing over her features. A quietness falls over them when I turn on my knees in the mud and reveal Georgie's splayed-out body behind me. No, Lysar says. He shakes his head. An expression of denial passes over his anguished face, as if he can make himself believe that this is all a horrid dream. No. Willem starts crying. Katya bobs him up and down, but it doesn't do any good. As a baby, he can't understand death, but he knows that something is wrong. He can feel our wretched sorrow. Georgie, Rosa whispers. Her entire body quakes with grief. Out of everyone besides Vior, she was the one who spent the most time with him, his most cherished companion. She never acted like she cared for him, always pretended like he was an annoyance. But now her feelings are displayed honestly. She loved Georgie the most, more than any of us. Valeri, in an uncommon expression of sympathy, reaches out an arm and draws Rosa to him. She clings to his chest and weeps. Valeri stares blankly at Fior's body, as does Elisaveta. They were the three vampires who chose to leave Salkovia, agreed to leave their home in order to help the cause. Now, one of their companions is dead because of that choice. I'm sorry, Liz, Bryn hushes through tears. You told me I couldn't come with you, but you can't order me not to tell Lysar. Alphas say rules over all. How, how did you find me? I ask. I'm surprised they can understand what I'm saying through the sobs. Georgie followed you, Kipcha says roughly. We followed Georgie. Kipcha is the only one in the group who isn't crying. Instead, he looks angry. His fists are so tight you can see them shake. Elisaveta reaches out and pries Kipcha's fingers apart. She forces her hands into his, so he holds on to her instead of hurting himself. Her face displays discomfort, but she doesn't let go. Lissy, why are you here? Lysa asks. Tears fall slowly from his blue eyes and splash down onto his shirt. Why didn't you tell me where you were going? Lysa, Dragomir took the Oculus, I wail. It's over. The Oculus was here? Shioni gasps. How did you find out? I found Anastasia's diary in the Winter Palace. It told me where it was. I take a deep, shuddering breath. I'm so sorry I didn't tell the rest of you, but I thought if I went alone, nobody would get hurt. I didn't want anyone else to die because of me. I wipe at my face, nearly slapping myself. What a stupid idea. People got hurt anyway. Dragomir has the Oculus, Elisaveta repeats dully. For the first time, the general seems defeated. We have no chance. It's my fault, I say. I should have told you. Maybe we could have prevented this. If you had taken a group, Dragomir would have surrounded us and shot us down, Lysa says. This isn't your fault. We could have come up with a plan, I scream back. Lissy. Lysa kneels beside me. He cups the sides of my neck gently and starts massaging the tissue there. My forehead falls upon his chest and stays there. Georgie, gone. Fior, gone. They took the bullets that were meant for me. What was I here for? Why was I worth so much that multiple people sacrificed themselves to keep me alive? The only sound in the clearing is of people crying. After a time, I raise my head up. I look into Lysar's eyes. They're wet, but sincere. His thoughts echo my own. We have to bury them, I say weakly. Together. We stand before an open grave. Fior and Georgie have been laid next to each other, hands clasping. 
We gathered up all the flowers we could find in the area and threw them in the grave. The result is a blanket of colorful blooms, creating a soft bed for the two of them to rest under. The flowers cover up the blood and the bullet holes. It almost looks like Georgie and Fior are sleeping. Sleeping in a hole in the ground. Georgie loved flowers, Bryn whispers as she throws the last one in. It falls on top of Georgie and Fior's entwined hands. Yeah, the little twit. Rosa snorts, her lip trembling. He was the girliest wolf I ever met. Lysar stands at the head of the grave, holding Willem. The Alpha hasn't let his son go since we finished digging the grave. The rest of us have surrounded it. All look to the Alpha for him to say a final goodbye. Lysar clears his throat. Georgie was the youngest to survive the siege on the pack. Before then, he had a rough life, he says, but he never let anything get him down. He was always optimistic, always smiling. Despite having a bad start in life, he never let himself believe anything but the best in people. When the pack found out about Lissy and I, Georgie was one of the first to accept and adore her without question. Georgie didn't see race or blurred lines. All he saw was love. Lysar's words began to waver. Wolves are known for their loyalty, but Georgie surpassed that. He was brave and always faithful. His faith in his friends made him stronger than any alpha that ever lived, and I was always proud of him. Lysar blinks. I just, I wish I had told him that. Lysar looks to me. He can't speak anymore. He doesn't have the strength. I take over for him, looking into the faces of each of my friends. A few weeks ago, I couldn't remember any of these people. I still can't, but now I consider them my closest companions. I would sacrifice myself for any of them, like Georgie did for me. Georgie was the smallest, but I think he was braver than any of us, I speak. He was willing to die for his alpha and die for his friends. There's no greater love on earth than that. I bite my lip to stop the crying that wants to well out of me. And I'm sorry. I'm sorry for everything that happened, Georgie. I look down at the grave, personally talking to him now. But I promise that you and Fior's sacrifice won't be made in vain. Somehow I will make this right. I step away. Elisabetta comes forward, and Kipcha takes her shovel. She appears tall and reserved. She clasps her hands in front of her as she speaks. Fior was a quiet vampire. He never talked much, nor did he let anyone in, Elisabetta speaks. But he never needed to. He was a fantastic soldier, but also a loyal friend. You could sit in a room with Fior and feel comfortable. Despite his size, he was gentle and he was kind. That resulted in him developing a relationship with Georgie that was unlike any other. Elisabetta gestures to the two. Fior and Georgie became instant companions when they met a few months ago. They were the closest of friends but they were so much more. They loved each other dearly and had a bond that went beyond the circumstances that surrounded them. All of us should aspire to love as they loved, purely and without blame or judgment. Elisabetta looks to Valeri expectantly. Valeri opens his mouth as if he wants to say something, but then shakes his head and steps back. Rosa puts a hand on his shoulder. She only lifts her head. I apologize, but we will have to say goodbye, she says gently. We need to find a place to hide before the daylight comes. What about the house in St. Petersburg? I ask, confused. Compromised, she only informs us glumly. When we were gathering to go after you, Ivan was unguarded. He got away. 
He's probably making his way back to Dragomir right now. Lysol looks to me blankly. He has no idea where we can hide next. A thought comes to mind. I gesture to Kipcha to start filling up the grave. Do you have a plan? Lysar asks softly as Kipcha drops dirt over the flower blanket. I nod. I know somewhere we can go. Chapter 17 A half a night's drive through the woods leads us to a beautiful two-story house. It sits next to a trickling river that's surrounded by wildflowers. Once, they were tended to lovingly and carefully by a talented gardener. Now they grow loose and wild. Fall is setting in, so these flowers won't be here for long. Everything dies, I suppose. The house is golden in color, a countryside residence. It's like something you'd find out of a fairy tale, a cute little place that's a refuge from the horrible world Dragomir has forced upon all of us. I try the front French doors and find them miraculously unlocked. I open them not a moment too late. Sunlight is starting to creep over the hills and through the dirty windows. The dawn illuminates the living room. Every piece of furniture is covered in white sheets and with a layer of dust, though extravagance hasn't left the cherished antiques. What is this place? Shioni asks in wonder. I look behind me. Tomlin doesn't say anything. He stays at the back and looks away. Similarly, Katya is quiet. She keeps her head down and eyes pinned to the wooden floor. A soldier lived here with his wife. I reply. I used to come here all the time during summers as a child. I know this place well. Are the soldier and his wife here? Bryn asks curiously. No, I swallow. Both are dead now. A large painting above the brick fireplace is covered up with a velvet cloth. Reaching upward, I grab the corner of the cloth and rip it down. The cloth comes tumbling downward and several suppressed gasps echo behind me as the painting is revealed. The portrait is a picture of a vampire in a soldier's uniform, long white hair flowing behind him. His arm is wrapped around the waist of a beautiful woman. Her red hair is tucked into a bun, and a flowing white dress ripples down her form. Both of them appear so regal and kind. I wish I had turned out like them. I did it, I say. The painting. It was the first I ever finished. How had I managed to put so much emotion into a painting at such a young age? Or does it appear that way because that is how I feel? I put my hand on the hilt of Sergei's sword. It's all very easy being here, I say. It's like I can pretend that they're still alive. Like I don't have to move on. Lysar comes beside me. Did Sergei always live here? He asks in a quiet voice, as if I'm walking among the dead. No. I shake my head. He came to live at Castel de Singe after my grandmother died. Katia sighs. A few tears slip out of her blue eyes, and she turns away to face the corner. Mormon puts a hand on her shoulder. Lysar presses into me. I'm sorry, Lizzie. Willem squirms. His arms reach outward, asking for me. I take my son from Lysar's arms and wrap him in my own. I bury my face in the crook of his neck against his head. Willem makes a happy noise and bounces up and down in my arms. Bryn places a paw gently on my foot. I smile at her. We can rest here for a while. Tomlin tells the others, taking charge, until we figure out what to do. Won't Dragomir think to look here? Shioni asks him. Tomlin shakes his head. This place has been abandoned for years. Dragomir never visited. He made excuses, but I think the real reason is Sergei never allowed him to visit. In every way he could, anyway. He was never interested in coming to my childhood home, Katya says. He will not find us here. 
her frigidness causes the group to separate. I'll look in the kitchen for cooking supplies, Shioni offers, turning. And Valeria and I can start cleaning up, Rosa says. Valeri opens his mouth to complain, but the sharp glare Rosa shoots him is enough to shut him up. I think Lissy and I need to rest, Lysar says, weary. Bryn, would you mind watching Will for a few hours so we can catch up on some sleep? Always. Bryn holds out her arms to me. At first I hold my son tighter. I don't want to let him go. But then Lysar puts a hand on my shoulder and I reluctantly hand him off. To give me something to do with my hands, he intertwines my fingers together. The feeling is unusual, but I don't pull away. I lead him upstairs to the master bedroom, where a lovely king-sized bed sits beside white wooden furniture. I start wiping things off, sneezing as I do so. This place has been completely forgotten about. We can't sleep on the bed when it's like this, I look in the closet for fresh linens and thankfully find some that aren't dirty. I remember playing on these sheets when I was little. Sergei used to make little forts out of them and pretend he was a wolf coming to get me. So long ago now, I'm not even that old. Classy, Lysar says as we replace the sheets. We open the windows to let some of the dust out and draw the shades so I don't get burned. My grandmother had French blood, I tell him, finishing off the bed with a new comforter and clean pillows. She liked decorating that way, reminded her of Paris. Paris? Lysar raises an eyebrow. It's where she lived. I lay a hand on the bedpost. Grandfather was on a mission for the crown when he met her there. He was infiltrating a satellite pack. She was serving the coven he was staying in as a maid, she helped him defeat the wolves, but it didn't help her position. People went nuts when they found out that an honored soldier of the Romanov family had fallen for a vampire servant on the other side of the world. So they weren't supposed to be together either. Yes. I pressed my lips together. Probably what made him sympathetic to our situation. Why weren't they supposed to marry? She didn't have royal blood or any connection to the monarchy. Their union was forbidden, but they eloped in secret in the countryside of France. It was a big scandal, I say. After Grandfather brought her back, people pretended they never hated her. Divorce was looked down upon in those times. It helped that my grandmother was very pretty. Sounds like Sergei was a born romantic. You never would have guessed by looking at him, Lysar quips. He was a lot of things. Being in the sun again wouldn't hurt as much as this. And Will will never get to know him. Lysar comes up behind me. You'll be able to tell our son all about him. It's not enough, I say. No memory will ever be able to replace how wonderful he was. Lysar sighs. Will will never get to know his grandma Sylvia either. Nor Georgie, or Fior or the pack, or any of the others we've lost. He grips my arms firmly. But think of all the people he will get to know. Bryn and Tomlin, Kipcha and Elisaveta and Rosa and Valeri. He even has your mother, though she could use some improvement. I snort, I'll say. And us, especially us. Is there an us? I ask. He stiffens. I put my head against his shoulder. I need to know, Lysar. I can't go on like this, living in this insecurity, this fear if you're going to be here today or gone tomorrow. My words come out in a fluster. I can hardly breathe. Don't hurt me by telling me lies or try to prolong the inevitable. My God, it's like you're burying a knife inside me. What are you talking about? You know what I'm talking about. Do I have your heart or not? I ask. I turn to face him. Of course you do, he says. You have since the beginning. You always will. That's not what I'm asking. It sounds like frustration, but it's not. It's desperation. I need to know you're not going to leave. 
Now the tears start coming. I need to know you're not going away, like Sige and all the others who love me do. You have me, now and forever, he says, grasping my face with both hands. You're my mate. I could never leave or abandon you. You talked about it with the others, I say. I overheard you. You told Bryn you didn't know if our marriage was worth saving. That was just a spur-of-the-moment thing. I was being stupid. After what happened to Georgie. He shakes his head rapidly. No. That was a ridiculous, terrible, and all-around shitty idea. Is it? I ask. If this isn't going to work, is there a point in trying? It, it doesn't matter, he says. Love doesn't work like that. If you're not supposed to be with someone, nothing you do or say is going to keep you together. But damn, Lissy, if you're meant for each other like we are. His deep, brilliant blue eyes catch mine. Then nothing can keep you apart. Not circumstance, not kings, not wars, and certainly not each other. Not even death can stop what we have. Even if we try to run away from each other, it won't make a difference because we'll still be together in the end. My eyes are wet again, damn it. You truly mean that? With all my heart, he says sincerely. His hands drop from my face and caress down my neck to my shoulders. I wouldn't still be here if I didn't believe that. I'm not breaking off our marriage. Hell, if the last few days have proven anything, it's that all we've been through has only brought us closer together. My stomach flip-flops. I'm so nervous. If that's true, then I want to have sex again. What? He lurches backwards. Why, all of a sudden? We're married, that's what married people do. That's not really a good reason. He stares at me. I sigh. Fine. Bryn mentioned a few things to me. I want to try them. What the hell do you girls talk about when I'm not around? He grumbles. It's on a need-to-know basis, I add quickly. If you think we're trying that freaky shit she and Tomlin are into, why not? I ask. If it helps, what's the harm? Lissy. Lysa. I run my fingers over his body. It's like electricity sparks at my touch. My body tingles. I think his does, too. I see the way you look at me. It's with desire. You can't tell me that you aren't longing for it. This isn't about me. It's about both of us. Our gazes lock. Let's just give it a go. If I can't do it, we'll stop. It'll be easy. I shrug, though I'm pretty sure stopping won't be easy. He seems doubtful. We haven't been together since before Will was born, he says. Is this really the moment? I want to try, I whisper. I lay my hands on his chest. Please, let me try. He swallows. What if you don't like it? We'll work on it. I... I take a deep breath. I can't bear to lose anyone else. This seems to change his mind. Okay, he whispers. Lysar bends downward. He starts by trailing his lips over mine. We haven't kissed since... Oh, I don't know how long it's been since we kissed. To me, it's like the first time. His mouth is tasteful and ravenous. His thick and tender lips trail from the corner of my mouth down my neck, and I hitch a breath. I can see the thudding vein in his own neck, smell the blood that's pumping within. I'm hungry, but it's not in the usual way. I hold off and kiss his hair while he nibbles at the fringes of me. I'm not who I was anymore. But with Lysar, I can become someone different. A vampire better than my old self. Whole again. After what I've experienced, I don't know if I can piece together all the broken parts again. 
but Lysar can. He's doing it right now, mending me in ways I can't describe, only feel. This isn't just sex. It's healing. Doing okay? He asks. I don't give him an answer in words, only in tiny gasps. He straightens upward and kisses me again, grabbing my hips and pressing me against him. I've been here before, I know I have, but this is so new, so real. Whatever's happening between us now has a way of grounding me. It centers my attention on only us and the things that matter. All those other things seem fragile and fake compared to what's between us now. He lays down on the bed, and I follow, melding my body to his form. We've still got our clothes on, but this is the most erotic thing I've ever encountered. The way we're kissing, the way he's caressing me now, it's exquisite, miraculous, like the finest taste of wine across my tongue, or the feel of freshly fallen rain upon your face. The way his large, rough hands move across my skin, creating a tingling and fiery sensation that only makes me want more. I could never want this with anyone else. Never. I'm so glad that Lysar is my only one, that he is the only person that I have shared my body and my world with. It wouldn't compare with anyone else. Nothing ever could. I press my lips to the vein in his neck. My mouth salivates, and my fangs retract of their own accord. Lysar knows what I want. He bucks underneath me, and I carefully draw my fangs over his skin. You're going to feel my fangs in your neck, I say softly. Is that okay? Do it, he whispers, almost begging. I sink my fangs into his flesh, into the vein that's been driving me mad. I begin drinking, taking sips instead of gulps. His blood is rich and incredibly warm, salty and sweet at the same time. Not a lot, I remind myself. Just enough. As I drink, Lysar moans and wiggles beneath me, I find incredible images begin reappearing in my head. Me, drinking Lysar's blood in his room back at the den. Us running through the gardens at Castel de Singe after taking the invisibility potion. Staring out over Romania at Vlad Dracula's castle. Lying naked in the bushes on top of each other just before he asked me to marry him. Some of my memories have returned. Not all. But some, it doesn't sneak past me that all of the memories are good and they are of Lysar and I. My venom is like a drug that we've injected into both of our bodies. After I pull my mouth away from Lysar's neck, I can't control myself. Neither can he. I tear off his shirt and my fingers fumble to unbutton his jeans. He tears my shirt in half, tossing it to the floor. I gasp when I see a large red handprint across his chest. I can't remember how it got there, but someone hurt him. It looks like it was done by magic. I reach out a trembling hand to caress the mark, but he catches it. Leave it, he says. He brings my hand up to his mouth and kisses my fingers. Did you get that protecting me? I ask, horrified and ashamed. It doesn't matter, he says softly. What matters right now is this. I'm concerned he'll be horrified by the burn scars all over my skin. I've been humiliated by them and hid them from him as much as I could. But he only treats my body with more care, like it's even more precious. When we collide, it's like the sun and the moon entwining together, fire and gasoline combining. We are two chemicals that should never be mixed together, but they create the perfect storm when they do. I can't imagine how I couldn't remember this, nor fathom why I would ever want to give this up. 
He loves me like it's our last time and our first. The undeniable want is there, but so are the insecurities. I can tell he's worried that I'll tell him to stop, that I'll reject him again and push him away. But I don't. I, too, love him like it's the last time, because it may well be. Give me something to hold on to, I spill out, though I'm not talking about this. I'm talking about life, about everything that slipped away out of my fingers. I can't stand to watch people go away anymore. I can't do it. I'm not going anywhere, Lysa says. He links his fingers with mine and pins our conjoined hands to the bed. I love him, even though I can't say the words because I'm still scared to. He's not. He never was. I love you, Lissy, he says hoarsely. He kisses my forehead as he moves above me. I open my mouth to say something, but he kisses me instead, ceasing the words to spring from my tongue. You don't have to say it back, he whispers when he pulls away. He brushes his teeth over my ear as he bends down to whisper the words directly to my soul. I know. Chapter 18 when we wake up, it's nightfall. I'm pleased to find Lysar is snoring beside me. He's still here. The revelation makes me giddy. He hasn't left. He's by my side. He's not going to leave. We can do this together. Things are still dark. Georgie and Vior are still gone, and that cloud hangs over me like a heavy weight but it's easier to carry with Lysar at my side. When I move, Lysar wakes up. He makes a sleepy noise as he stirs and looks at me. Hey, he whispers. Good morning. Good morning, I say back softly. Did you sleep well? Yes. He leans forward and smothers his face in my hair. Much better than I have been. I'm glad. I turn to face him. You hungry? I think the others are making breakfast. I can smell wafts of bacon and eggs drifting up the stairs. Thank Fane. Lysar swings himself out of bed and slips his jeans on. I'm starving. I don't think I can eat with everything that's happened. My stomach's tied up in knots. Even the smell of food makes me feel sick but I can't go starving myself, so I get dressed and follow him downstairs. Everyone is gathered at the large kitchen table. Bryn and Shioni are cooking breakfast. They're distributing eggs and bacon. Both appear grim, Shioni the most. I sit down next to Lysar. Where'd you guys get the food? I ask. There's a small farmer's market up the road, Bryn informs me. We snuck out and stole what we could without being seen. I nod to Tomlin. He's curiously white. Elisabetta appears cranky, and Valeri has the appearance of a dried-up prune. Tomlin, Valeri, Elisabetta, and I haven't drunk any blood in quite some time, besides the little I took from Lysar last night. And there's none here. We're parched. Soon we'll need to feed. Katya and Mormont appear fine. They must have gone hunting while Lysar and I were sleeping. It irks me. Such risky endeavors could expose our position, and for what? So they wouldn't have to be uncomfortable like the rest of us? Willem is in Elisabetta's arms. He squeals when I look at him. I take him from Elisabetta and put him in the crook of my arm. Lysar searches the icebox to find a small bottle of formula. He warms it up on the stove, then gives it to me. His fingers brush over mine as he hands me the bottle. We share a private smile. It's almost normal, this. It feels happy. Everyone else is eating in silence. They seem so morose, worse than the night before. Do they know something we don't? I've been meaning to tell you, she only says quietly to Lysar and I. 
I received a message from a friend in St. Petersburg. Dragomir plans to march on the city tomorrow night with his dead army. What? Lysar's fork clatters to his plate. The rest of them don't react. They already know. After he takes over St. Petersburg, he will move on to Moscow and every other city in Russia until the entire country is his, Shioni informs us. But if Dragomir wins, it'll be the beginning of the end. He'll start with Russia, then travel to every country in the world until he's conquered it all. Lysar protests. We have to do something. What can we do? Shioni asks helplessly. There is nothing. We all drop our heads. I stare at my son. He is eagerly sucking at his bottle. He doesn't know that the world I've brought him into has become an apocalypse. We clean up breakfast quietly. I managed to get a couple of eggs in me, but couldn't stomach anything else. This is it. Dragomir has won. My family and I will spend the rest of our lives running, jumping from place to place in the hope that the Tsar will never find us. Elizaveta abruptly stands up. Excuse me for a moment. She sweeps out of the room. Kipcha glumly puts a hand on his cheek and stares at the hardwood floor. I stand, my son still in my arms. I put a hand on Lysar's shoulder. He grabs my hand firmly and gives it a little shake. The look we give each other in that moment, it's odd, to say the least. I can't read Lysar's eyes, understand what he's feeling or thinking. I don't like it. I'll be right back, I tell him, before going after Elisaveta. I feel Lysar's gaze upon me, watching me until I leave the room. Elisaveta is around the corner, packing supplies into a small bag. Where are you going? I ask, shifting the baby. To Sarkovia. We must prepare, Elisaveta says firmly. Dragomir will attack us before any other coven. I have to protect my people. Elisaveta, if the entire world can't stand up to Dragomir's army, Sarkovia doesn't stand a chance, I say softly. You know when you've been beaten. She takes a deep breath. Her hands find her hips. I will not die as a coward hiding in a hole somewhere while my people are exterminated, she hisses. I am a warrior. My death belongs to the battlefield. Then why are you going alone? I ask. I run my fingers down Willem's back. The baby slackens. You know why. Say it, then. I feel like my voice is harsh, but it has to be. Why won't you take Kipcha with you? I cannot take him with me because I love him, Elisabetta responds, tone cruel and breaking. I am going to certain death. If he joins me, he will meet the same fate. Her eyes become misty. I do not want that end for him. I grab her arm. Don't do this to him, I whisper. He'll be heartbroken if you go. She hitches a breath. I know he will be, but I'd rather break his heart than take his life. With you, he has a chance. She swings the bag over her shoulder and heads toward the exit, but pauses at the door. She laughs slowly, chuckling at a sick joke. You know what's sad about the whole thing. We never kissed. We've never even admitted how we feel to one another. But we know how mad we are for each other all the same. Elisaveta clicks the door shut behind her. When she's gone, it feels like two weights have been attached to my feet and are dragging me to the bottom of the ocean. One of my oldest friends has gone to her doom, and I'm powerless to stop her. I could have ordered her to stay as Tsarina but such an order would have destroyed her. I can't do it. I turn. My mother is standing behind me. She saw the whole thing. Katya and I have barely spoken since Sergei died. Does a part of me blame her for his death? Yes, a large part, I suppose. A part equal to my own guilt in the entire thing. 
I find it hard to even look at her now, something that pains me to the bone. When I was a child, my mother was my hero. She was bright, she was brilliant, and she was brave. Katya had been endlessly creative and adventurous when I was young, and now she is not. All that's left of her is her fear. It sickens me that the years have been so hard and cruel to her that they've taken away the mother I adored. It's like loving a stranger. My mother is still alive, but to tell the truth, the mother I knew died the same day the wolves took her from me. She's still here, but she's just a shell now, one I cannot trust. Katya strides to me. That controlled, regal walk is unsettling when the world is falling apart. What will you do now? I shake my head. I, I don't know. She stares at me. She doesn't look at my son. After tomorrow, Moment and I are going to Africa, she states. The sunlight there and the heat will be able to ward off Dragomir for a time. It'll be the last continent he takes. Mother, are you... are you leaving me? I ask. My voice sounds terribly like a child's. She nods. I'm afraid so, my dear. She's abandoning me all over again, at a point where I will fall apart if I lose any more people. Even her. Why do you have to go? I plead. Willem senses my hurt and begins to squirm. I need you. You do not need me. She shakes her head. You are a grown vampire now. You have your own family and your own life. You can take care of yourself. I don't need you like that. I need a mother, I say loudly. The others might hear me, but I do not care. You have gotten along much better without me, she says calmly. You're not doing this for me. You're doing this to save yourself, I spit just like with Sergei. Do not speak to me in that way, Katya flinches. Sergei was my father, and I loved him, but he should have run like we did. His death is not on my head. He gave us time to escape. We could have saved him if... I put a hand to my mouth to stop what's coming. It's shaking when I lower it. You've forgotten how to love anyone but yourself. Katya is tight-lipped. Do you mind if I give you a piece of advice? I scoff. What right do you have to give me advice? She glances at Willem before looking at me. It's okay if you don't love Lysar anymore, she says softly. You have a choice. You can walk away. A little whoosh of air escapes my throat, like Kotcha just punched me in the stomach. What? Werewolves and vampires aren't meant to be, she says firmly. Doesn't this war prove it? Look at the destruction your relationship has caused. Now it's going to end the entire world. She shakes her head. But it doesn't have to end you. You still have time to run. Leave your son with your husband. You can save yourself. Start over. Make a better life. There's nothing wrong with doing what's best for you. Your memory's gone. You have an excuse. I back away from her. I clutch Willem tightly to my breast. No, I say. There is nothing that could make me leave my husband and son. You can't even remember them, Katya says. Whatever you're trying to convince yourself you feel for them, you don't. This isn't real, Lysandra. It's just a fairy tale. You're wrong. You don't understand love, I say. Realization spreads over me. Warmth overcomes my body as I have the biggest epiphany of my existence. Love doesn't give up when it's hard. Love doesn't care about scars or baggage or any of those useless things people tell themselves to give themselves an out. Love is continuing to love despite the challenges and the consequences. It's staying, even when you feel like you don't want to. Love isn't a feeling or an action or an emotion. Love is a choice. 
no longer talking to Katya. I look down. That's what Georgie was trying to tell me. I am lucky, because I do get to fall for Lysa all over again. I'm reliving our love story. I get to experience everything like it's the first time. Lysa and I staying together through these awful times only proves how much we care for one another. I have a choice in all this. I choose him. Katya is agape. I'm grinning like an idiot. For all her flaws, my mother just gave me the greatest lesson life has to offer. Unable to control myself, I exclaim, I have to tell Lysar I love him. I leave Katya behind me, in the past, where she belongs. I hold on to Willem, dash up the stairs and into the master bedroom. I call Lysar's name, but I find the room empty. All there is left of him is a tiny yellowed note on the pillow. It feels like someone is wrapping a thick hand around my windpipe and squeezing as I pick the note up to read it. Lissy, by fame, girl, I love you so much. You have no idea. It's really hard for me to write this note, so I'll keep it short. I know I promised you last night that I'd never leave. Well, that's the thing. I would never break a promise to you unless I had to. And this time, I have to. I'm so sorry that I'm breaking your heart. You haven't told me that you loved me since you lost your memory, but I don't need to hear it. Like I said to you long ago, I could always see it in your eyes. Know right now that my heart is breaking too. If there was another choice, I'd take it. But as of right now, I don't see any other option. An alpha's duty is to protect his pack. A wolf's duty is to protect his mate and his pups. I wouldn't be much of either if I didn't do something to stop Dragomir. I can't allow my son and my wife to live in a world where they have to be constantly afraid. So I won't. I'll give my last everything to try and bring Dragomir down. I know the consequences. You don't have to tell me. I'm happy to make any sacrifice for you. See you later, tough guy. Lysar. My worst nightmare has come true. Lysar has left to fight Dragomir alone. Chapter 19 Lysar's gone! Several people look up when I come rushing down the stairs, Willem in one arm, and Lysar's note clenched in my free hand. Gone? What do you mean, gone? Bryn says the words quickly and breathlessly. He's headed to St. Petersburg. He's going to fight Dragomir. By himself? Tomlin squeaks. Bryn snatches the note from between my fingers. She reads quickly, her eyes large. Then we've got to save him. Rosa appears from around the corner, followed by Valeri. She's in her human form, which is unusual for her, but she appears even fiercer than normal. Kipcha is with them. Now that elizabeth has gone, his look is hooded and dim. We're going with our alpha, Kipcha proclaims boldly, speaking to the group at large. If he dies, we die with him. He's not going to die, Bryn snarls, and she crumples up the note in her hand. And neither are we. We have to get there before he does, I say. Dragomir's dead army is probably marching on St. Petersburg as we speak. Where's Shioni? We need her. Shioni's not here, Tomlin says dully. Shioni's gone too? I gasp. Where did she go? I don't know. We've looked everywhere, Tomlin says hopelessly. She left without saying goodbye. I stare down at the floor. Then, then I guess it's done, I say. We're going after Lysar. Whether we stop him or join him all depends on how quickly we can get there. We won't be going alone, Rosa adds. There will be people waiting for us. What are you talking about? Bryn snarls. After Sige passed away, 
Valeri inclines his head to me. Rosa and I have been continuing his work. We've contacted as many covens as we could, as well as searched for straggler wolves looking for anyone who can fight against Dragomir. So that's what you guys have been doing all this time, I marvel. Yes, Valeri nods. The wolves that we sent into hiding we contacted last night. All of them, including whoever decides to join us, will be waiting for us outside of St. Petersburg to fight. You did this without consulting Lysar and I, I ask. Going against the Alphas was a big deal. Rosa shrugs. Valeri and I were going with the rest of them to fight Dragomir, no matter what the rest of you decided, she says quietly. Neither of us can live in a world where we are not free, Valeri adds. Though it would help if they had someone to fight for, Zarina. I draw myself up. All right, I will be there, and I will command an army that will see us to victory or to a very bloody end. Our ending will be glorious. I'd rather die fighting than go quietly. Better to die by the sword than live a life in chains, Rosa responds. It is then that Valeri does something very unexpected. He reaches out, grabs Rosa by the waist, and drags her to him. He leans down and kisses Rosa smack on the mouth, fusing his lips with hers. Rosa initially sinks into the kiss, but then seems to realize that the rest of us are standing there. She smacks Valeri on the chest and pulls away. What are you doing? Get off of me, you vile parasite, she says. Valeri refuses to let go. Oh, damn it, woman, see some sense, he cries. He only clings tighter to her. We're about to go to war here. I don't care if I'm about to die a thousand painful deaths. I hate you. Rosa screeches, and she lunges out of his arms. Valeri smirks. I hate you too. No one is affected by this admission of affection. Bryn, who has gone into battle mode, picks up the car keys to one of the vehicles. Let's go. It's an hour's drive to the nearest airport. What about the baby? Tomlin asks, staring at Willem in my arms. I already know what I have to do, I say softly, though I hate to do it. I leave the others and go in search of Katya. She hasn't left yet. She's in the living room, packing supplies into a small leather knapsack. Mormont is helping. I despise myself for what I'm about to do. But I have no choice. I can't bring a baby into battle, nor can I put him in any danger. But handing him off to my mother is almost worse. Will she take care of him if Lysara and I don't come back? Or will she abandon him as she did me? Regardless, he will still be alive. Katya, I announce, and she turns. I need you to take Will. What? she asks, baffled. She remains stunned as I put Willem into her arms. By God, it's like he's stuck to me like glue. He starts to wail when I forcibly pull him off of me. Lysar went to kill Dragomir. I have to go after him, and neither of us could survive this battle. I tell her bluntly. Take Will and run. Hide. Go to Africa. Get as far away from Russia as you can. I can't take a baby, she protests. You can and you will, I tell her, by order of your Tsarina. Katya opens her mouth to argue, but Mormont lays a hand on her shoulder. She quiets. Mormont inclines his head to me. We will watch over him, Lysandra. Thank you, I say, out of breath. My attention returns to my son. I bend downward and kiss the top of his tussled black hair. I'm so sorry, Will, I tell him. I turn my back and leave. Tears blur my vision as Willem screams behind me. I wipe my eyes and pretend I can't hear him. The car ride and the plane ride that comes after feels like purgatory. It takes forever to get to St. Petersburg, we got the earliest flight we could, 
though I'm sure Lysar is far ahead of us already. My friends glance at me nervously while flying, as we're in a hotbed of human flesh. But it doesn't bother me. Not even my addiction can distract me now. Lysar's life is in danger. My son's future is at stake. Our family is on the line. Such perilous thoughts render the smell of human blood disgusting to me. A few hours later, we land at the airport. Nightfall has come, and with it, our fate. Dragomir will be marching on St. Petersburg. The war has begun. Finally, Valeri snarls. I'm glad to discard this ridiculous thing. Valeri had to wear a very feminine scarf to keep his head out of the sunlight, because it was all we had left to cover him. He got a lot of peculiar looks in the airport. When the stewardess called him Miss, Rosa nearly died laughing. It was very difficult to keep three vampires out of the sun, but with a lot of layers, Tom, me, and Valeri managed. Even if the sun was at its peak, it couldn't stop me from reaching my husband. Not now. It could burn off the remaining half of my face and I wouldn't care, so long as I collapsed at his side. Our forces are gathered outside the city, Rosa informs us as we climb into the van we rented. We organize them before we charge. Valeri takes the driver's seat. He takes us down a long and winding highway before coming to rest at the bottom of a large hill outside the city limits. He starts climbing it. The rest of us follow me with my stomach in knots. How many will be waiting for us there? A few dozen? A few hundred, maybe? Certainly not enough to challenge Dragomir's masses. When I reach the top of the hill, my mouth drops open. Thousands of vampires and wolves have shown up to support our course. They mill along the bottom of the hill in droves, collected together in tents. I notice that they're not split into two halves. Rather, the vampires and wolves have come together, mixing as one to wait for me as they will. My mouth has run dry. Rosa, Valeri, how did you find so many? Dragomir has pissed off a lot of people, Rosa replies. Once we told them that he was going to take over the entire world, it really wasn't hard to get them here. The crowd looks up at us. I can hear revered whispers fall over me in a great wave as wolves and vampires stare upwards in awe. Zarina! One vampire cries. The crowd copies him, hushing my title as if it is a holy word. There's footsteps behind. Excuse me, Zarina. A voice grabs my attention. Two very old vampires stand behind me, both of them in combat gear and carrying large rapiers. They bow when they stand before me. I am Gnedi, and this is Ibenji. We served at your grandfather's side for many decades, he informs me. We came here to thank you for gathering us here today. Both of us have agreed for years now that the Dragomir is no longer fit to be ruler, and that a true monarch should take his place. It will be an honor to fight for your claim to the throne. Thank you, I say meekly. But you don't have to feel honored on my behalf. This is your fight as much as it is mine. The pleasure is ours, Zarina. Ebenji bows his head. We will gladly give our lives to see the house of Romanov be respected once again. After Gennady and Ebenji... Dozens of vampires and wolves come to thank me for standing up against Dragomir. They tell me stories, the wolves of how they've suffered fighting against the vampires in a centuries-long war that Dragomir only made worse, the vampires of how their family members were tortured or killed for not following the Tsar's orders. By the end, I'm left truly humbled. He hurt so many. I say quietly to Bryn, looking down upon them. Yes, a familiar voice replies, but we're here to make sure he doesn't again. A grin stretches across my face as a familiar vampire appears, the Sarkovian army behind her. Elisabetta, I cry. I fling my arms around her neck, 
and cling to her tightly. You're here. I got Rosa's message, Elisabetta tells me, embracing me back. We came as quickly as we could. Elisabetta, Kip just shouts. I let her go. The large wolf barrels at her full speed. He tackles her around the waist and onto the ground. He lays on top of her and buries his head in her loose braid, pressing his lips against her neck. Don't ever leave again. Oh, Kipcha. All thought of propriety and sensibility gone. Elisabetta kisses him. Their kiss is powerful and beautiful, like something you'd see out of a movie. Though it's supposed to be a private moment, it's beautiful to look at. The group around me claps in approval. I nearly feel like cheering. Tomlin gives Bryn a knowing look. Looks like everyone's hooking up right before the end. Trust me, if we make it through this, we're gonna have some mind-blowing sex later, Bryn promises him. The city of St. Petersburg begins to light up, but it's not with street lamps. It's bombs. The city is under attack. The sound of gunshots and screams can be heard ringing throughout the night. Dragomir has started his siege. Bryn nudges me. It's time. I take a deep breath. The masses below have noticed the chaos and are looking up at me. I step to the top of the hill and a hush falls over the crowd. The only thing that can be heard in the background are the echoes of the fight coming from St. Petersburg. I want to thank all of you for coming here tonight, I say loudly, so as many people as possible can hear. You didn't have to show up today. You didn't have to come risk your lives. I clear my throat. But you did. You are here because you want to fight for the very thing all of us need to survive. And that's freedom. For years, I never knew what freedom was. Like so many of you, I couldn't understand the phrase. For too long, I was underneath Dragomir's rule. It was only when I fought for my right to live my life as I wanted to live it, when I became a living creature. I take a few steps in the other direction. This is what you are doing today, sawing off the chains that Dragomir has placed around you. Our kinds have been at war for centuries, but today we unite to take down a force that's more threatening to our existence than any other that's come before. Wolves, vampires, it doesn't matter what we are. What matters is who we are. Inside, we are all the same. We all fight. We all die. We all feel. And we all love. My voice begins to shudder. My husband is out there fighting for our right to live as we desire to. I say we don't let him fight alone. Let us band our races together and show Dragomir what happens when two become one. Help me defeat Dragomir today. We will rebuild and head into a future of peace where shifters live amongst vampires in harmony. I have seen it. It is time for a new era and a new future. Shall we claim it for ourselves and for our children? The army roars beneath me. I raise a fist in the air and shout, Then let us charge upon the enemy with vengeance written on our hearts for all he has taken from us. Either we will win our freedom today or we will die trying. The army is in an uproar. They turn and charge into St. Petersburg, bellowing their rage. I bring out Siege's sword, point it forward, and race after them. Bryn, Kipcha, and Rosa change into wolves, plowing ahead of me. Elisabetta, Valeri, and Tomlin join me, raising their blades with mine, as we follow the army to what appears to be certain death. All the while, the prophecy pounds its way into my head. I have not forgotten it. If anything, its repetition in my head since I lost my memory has only grown stronger. The one who shall end the shifter line comes. 
born on winter's first breath, fair of hair, blue of eye, descended from the Romanov dynasty. Is this it? Is this the day when the cursed prophecy finally comes true? When I fulfil my hated role as the chosen one? Am I going to kill the shifters today? And the vampires too? Are we all going to our deaths? It does not matter. Dying would be preferable to living without my Lysar, without my friends, without freedom, with nothing left to lose. My friends and I enter the gates of St. Petersburg. We are unprepared for the horrors we will find there. Chapter 20 Dragomir's dead army is worse than I imagined. The dead walk again, thousands of them rising out of St. Petersburg cemeteries and moving along the streets to attack. They go as fast as they can, some shuffling, but others running at full speed. They launch themselves upon the members of our army, using their teeth and nails in an attempt to kill. The worst thing about it is that none of them are the same. Some bodies are freshly decayed, only a few weeks' worth of rotting flesh sticking to their mottled bones. Others are merely skeletons that pick up swords or guns abandoned by fallen comrades to use them as they will. The worst corpses are the ones who have been buried for a while, but not long enough to decay completely. Their bodies expose leaking, rotten organs that seep blood and gore as they creep throughout the avenues of St. Petersburg. They smell the worst. The bodies create a reek throughout the streets of St. Petersburg that makes my eyes water and my stomach churn. If we weren't in a life-or-death situation, I'd fall to my knees and vomit at the stench. Nevertheless, the need to survive pushes me onward. They aren't the only ones we're up against. Cursed ones and haunted both stalk the streets of St. Petersburg, devouring the bodies of those that have fallen. Innocent humans, who have no idea what is happening, attempt to flee the city in droves. It is useless. Haunted and cursed ones pick them off like flies and begin feeding, having a feast. There are more humans than what they can handle— Yet both monsters kill as many as they can, slaughtering one and taking but a few bites before moving on to the next. Our comrades that fall rise up only a few minutes later to join Dragomir's side. The Oculus has given Dragomir control of everyone in the city who dies in the battle. As our numbers weaken, theirs only grow. If there's a hell, we've landed in it. On your left! Bryn cries out. I swing the sword over my head. It slices off the head of a zombie. The head goes rolling to the ground, though the body staggers toward me. I cut off the legs of the zombie and the arms, but as they fall to the ground, all limbs continue twitching and moving my way, still alive. It has given time for three of the zombie's friends to advance on me. I stab one of the zombies in the chest and the other through the stomach, but it doesn't halt them. The third is a skeleton, so I slash my blade through its middle, scattering the bones along the cobblestone. They merely roll back together, reforming as they were before. I fire my gun. It blasts a few holes in the dead rambling toward me, but it doesn't stop them, nor does it slow them down. They walk toward me like nothing happened, deadly intent shown in their movements blankness in their glossy eyes. Despair rises in my chest. How can we fight an army that cannot be killed or even stopped? We're losing, Kipcha cries. He and the others press against me as we become surrounded. Bren kills a cursed one, but the fatal bite wound in its neck is useless when the cursed one is resurrected. It gets to its feet easily after death claims it for its own. Elisaveta fights bravely, gutting a haunted that is in her way, but it only falls to rise again as one of the walking dead. Kipcha pulls her back. We hold our swords outward in a circle as the zombies advance, moaning. It was a pleasure serving with you all, 
Tomlin notes weakly. Bryn whimpers, and my breath hitches in my throat. This is it. I've led us to our fate. At least we'll die together. The air around us becomes noticeably hotter. I glance away from the zombies, and my eyes meet a united shade of red. Witches. Hundreds of them scamper into the square cloaked in their familiar robes. Fire erupts from their palms and consumes the dead army surrounding us. The dead hiss and shriek as fire licks up their rotting flesh and consumes their bones. They wither to the ground in thick piles of ashes. Relief bounds inside me when I see who is leading them all. Burn them! Shioni shouts over the noise. Fire is the only thing that can kill twice. Shioni, I cry happily. The witch sees me and grins. She gives a wave before she heads back into battle, burning a dozen zombies with fire from each palm before turning her wrath upon the masses. The cursed ones and haunted turn and run. The dead, who have no sense of self-preservation, walk into the flames blindly. Reduced to ashes, the dead cannot rise again and fight back. But there's still too many of them to burn at once, and fire takes time to spread. My group spreads out, knocking down as many zombies as we can for the witches to burn, before turning our attention on the cursed ones and the haunted. Both monsters are very upset we've ruined their meal. A cursed one runs toward me, but I leap in the air and stab the sword through its shoulder, pinning him to the stone. He hisses. I use brute strength to put two hands on his skull and rip his head from his shoulders. I pull the sword out of his body and get out of the way so the flames can lick up his body. Elisabetta and Kipcha are working together, as are Bryn and Tomlin and Rosa and Valeri. All three couples take down any enemy that advances on them, sometimes multiples at once. Apart, we could never handle the great army that has been thrown at us. Together, we manage to survive. It makes me lonely for my Lysar. I need to find him. Two haunted appear, but I slice the kneecaps of one, jumping off his chest so I can fly toward his companion. I bury the blade in his temple before using it to slice the neck of his friend. Fire licks up behind my feet. I grin wickedly. We might actually have a chance. We fight our way through the city until we're underneath the shadow of the Winter Palace. I've killed so many I fear that my blade is dulling. And on top of that, I'm tired. I can't keep this up much longer. We may have the witches, but eventually their magic won't be enough to stop the dead army's numbers. We need to get the Oculus now. A group of zombies come toward us. We've gotten separated from the witches somehow and are too far away from them to help. Rosa screams as a zombie grabs onto her and pulls her into the crowd. Bryn tries to snatch her wrist, but she misses. The zombies carry Rosa away from our group until she's on her own in a sea of the dead. Valeri launches himself after her and into the riot of zombies, but only ends up getting caught himself. The two of them fight back, falling underneath the mass of bodies pressing against them. Lysandra, find Lysar! Rosa screams. The zombies carry her away by the back of her pelt. She scrabbles to get away from them, claws leaving deep scratches in the cement. We won't leave you! I shout looking over the mass of heads. The dead have already made a blockade between us, Rosa, and Valeri. We can't get to them. Go, Valeri cries. Their voices fade away as the dead army pulls them far away from us and underneath the horde. I can't see them anymore. They're gone. Liz, what do we do? Do we go after them? Bryn asks, dancing back and forth. I shake my head. It sickens me to say it, but I have to. No, we keep going. A flash of sandy fur catches my eye. I raise my head just in time to see Lysar's tail disappear behind one of the doors of the Winter Palace. 
There's Lysar, I cry out. We have to help my husband. We sprint after him, but just as we come to the stairs of the palace, a haunted and accursed one plant themselves in our path. The sight of them churns my stomach. Red rage infects my mind, so much that I can't see straight. My entire body is quivering. They killed Sige. From far away, reason whispers past my gut instinct to kill. Revenge has to wait until later. Sege is dead, but Lysar is still alive. I have to keep it that way. These two are only reducing my chances of finding my darling wolf and helping him end this mess. My lip rises in a snarl. Get out of the way, Ivan. You too, Vasile. Ivan grins. But Lysandra, we're having such a good time. It's a party, you see, to welcome the new world. Yes, Vasile chuckles. So much fresh meat for us to feed upon. Free for the taking. If you know what's good for you, you'll run, Bryn growls, her pelt standing on end. Run, Vasile laughs. Why would we run, girl? It is you who should be running from us. We have the most powerful army in the world. It is we who are unstoppable. Dragomir ordered us to kill you if we find you, Ivan says in that sickly sweet voice of his. I'd like to get on with it so I can get back to eating. Besides, you aren't as pretty to look at as before, Lysandra. Looks like someone took a meat grinder to your face. They're purposely goading me to buy Dragomir time. I won't do this with them. Last chance, Ivan, I warn. Stand down. Ivan crouches. His eyes glimmer with excitement and blood lost. They mirror Vasile's. For as different as the monsters are, they are exactly the same. Oh, this is going to be Fun. Have it your way, I snap. I bend my knees and prepare to spring. To be honest, I'm really tired of you getting in my way. You're a feisty one, aren't you? Ivan teases. Fine, let's play. I only hope you put up a better fight than your grandfather. Something within me snaps. I charge toward Ivan with a wild yell, the sword raised. My friends cry out a warning but I don't hear them. He swings his arm upward as I charge. He smiles as my stomach sinks right into his waiting claws. Chapter 21 I gasp. His claws aren't sharp. They're dull and jagged. Very painful. I barely register it. Too much is the red, the pure hatred infecting me. I can't even fathom something as primal as agony right now when I have something as real as grief infecting my veins. But my friends can, and the moment I cry aloud when Ivan's claws pierce me is when they spring into action. Bryn moves first. She changes into a human and grabs Ivan, while Tomlin carefully pries me off of Ivan's claws. I scream aloud as Ivan's nails tear through my muscle. My knees buckle and Tomlin catches me as I fall backwards. He presses a hand to my middle to hold my organs in. They're slipping out within the slit Ivan made. Bryn changes back into a wolf and tackles Ivan to the ground. The two of them twist and turn in a battle of instinct, each desperate to defeat the other in a game of survival. Elisaveta and Kipcha move as one unit, attacking Vasile at the same time. They jump upon the haunted's back fluidly. Elisaveta sinks a dagger into Vasile's back while Kipcha bites down with his jaws. There's a rushing whirl of red fabric in the corner of my eye. Shioni unexpectedly is here. She takes me from Tomlin and pulls me from the battle. I fight her. I claw and scrabble in an effort to get back to Ivan. Let me 
kill him. I growl, squirming in Shioni's arms. The others have it handled, Shioni says. Stay still. Shioni pushes me against the wall of a building and gets to work. She raises her hand over my seeping wounds and bends down to observe the gash quickly. Cursed one wounds don't heal normally. The magic of the curse changes the healing process, Shioni explains to me quickly. This is going to hurt. Shioni's hands glow with a dark red magic. I hiss. The effect is similar to cauterizing a wound. It's like she's pressing a flaming iron brand to a mottled collection of mutilated flesh. By Dracula, it hurts. If I wasn't so enraged, I'd be begging her to stop. But I am. All I care about is ending Ivan and Vasile's lives. No physical pain can compare to the loss of Sirge. While she only works, my watering eyes are on the fight. Bryn and Tomlin have taken Ivan. Tomlin dances with Ivan, using his rapier in an attempt to pierce the Cursed One's middle. Ivan laughs and uses his claws to beat back Tomlin's sword with one hand and ward off Bryn with another. Bryn attempts to get him from the back, but Ivan is so fast that it's impossible for her to get in without potentially hurting Tomlin. Tom is having the same issue. He can't use his sword effectively without stabbing it in Bryn's direction. Ivan's sick eyes are gleeful. He knows he's pitting the couple against one another. Vasile doesn't fight with any sort of tactic or strategy. He's merely an animal that wants to kill. He rolls onto his back, so Elisaveta and Kipcha are forced to leap off. He lashes out with his wide jaws, his gigantic teeth nearly catching Elisaveta and chomping her in half. Kipcha smacks his face away at the last second, which makes Vasile angry. He roars at Kipcha and prepares to leap at the beta, but Elisaveta swings herself onto Vasile's shoulders and starts sawing away at his neck. Vasile rears backwards. He jerks his head back so that it smacks into Elisaveta's forehead. Dazed, she falls a long distance from Vasile's neck and slumps to the ground. Vasile turns on his heels, rearing back for a feast. I cry out a warning to her, but she only does something even more painful to heal my wound, and I'm forced to rip my eyes away. She's stitching the wound with magic, a long black thread that resembles more of her welding my skin back together rather than sewing. I force my eyes to return to the battle. Kipcha pushes Elisaveta out of the way and sinks his long canines into the base of Vasile's neck. Vasile howls. He uses his claws to tear at Kipcha's soft underbelly in an attempt to get the beta off of him. Blood sprouts from tears in Kipcha's side, and red fur flies everywhere. The wolf whimpers in pain, but refuses to release his hold. He's going to let Vasile kill him before he lets go. Terrified I'm going to watch another friend die before my very eyes, I shut them. But then there's a gasp, and it's not from Kipcha. I open my eyes to see that Elisaveta is on her feet again. Kipcha's cries of pain shocked her back into reality. While Vasile is desperately trying to get Kipcha off, Elisaveta plunges her blade into the base of Vasile's neck all the way up to the hilt and pulls down. Vasile's eyes roll into the back of his head as Elisaveta slices down to the base of his spine. Vasile sinks to his knees and moans. Kipcha changes back into a human, wraps his arms around Vasile's head, and swiftly snaps his neck. The cracking sound gets Ivan's attention. As Vasile's dead body crashes upon the ground, I see something on his face that hasn't crossed it in a long time. Fear. Bryn and Tomlin take their chance. Tom parries forward to distract Ivan. Momentarily disabled, Ivan brings both of his claws up in a clumsy mistake, and Bryn uses it to her advantage. She darts forward and grabs Ivan's wrist between her jaws, clomping down hard. Ivan screams in pain. 
raising a bloody stump in horror. Bryn holds his right hand, claws and all, in her mouth. With only one weapon left, Ivan has no way to keep up. He tries to fight off Tomlin, but Tom interlocks his sword between his nails so that he's caught. Bryn leaps to take off the other hand, but Ivan manages to twist away at the last second. Tomlin lashes out the rapier, and Ivan's remaining hand goes flying through the air and rolls onto the cobblestone. Ivan's screams of horror could make the dead shudder. He backs away from Bryn and Tomlin, pleading with them for mercy, but at this point nothing can be forgiven. Bryn and Tom move as one. Bryn changes back into a human. She wraps her hand over Tomlin's as he grips the rapier. Using their combined strength, they thrust the blade forward into Ivan's chest. They yank the sword upward. The rapier cuts through Ivan's neck, skull, up to the top of his head. The way Ivan falls to the ground is arrogant, even in death. His corpse topples over Vasiles, the remains of the two monsters mingling in the streets of Russia. After all this time, both of them finally dead. Nice work, Elisabetta compliments Tom and Bryn. She's holding on to Kipcha and helping him walk. All of her attention and care seems directed on him. We made sure he stays dead this time, Tomlin says roughly. Bryn nods in fierce agreement. Lysandra, you're done. Shioni puts a gentle hand on my arm. I see with amazement that the wound in my gut is sealed, though it appears black and nasty. Good, I say, wincing as I push myself off the wall. We can move on. It'll hold, but you shouldn't fight with it. She only demands. You might make things worse. I'm not going to call a retreat now. We're so close to finding Lysar, I insist. It is at that moment that the army of the dead returned to us. It's a horde. There are more bodies than there are soldiers. That's all they are. Bodies fighting for a horrid purpose. Bodies that have no heart, no desire, no control or thought over what they do. We're outnumbered, she only cries. Fire emits from her open palms like flamethrowers, mowing down the zombies in her path. Yet it seems the more she kills, the more pop up in their place. There are just too many. We need to fall back. No, I cry. Leave if you must, but I will not. I will not leave Lysar no matter what becomes of me. I just need more time. We'll buy you some, Tomlin shouts. He rams his shoulder into a zombie. The dead man falls backward into a group, which causes several of them to topple over. Stay with us, Lysandra, Elisabetta roars. She's attempting to take down zombies while helping Kipcha struggle along at the same time. We'll cut you a route to the palace. My friends hack and saw their way through the zombies, which only increase in number. I start to feel suffocated among them all. When we're up the steps of the Winter Palace, I hesitate, unsure of whether to chase in after Lysar or help them with the undead horde. If I leave, my friends could die. But Lysar, wherever he is, could meet the same fate. I'm unsure of what decision to make. I don't have to. My friends make it for me. Zarina, go! Elisabetta shouts. She pushes me as hard as she can out of the group's circle. I fall forward onto my face and cut my palms against the pavement. I stagger upward and push zombies out of the way as I sprint into the Winter Palace. Sergei's sword bounces against my hip. Run, Liz! I hear Bryn shout, her voice dissolving underneath a pile of undead bodies as the ornate doors of the palace close behind me. Get to my brother! Chapter 22 I don't know if my friends are still alive. I don't even know if Lysar's still alive. All that could be left is me. I don't want to be alone in this world. The last I saw of Bryn, Tomlin, Elisabetta, Kipcha, Shioni, 
with their faces falling underneath a mass of rueful zombies. Rosa and Valeri were taken before them. They're most likely dead by now. I'm not going to let them down. I unsheathe Sirge's sword and proceed forward. I know Dragomir's here. It's the only place his ego would allow him to be. I can hear the roar of the battle from outside, but in here it's quiet, quiet as it has ever been. The inside of the palace is dark. My eyes adjust to take in the ominous eyes of the paintings glaring down at me from the walls. This is how my story ends. Either I will kill Dragomir, or, more likely, he will kill me. Let it be so. I'm not allowing my son's hideous future, Dragomir's future, become reality without putting up a damn good fight. I pause when I hear sounds. The scratching of nails on polished floors, maniacal laughter, taunts from a voice that haunt my nightmares. My hurried footsteps become a run. I follow the disgusting laughter as it winds and bends around hallways and twisted corridors. I fling open the grand doors to the source of the laughter, the Nicholas Hall in the Neva on Vallard. Dragomir has got the oculus in his hands. His face is twisted and red with power, eyes crazier than I've ever seen them. He laughs in an insane way, while the magic of the oculus shoots out a stream of grey magic that twists and turns in the air like a sheet. The oculus is drawing from a source. Lysar, in his wolf form, writhes on the floor, face contorted with suffering. He jolts as if having a seizure, gasping for breath as his claws rake across the floor in an attempt to get up. The magic of the oculus wraps around Lysar's body as he cringes and rolls across the room. The effect seems to be similar to being electrocuted. The oculus is drawing its power from Lysar's life force. If Dragomir keeps going, he'll kill him. I use my free hand to grab my pistol. I fire before Dragomir notices I'm here. The Tsar jumps out of the way at the last second. The bullets miss sinking into the wall behind him. The shock causes the oculus's spell to end. The grey magic lets up. I rush to Lysar's side, collapsing onto my knees as the sword falls behind me. Tenderly, I take Lysar into my arms. He changes back into a man, blonde hair falling in front of his bleary eyes. He looks up at me as if coming out of a dream. Weakly, as if saying goodbye, he whispers, Lysandra. You said my name, I say, choked. Tears sprout in my eyes as I observe him. He doesn't appear physically hurt, but it's bad, really bad. The way his body sags in my grasp, it's not natural. It's like death. Don't count on me saying it twice. He coughs before smiling slightly. It looks like it takes all his effort. What are you doing here? I told you to stay away. I couldn't. I lean down and press my cold lips to his cheek. I couldn't leave you. Not after everything we've been through. It would tear me apart. Your memories came back. He lifts a trembling hand to brush my hair back over my ear. I shake my head rapidly, and he looks confused. No, no, they didn't, but I saw it doesn't matter. I don't care if my memories return, or if they never come back again. I love you. I love you so much, I cannot describe it. No matter what we've been through or what's to come, I choose you. Now and always. Oh, Lizzie, he hushes. Lysar raises himself upward to kiss me. I hold him so he doesn't have to support himself, deepening our kiss the moment our lips touch. This is the best kiss we've ever had. I can't remember all the others, but I'm certain that this is. There's so much passion and love and emotion all rolled into one. 
Lysar's tears fall from his eyes and flow across our conjoined lips. I taste the saltiness and the pain, but I also taste the hope and the redemption. His beating heart pounds against my still one, and I force our chests closer together. This is life. This is what living is. I don't have a heart. I don't need one, because Lysar's beats for me. My life force lives within his chest. My soul is carried within his body. For him, it is the same. Both of us carry parts of each other's souls that cannot be broken or separated. Gods or kings cannot stop us now. Even if dying is what is fated for us today, our love will never cease. Get a hold of yourselves, Dragomir says scathingly. Lysar and I break apart. The Tsar is looking at us deplorably, as if what we have together is something he despises and cannot understand. The Oculus is in one hand, and his sword is in the other. You disgust me. That isn't hard to do, Dragomir. Lysar pulls out of my arms and changes into a wolf. His upper lip raises into a snarl. I suppose it is for the best. Dragomir adds. Now, instead of killing only one of you, I get to kill two. Lysar screams and charges. He barrels toward Dragomir with teeth bared. We were supposed to attack together, but Lysar has lost all reasoning. Lysar leaps just as Dragomir brings his sword up. Lysar has to tumble out of the way to avoid the sword. He goes crashing into an antique desk. Dragomir laughs as Lysar picks himself out of the pieces of the desk and tries again. The Alpha lunges forward with his teeth, but Dragomir kicks his muzzle and blood goes flying. The Tsar lands another harsh kick to Lysar's middle. Lysar hurtles across the room, this time crashing against a mirror. The mirror shatters, the small pieces of glass fall downward and slice his pelt. Lysar moans and Dragomir sneers. Lysar's too weak. He can't fight back. While Dragomir is distracted, I run at him from behind. I fire my pistol. The bullet ricochets off the oculus, knocking it out of Dragomir's hand. The small round orb goes rolling out of Dragomir's hand and across the floor. I slide across the floor, reaching my hand out to snatch the device. But before I can get to it, Dragomir scoops it up again. He points it at me. Grey magic flows out of the device. The long, evil tendrils wrap themselves around me and squeeze. I was right when I compared the Oculus's power to electrocution. Jolts of painful lightning ripple throughout my body as the Oculus begins stealing not just my energy, but years from my life. I can feel them filter out of me, powering the device, and through it, Dragomir. The magic presses a hand to my throat, choking me. Painful shocks vibrate every inch of my body. I can feel a stabbing pain in my organs. It hurts more than Shioni's magic when she healed my insides. Hurts more than Ivan's claws in my stomach. It's nearly unbearable. But even though it's painful, a thought crosses my mind from afar. Whatever the Oculus can do, it's not as painful as watching my friends sacrifice themselves for me under a group of vicious zombies. It isn't as painful as remembering poor Georgie, full of bullet holes and buried underneath a collection of flowers. It isn't as agonizing as seeing my grandfather be beheaded in front of me. This pain doesn't hurt nearly half as bad as the mere thought of losing Lysar forever. This, this is nothing. Dragomir's eyes widen in shock as I scream and pull away from the spell. The grey magic ends and returns to the Oculus. Even Lysar is shocked when I manage to walk across the room and pick up Sergei's sword from its abandoned place on the floor. Dragomir's lip curls. Why, despite everything I do, won't you die? I shrug. I guess I'm just that determined to win, father. You should be proud. I learned it from you.
Dragomir pockets the oculus within his robe. He puts two hands on his blade and charges. I throw my pistol aside. I'm out of bullets, so it's useless now. I instead rely on the strength of Sergei's weapon and surge forward. The sound our blades make when they connect is a beautiful note, pure and ringing. The song picks up speed as our swords connect again and again. Dragomir lashes out at my legs, but I jump up and stab outward at his neck instead. He ducks and knocks my feet out from underneath me. I roll and am able to faint his way again, drawing attention to his right side. He goes to protect it. I swing the other way instead, yet I'm not quick enough. He knocks my arm aside and uses his free hand to punch me in the chest. The blow feels like I've been hit by a car. I go sailing to the other side of the room. I smash into the remnants of the mirror, slipping down the wall beside Lysar. The glass fragments bite into my hips and thighs as I land. Gingerly, Lysar crawls over my legs, attempting to use his body as a shield against the Tsar. Dragomir advances, grinning. You can't win, Lysandra. You never could. Give up. You are no heir to Russia. Desperation crawls over my insides. I'm not a juvenile warrior, but Dragomir is a master swordsman. Even if this was a fair fight, I wouldn't be able to keep up with him. But it's not. The Oculus gives him an advantage. I'm weakening, and Dragomir is not. The Oculus is giving Dragomir all the energy he needs to defeat me. He could fight for years with the device in his possession and not tire. This is a pointless endeavor. I'm already defeated. With the Oculus, Dragomir is too powerful. It's not the end, but it should be. We've lost. Chapter 23 Lys! Lysar! Fear creeps into my gut and harbors there. Bryn, Tomlin, Elisaveta, and Kipcha have entered the room. All of them are sporting injuries of some sort, dripping gore and filth from the battle outside. Somehow they survived the zombie horde and managed to make their way inside. Shioni is curiously absent. It's my worst nightmare. Stay back, I order, though it sounds more like I'm begging. Don't come any closer. Dragomir grins. He fishes for the oculus in his robe pocket and raises it up to eye level. Wonderful. More lives to take. Everyone run as far as you can, I shout. I try to get up, but Lysar's still in my lap. I push him off. I'm clumsy and I fall back down. I'm not strong enough. Not for this. We're not leaving you guys, Tomlin insists. Charge! At his command, the four of them sprint toward Dragomir. Tomlin and Elisaveta raise their swords and Kipcha and Bryn change into wolves. Stop! Lysar cries in a panic. He runs in front of the group to try and halt the pursuit. They don't even get close before Dragomir uses the oculus. The grey tendrils wrap themselves around my friends and husband. The seizures begin. Kipcha falls and starts writhing, while Elisaveta simply sinks to her knees, clutching her head with both hands. Tomlin and Bryn collapse at the same time, reaching out for each other and holding hands even through the wretched tremors. When the tendrils begin choking Lysar, I finally wake up. My lips rise and my fangs descend. I take hold of the sword and scamper Dragomir's way. While he's laughing, distracted by the joy the torture is giving him, I sneak up from behind and sink my fangs into his neck. Dragomir gasps. I pierce my fangs in deeper and pull backward, ripping out a giant chunk of his neck. He drops his sword and slaps his free hand to the wound. I take the opportunity to grab the oculus. Once the oculus is in my hand, the grey tendrils die and leave my friends alone. But that is not all. Other things begin to emerge from the item, figures that appear solid. 
they take the forms of humanoids, materializing like ghosts in front of me, though I can see the colors of their clothes, their faces, their hair. It's like they're really here, more real and vibrant than I. The magic before me is like a rainbow, flashes and colors of peace, harmony, and light. A familiar laugh sucks the breath right out of my chest. A tiny wolf emerges from the oculus and floats down to the floor, darting in circles around my legs. I can even hear the thuds his paws make on the floor. Hold on, Liz, Georgie cries happily. We'll get you out of this. Georgie, I whisper. Tears peek at the corners of my eyes and my mouth drops open. How, how is this possible? Another person comes out of the oculus. A large vampire, broad shoulders and all muscle, strides beside Georgie and crouches down. We're here to protect you, Lysandra. Fior echoes. It's all right now. A second wolf comes out of the oculus. She walks upon thin air, her footsteps elegant and refined. She prowls with the reservation of a leader and the strength of an alpha queen. She is the only figure that is white, her fur shimmering with a brilliance that only the heavens could replicate. We will be at your side, Lysandra, the she-wolf says. As faithful as you are to my son, we shall be to you. Mom? Lysar asks from across the room. His voice is strained and tortured. Is that you? I'm here, Lysar, Sylvia says to him, quite calmly. She turns her head and looks at her son. You should be proud. Willem is very beautiful. Lysar gasps. The admission causes Bryn to cry. Tomlin reaches out and grabs his mate, holding her tightly. But the oculus isn't done. A lost figure materializes out of the oculus, someone I have missed so dearly. Sergei has his hands clasped behind his back. His long hair is neat, and he's wearing a spotless uniform. He bows slightly to me, quipping quietly, Granddaughter. Grandfather, I whimper. The tears that were straining at the corners of my eyes finally fall. This isn't real. It can't be. And if it is, I don't want whatever's happening to stop. Sergei moves forward. He puts a hand to my cheek. Lysandra, we will be able to prevent Dragomir from hurting you, but you are the one who must finish this. Do you understand? I nod quickly, tears flinging in all directions. I wish this moment would never end. But the figures have already turned their attention to Dragomir. The Tsar is stunned. He watches the spirits with an open mouth and holds the wound on his neck. For the first time in my life, I see that my father is afraid. No, more than afraid. Absolutely terrified. Wee! Georgie exclaims cheerfully as he whizzes around the ballroom. Come on, fellas, let's go kill a bad guy! Georgie, Fior, Sylvia, and Sergei float toward Dragomir at a fast pace, surrounding him. Dragomir lashes out at the figures with his sword, but it doesn't work. They only enclose tighter, and Dragomir wails in horror. I pocket the oculus and run toward Dragomir, Sergei's sword in my hand. But I'm not alone. Lysar is here beside me. While our departed loved ones are swarming around Dragomir and making it hard for him to see, Lysar and I both take one arm. We rip at once. Both of Dragomir's arms come flying off. We fling them to opposite corners of the room, at this action, the colorful figures fade, dissolving into nothingness. Dragomir stares at me. I clench my teeth in a hated grimace. I will have nothing more to do with you, I say finally. I plunge the sword downward into his chest. Dragomir's breaths are short and labored as I rip the blade out. 
He barely has time to look up before I send the blade swinging. It cuts through his neck cleanly in one quick sweep, and off comes the Tsar's head. Dragomir's armless torso folds on top of his legs, and his head goes flying to the other side of the room. It smashes against the wall and lands upon the floor with a sick noise. It rolls several feet before finally coming to a halt. An expression of surprise is still written upon the face that everyone in the world once feared. I throw my shoulders back. The Tsar is dead. Chapter 24 The ballroom is quiet. None of my companions say a thing. I don't either. I feel like, if I speak a single word, that life will shatter and will be hurled back into a terrible war all over again. It makes me realize that everything is quiet. There's no noise outside. The sounds of battle have stopped. Now that Dragomir is dead, his army is dead too. The only ones left are the cursed ones and the haunted, and there's not enough of them to put up a substantial fight. They're on the run. You did it! Elisaveta is the first to speak. Dragomir is defeated! When she says the words and nothing happens, grins emerge on each of our faces. All at once, we begin cheering. The six of us run toward each other and embrace, coming together into a giant group hug. Everyone is crying and laughing and celebrating. This is it. The war is over. We've finally won. Oh, by Dracula, Tomlin says, wiping his face. That was a shit show, wasn't it? It's so rare for Tom to curse that we all bust out laughing. Lysar claps him on the back and says, It sure was, buddy. It sure was. It's kind of weird for us to be partying when Dragomir's headless corpse is rotting a few steps away, but we hardly care. We don't even pay attention to it. We did it! Bryn cheers. We killed Dragomir! The bastard's finally done for! Say, Kip just says slowly, do you guys realize that the war is finally over? Like, the big one? The one that's been going on for hundreds of years between the vampires and the shifters? We ended that. We can finally screw each other in peace, Lysa quips. I start crying. Whether out of humor because I'm laughing so hard my sides hurt, or relief, I don't know. It's done. I don't have to worry about running or hiding or my son growing up in a future with... My son... Willem. Will, I say quickly to Lysar. We have to find Will. Where'd you leave him? Lysar raises an eyebrow. With my mother? Eh, he winces. Not a good place. I punch him as hard as I can across the shoulder, and he yelps. I didn't have a choice. Don't run away mindlessly trying to be a hero. Yeah, I second that, Bryn adds. Next time, stick around so we can make a plan, oh, I don't know, together? That way we don't have to run around trying to save your dramatic ass. Sure, Lysar rolls his eyes. Whatever you say, sis. I don't know about you guys, but I think I have some internal bleeding. Kipcha moans, and he presses his hand to the open wound at his side. Can we hurry up and get to a hospital? No need, I'm here. Shioni! All of us cry at once. The red-lipped witch gives us a tight smile as she enters the room, inclining her head. With her are Valeri and Rosa, looking battered and bruised. You guys are alive! I exclaim happily, grinning. Well, obviously, Rosa says scathingly. It would have been pathetic for us to die in such a miserable way, Valeri sniffs. We can fight, you know. I see you took care of the problem, Shioni says, gesturing to Dragomir's corpse. Oh yeah, that guy is D-E-A-D, Lysar says. 
Um, she only kept her whispers going pale. Internal bleeding? Shioni strides to Kipcha and puts her hand over the wound. He shouts and wiggles as the wound smokes and fuses together, but Elisabetta comes to his side and holds his arm tightly. At her touch, he stops moving and lets Shioni finish her work. I guess the wolf's out of the bag, Kipcha says glumly when she finishes. The humans know about us. I suppose the shifter and vampire world is really going to change. The world of witches, too, now that humans know that magic exists. Not so. She only shakes her head and looks to me. Lysandra? I fish in my pocket for the oculus. Once I put it in her hand, she stares. She seems temporarily stunned by it before she says, Once the other witches and I destroy the oculus, the effects will render each non-magical creature in the area, mainly humans, unable to remember the events of the past few days. Their memories will be wiped. That doesn't explain all the dead bodies everywhere, or the remains of the army of the dead, or the crushed buildings, Lysa argues. They're gonna have questions. We can fix that, Shioni says. After the oculus is taken care of, the minds of the humans will try to fill in the gaps. We'll use magic to modify whatever security footage is left behind on cameras or phones. All the humans here will think that an air raid was performed by terrorists. The news media we alter will have the footage to prove such. We'll have burned all the corpses to ash by that time. That's shockingly convenient, Lysa says in a surprised tone. Shioni shrugs. Magic is the answer for everything. Tomlin proceeds in a circle around the room. He cups his chin. I can't believe we're finally here, Tomlin whispers to himself. We've been working forever to get to this moment. Now what do we do? The only thing left to do, Bryn says. We make Lysandra Tsarina. For real this time. Everyone looks to me. I... I don't know if I should. Come on, Lissy, Lysa says. He nudges me playfully with his shoulder. You're the whole reason we're here. Yes, but I'm also the reason many people died. I remind him gently. People didn't die for you, Rosa snaps. We glance at her and she adds, Sorry to be rude, but they didn't. They died for freedom and for the chance to live in a new world where they wouldn't have to be afraid anymore. Rosa comes forward. And even though it was kind of a mess to get here, I agree with the others that you're the best person to lead us from here on out. Rosa gives me a quick bow. I look to the others. No one objects or says anything different. I knew this was where the end would lead. I knew if we defeated Dragomir, the others would want me to take the throne. But to be honest, I never thought we'd actually make it. I always believed I'd died long before Dragomir did, that I'd be buried before we even got a chance to end this tyranny. Now that he's done for, I have a choice to make. Do you all agree with this? I whisper. Do you want us to raise our hands and say I? Lysar asks dryly. The others chuckle. I catch Lysar's eyes. All right. But only if Lysar rules alongside me as Azar and the rest of you serve on my council. No one person should have all the power ever again. I wouldn't have it any other way, darling, Lysar says in a corny drawl. Bren and Tomlin roll their eyes. I can't keep the smile from spreading across my face. Come on, everybody. Let's go home. Where is home? Bryn asks, raising a hand. I'm not quite sure where we're supposed to go. We make a new one. I reach out and grab Lysar's hand. Together. Epilogue. Seven years later. Is it too tight? Lysar's lips brush against my bare shoulders as he finishes tying the back of my dress, a blood-red velvet gown that hugs my hips and pools over my feet. 
I turn to him and place a cool hand on his neck. Two small puncture wounds linger there underneath the hussar's collar, remnants of last night. I cover the bite mark and smile. His blue eyes, half-lidded, burn with desire and love. It's perfect. I move upward to kiss him. I linger for a few moments on his precious lips before pulling away. I look forward to taking it off tonight. Lysar chuckles. We'll be lucky to get away. The party will last till dawn. Hmm. I move to the balcony. I certainly hope not. I give him a devilish glance. Personally, I want you all to myself. Lysara I's room is ornate, a gigantic bedroom fit for a king and queen. After we cleaned up from the battle in St. Petersburg, we moved to an isolated location in Russia and built Summer Hall, a residence grander and even larger than Castel de Singe. The majority of vampires and werewolves live in the area, though we have satellite packs and covens scattered throughout the world. We live in peace, and we live together. It's more than I ever imagined possible. To think we had nearly given up and lost all of this. Even now I clutch my pillow when I wake, fearing it is all a dream and I'll wake up to a horrible reality. I don't see why all of this is necessary, I say. It's merely my birthday. It comes every year. Wolves love an excuse to party, Lysar says. He loops his arms around my waist and looks down to the gardens below. Vampires, too. A soft snow trickles downward from the heavens. A large gathering of shifters and vampires roam the gardens. In the spring and summer, they're usually full of flowers— but in the winter, the gardens are decorated in an array of beautiful garlands, bright lights, and red Christmas ribbons. Ladies in gorgeous gowns and men in spotless suits frolic throughout the area. It makes me proud to see them like this, all happy. Katya is down there. She flirts with Mormont while leaning on a fountain that's frozen over with ice. Even after everything that's happened between us, I'm glad I convinced her to stay. I had a paternity test done after the war ended. The results came back showing I was not Mormon's daughter. I could have had Katya drink my blood and tell me that way, but I'm sorry to admit I didn't trust her to tell me the truth if the results were not what she wished. Proved I'm a Romanov. Also proved I'm Dragomir's blood. Makes me equal parts proud and bitter to think about. So I try not to. I set all the human slaves free that were working for my father at Castel de Singe. Many of them had spent their lives in servitude and didn't know what to do with themselves after being freed, so I brought them here to Summer Hall and gave them work as paid servants. Is she only coming? Lysar asks abruptly. He puts his head on my shoulder. I shake my head. You know she hates these things. She could bother to visit every once in a while, Lysar grumbles. She'll be here at Christmas. After Shioni destroyed the Oculus, I made her queen of the witches. She and the majority of her kind live within Le Chateau de Mire in France, where she rules from. The witches no longer work for vampires or wolves, though we sometimes request their services. Lysar and I were somewhat worried when we gave the witches their own nation to rule, but for the most part they've kept to themselves. It seems, unlike the majority of races, witches are not interested in power. To them, playing with magic and messing with mortals is more fun than politics. I never told Shioni that the mirror has the power to go back in time— I hope, with good fortune, that she and the other witches will never figure it out. Baba Yaga sent me a nice card after Dragomir fell and a sweet little baby basket when my daughter was born. I haven't heard from her since, but if I dare to think it, I believe that the old witch is proud of me. We should get going, Lysar says, and he nips at my ear. Our guests are expecting us. No. I say, just a little bit. Mommy! Willem comes into the room, a little whirlwind. 
He's dressed in the miniature uniform of Lysars, all shiny black boots and gold buttons. He tackles my leg and holds me. Even now, I see the resemblance of the teenager I met years ago. He's going to be a handful, I can already tell. Hey there, big guy, Lysar says. He bends down and picks up Will and puts him on his shoulders. All done getting ready? Yep, Willem says cheerfully. Anya is too, see? Willem points as Bryn and Tomlin come into the room. Bryn is wearing a loose, pale green chiffon dress. It's the only gown that fits her as she's pregnant, again. Her round belly sticks out as she waddles inside. Sitting on her hip is Anya, nearly one year old now. My daughter is dressed in a lovely lace gown fit for a princess, her head topped with a crystal ribbon. Her pretty blue eyes stare at me like a china doll's, pale blonde hair floating down her shoulders like wisps. Ever since she came out of me, I always thought she looked like an angel. Often she's been called by our subjects as the most gorgeous child that ever lived. I fear for the day she grows older, no one will be able to say no to her. We can't even say no now. Tomlin, looking bedraggled, is currently swarmed by four little girls, only four years younger than Willem. Two of them cling to his legs while the other two hang on his arms. He drags the quintuplets like dead weights, forced to drag them around. Girls, you're wrinkling my suit, he complains. He attempts to shake them off, but they only hang on tighter. Daddy, again, Raluca begs, digging her nails into the fabric. Yes, again, again, Amelia pleads. Tomlin sighs. He looks at Bryn in a very pathetic way. Please help me. Girls, off, Bryn growls, narrowing her eyes. But mommy, Kalia whimpers weakly. Now. The quintuplets look at each other before slowly letting go of their father. Tomlin gives a sigh of relief. You want to adopt them? Bryn raises an eyebrow as she teases me. Unless there's a surprise you're not telling me. No, I shake my head. We're done having kids. I don't see why we need to have any more, since you and Tomlin are going to have the wolf population back up again to what it was, Lysaw says, putting Willem down on the floor. It's like your guys' personal mission is to restore the race. Oh, shut up, Bryn huffs. We have to make up for Rosa and Valeri. Those two will never have kids. Isn't that a good thing? Lysaw quips. Tomlin nods feverishly. Kipcha and Elizaveta are getting cozy down there, Bryn notices, peering over the balcony. The two of them are curled up on a stone bench behind a hedge, appearing quite in their own little world. Do you think Kipcha will finally pop the question? Do you think Elizaveta will finally say yes? I respond. Those two. Lysar waves his hand carelessly. They take forever. We'll be going to their wedding when we're 80. No more weddings, please, Tomlin moans. Not for a while. Daddy, I'm getting married, Imani says, and she pulls on his pant leg. What? Tomlin shrieks like he's just seen a spider. I beg your pardon? I'm going to marry Will, Imani says, and she grabs Will's arm. We'll be together forever, just like you and Mommy. It hasn't been that long, Lysa laughs. No, you're not. Willem sticks his tongue out at Imani and pulls away. You're icky. You can't do that, honey. You and Will are cousins, Bryn tells her daughter. We don't do that sort of thing here. Imani crosses her arms. Well, I'll find someone else then, someone better than Will. No. Tomlin waves his hands in front of him. You are never getting married, ever. Can't stop bonding, Tomlin. I remind him in a tease. It'll happen someday. The wimpy sound Tomlin makes is pathetic. They, they won't be like that. They're half vampire. And half wolf, Bryn reminds him. We don't know what they're going to do yet. Oh, I know, Lysa says, eyeing our son. Willem is at the balcony and is peering through the banisters. 
this one is already starting to notice girls. I stare at Willem. He's looking at a collection of girls his age far below. A slingshot sticks out of his back pocket. He takes it out and starts firing small rocks he has collected in his coat. The girls squeal and scatter. Willem giggles, blushing as he does so. I don't want my little boy to grow up yet. I want him to stay soft and small forever. Are you two coming down? Bryn asks impatiently. We've been waiting. Give us another minute, I tell her. We'll be there shortly. Bryn rolls her eyes. I bend down to stroke back Anya's hair and give her a light kiss. Mommy and Daddy will follow you soon, pretty princess, I whisper to her. Anya blinks and smiles. She gives a harmonious coo that sounds like a heavenly chorus. Everything she does is beautiful. She takes after me more than Lysar. The chiseled vampire features in her more pronounced, like the shifter is in Willem. Still, her wolf form is breathtaking. She has white fur, whiter even than the snow upon the ground. Just like Sylvia used to have. Don't bother the girls too much, big guy. Lysar tells Willem, spanking him lightly on the rear. Willem giggles. He runs out of the room with the slingshot still in his hand. Please hurry, Tomlin asks as he and his girls totter out the door after his wife. Polite conversation is so boring. The door clicks behind him. I turn to Lysar, who says, Is Tomlin ever happy? I smile. He pretends not to be, but he is. Very much so. In the gardens below, I notice something, or rather, someone. A teenager lingering nervously amongst the guests, hidden in the crowd and quite unnoticed. He looks up at me. When he sees me standing upon the balcony, the anxiety vanishes. Willem smiles and waves. I smile back before he walks away and vanishes into the bushes. His future is secure, and it is bright. Lysar comes closer. Even after all this time, his very presence takes my breath away and causes butterflies to rise and fall in my stomach. I hope that it's always like this, that I never get tired of it. You asked for another moment. Why? I sigh. I only want to enjoy it, savor every second. Lissy, I already told you. I'm not going anywhere. This isn't going anywhere. He gestures all around him. This is real. This is the world we've created. It's alive. I laugh. And to think that everyone said we'd only destroy our races. You see why it's a stupid idea to listen to other people. The corners of his eyes crinkle happily. We listened to us. We listened to our hearts. Look what's happened because of it. I place my hands on his chest. Yes, it's utterly perfect. He reaches up and grasps both of my hands. His expression changes from peaceful to perplexed. You know, I've been thinking. One thing still confuses me. What is it? The prophecy. It didn't come true. You never ended the shifter line. Yes, I did, I state simply. I've had a lot of time to think about this. What? What are you talking about? You didn't. Yes, I did. I gestured to the masses in the garden below. Look at them, Lysar. Wolves are hooking up with vampires. Haven't you noticed that's the only kind of relationship that's around anymore? Very few people are still mating with their own kind. They're not having pure wolf children or vampire children. They're all hybrids. In a few hundred years, there won't be any more vampires or any more shifters. All that will exist is us. Lysar's mouth drops open. I knew that prophecy couldn't be right, not in the way we thought. You could never hate, could never do anything bad or imperfect. Let's not get carried away. I say, laughing lightly. No, your love for me changed everything. From the start, it was always you who changed it all.
Lysar leans in and brushes a tender kiss across my cold lips. No, I tell him. It was us. Lysar puts his head against mine. I breathe in his scent, a pine-like smell. A rush of emotion crashes over me, along with the thought of an injured wolf hiding in the shadow of a castle. A memory. It has been years, and my memories have not returned to me completely. It comes and goes in spurts, some weeks and months filled in, others still blank and empty. It does not matter. I love hearing Lysar retell our story to me again and again. Our past, though it remains a mystery, is not our future. Perhaps my memory will return one day. Perhaps not. Lysar is hopeful that my old self will surface once again. Myself? I am happy as I am. Scars, baggage and all. I accept him just the same as he does me. I love all his good parts and all his flaws. It is a gift to love him, in this life and the next. My loved ones are waiting for me in the world beyond. My friends and family enjoy me in the time I have here. Monsters, wars, demons and kings, they were nothing. None of it was enough to stop true love. All of the bad things in the world could not prevent the happiness waiting for my Lysar and I at the end. I am no longer afraid. I am merely content. The End Thank you for reading The Shift of Prophecy. You can find other books by Megan Linsky by visiting meganlinsky.com. This has been Heir to Russia, The Shift of Prophecy, Book 4. Written by Megan Linsky. Narrated by Candice Joyce. Copyright 2017 by Megan Linsky. Audio Copyright 2023 by Megan Linsky.